Yeah, it's true. And I mean, if you come from a Hearthstone background, it's it makes sense that you haven't necessarily heard of all of these players, right? Because Battlegrounds has brought people in from all different walks of life. You know, they might have played different strategy games beforehand. And um, we've had a couple of players when we were talking to them call out that they were pretty much exclusively arena players in Hearthstone um, before they came over to Battlegrounds, which, of course, is not really a format that gets a great deal of exposure in terms of, you know, household names in terms of Hearthstone. So this is just another opportunity for players to you know, start building up a legacy build up a name for themselves build up a stream that you can actually get a whole bunch of viewers watching starting today if anyone you know checks out one of these players who's doing well in the tournament hops over from us to their stream hey you might have just got yourself plus one viewer for the rest of your streaming career you know and who knows what that can build up into so it's a great opportunity for all of these players it's true and you know i'm really glad that you mentioned that a lot of players were coming from an arena background because i always like to ask what skills carry on over but we do have the first lobby and already looking at these heroes i'm not seeing any of the ones that recently got nerfed no but there is a ragnaros in there so there is that i still think rag is a uh, pretty pretty likely pick to have Am I um, blind wait which one second ball uh, Syndragosa? That... Hmm... I don't know if we're having a bit of a visual oh, issue yeah, here, no, but... Look at the actual I, lobby as opposed to the, the graphics on the overlay. <laughs> look at the oh, sidebar sorry, the lobby. I thought yeah. the overlay was gonna yeah. be... I'm okay, that is my mistake. Um, we will get confirmation on what minions are banned out here, but uh, for now we do have Fritterus at least starting off with... Uh, Millhouse here. Millhouse is definitely one of my favorite heroes because the economy plays out so differently and already having several minions on board gives him such an advantage in the early game. Yeah, for sure. Millhouse, all about efficiency. Um, when you're sort of kind of new to the game, if you're kind of mid-rank MMR, you'll play turns with Millhouse and you'll end your turn by rolling or you'll end your turn with one gold left usually an indicator that you've done something wrong and you've missed a point of efficiency. Like, Millhouse really has to stretch every point of gold that he can to uh, maximum efficiency, and it really changes the dynamic of which minions are worth buying. I'm glad you mentioned efficiency about the economy because that's something that Rafam really plays to in the early game right here from Show. We're already seeing that he did not level even on the five gold turn because mm -hmm. you can approach a different curve with Rafam. Yep, likely he will be leveling on the following turn, so he can steal another minion here with the hero power. Then on the following turn, he can level up for two gold, buy one more minion for three gold, and hero power as well for one gold to fill out his full six. And he will already be approaching a full board of minions, and then he will try and go immediately up to Tavern 3 on the following turn, uh, which is the turn that most players level to three anyway on the standard curve, so he catches right back up with the lobby uh, while picking up a bunch of free minions in the early game. Very, very powerful hero. True. For Goddammit, um, this is a hero that tends to be kind of high roly in my opinion, too, the mm -hmm. Rat King. You can never quite tell what buffs he's going to give you. Um, because it is buffing Murlocs, it justifies Goddammit buying a one-star minion, even though he is on the two stars. And this, at least the combined stats from the Rockwell Hunter's body itself, plus the buff it gives, to the uh, Tidehunter is actually pretty significant. Just sad that he couldn't pick up anything stronger than the pack leader. Yeah, this is a tough decision as well. Obviously, Harvest Golem is a better minion than the Selemental, but the Selemental is value, uh, extra money for you in the further turns, which when you're Rat King, you know, if you hit a particular shop um, with only like four or five gold left, you might want to double buy because you kind of hit that perfect roll on the buff type with your hero power. So the, the economy can be useful to you, um, but Dummit just choosing to go for max stats in the early game with the Harvest Golem, which I think is a good decision with your next fight against Rafarm specifically, because you are expecting Rafam to be pretty strong around this point of the game and you can see right there that decision of picking up the Harvest Golem was actually the difference between winning and losing that fight. Yeah, saves him so much health and I have to say it's pretty rough for a show despite going for the aggressive start and not leveling that early that he lost two combats in a row and it was also a moment of a uh, very exciting moment to see where the first attack would hit for Rafam because there was potential for him to triple with the uh, Tide Hunter there. For this shop, um, nothing stands out as particularly strong. Do you think it's worth it to take the Overseer to buff his uh, Imprisoner? 
Yeah, there's also the opportunity to take the Murkai as well, but the thing is it's a level turn, right? So if he wants to buy anything, that means skipping hero power. Um, so I'm sure Sho will be checking out what Ragnaros is playing right now and how likely he is uh, to be looking at a stealable minion because he would have to sell again just to buy here, um, which would then mean he wouldn't be able to hero power. There are spots where I do uh, see some Reform players end on six minions just to be able to sneak that hero power in. Yeah. What do you think factors in the decision as to whether you want to remain on seven or take You're the risk? Doing great out well, I think... First and foremost, Sho will have absolutely checked what Ragnaros was playing here to find out the information. And having not seen Murlocs from his opponent, um, I think that really pays into it because I think having missed the triple on the previous round, that's the number one thing he'd be looking for, right? He's trying to pick up a triple on one of those Murlocs. You see that Ragnaros is still going to be probably two turns off from completing the hero power after it got uh, nerf. Um, most people think that the average for rag completion is around 9 gold now. Mm -hmm. As for Silver Name, we do see that he is the one on the Maleficent and already picking up two Metal Tooth Leapers just for the body on them because he hasn't actually used the Battle Cry on any other map. Yeah, that's right. Um, not a hero I pick as much as I should. I just find her kind of dull, I guess. Like I don't, I probably like tank my win rate a little bit by not picking her in bad choices because she is still surprisingly powerful, even though mechs aren't necessarily the powerhouse that they were uh, back in the Cobalt days. Um, but still, she does report of having a pretty powerful win rate overall, but just not a hero I get on with, so I sh probably should try picking her up a little bit more. But Silver Name here certainly hasn't been hitting those juicy mechs, at least in the early game. But just the extra boost of stats, the difference between a 3-3 and a 4-4 in the early game is actually a very, very big deal because other 4 health minions and other 3 health minions are so common that those breakpoints actually help you out a lot in the early game. So just those two small looking buffs are actually going to end up being quite important here for Silver Name, I think. I do think he was desperately hoping to get a Deflectobot or something to really make this composition come together, though, there. because Silver Name is down to the lowest in the lobby. He is, however, facing Goddammit, who is his partner, which yep. is why he's not playing out the seventh minion, trying to facilitate a tie to the best of his ability. Yes, I think that was a pretty easy decision to make there as well, because Silver Name would have had a tough choice otherwise, just in terms of gold efficiency as to which minion to play because he would then need to sell, like he wants to play the Harvest Golem to buff his uh, his Death Rowls, and he wants to play the Water Droplet to buff his Elementals, um, but wouldn't want to play both while selling one of them that turn, uh, because it would be inefficient on gold. So that combined with what you were saying about just wanting to level the power levels and try and force the tie between himself and his partner, I think made that a pretty smart decision overall. Uh, it didn't quite work out, though, because Silvernane did tank the damage there, and I'm sure that Good Dummit would have rather lost some health than his teammate going all the way down to 13. But it's true. taking a look at Bootylicious now, he has this demon comp, but no Wrath Weavers to go with it. So I'm pretty sure he's going to be looking to transition off of something quite soon. He has um, still quite a bit of health because Nosdormu does give you consistency to hit decent minions around the two-star tavern. But now we do see him picking up some elemental synergy and putting the Divine Shield minion leftmost in order to get maximal usage out of the buff. This is a very interesting turn now for Silvername with the triple available at the opportunity to try and take a five star there instead by like saying, say, selling the water droplet to uh, potentially hit the level first, but chooses not to. Just takes the four star and does pick up a security rover for his troubles. That's what right. I would Second Cracking uh, Cyclone also available if he wants it, but not quite the gold flexibility Keep to go momentum, for it. Friend. And we do see here that his old Murkai is near useless on this board, and you might be wondering why not play the stronger minion in the Harvest Golem, but it's all about making sure that you have that extra gold for the next turn. Silvername knows that if he sold that minion and rolled, he wouldn't be able to buy anything anyway, so he's sacrificing a couple of stats just in the immediate turn in order to have more flexibility later on, and the security rover is putting in so much work here. And we saw there, Millhouse actually hit a Nomi on 9 gold, which is huge. Millhouse loves hitting those minions that scale off buying things from the tavern because he can buy minions so much cheaper than everyone else. Um, so Lil Rag, Caligos, uh, Chef Nomi, all of those kind of cards play so, so nicely with Millhouse. And the fact that he's hit Nomi very early means that he's likely going to have plenty of time to scale it here. 
is kind of in the bottom half in terms of health total, so he's gonna have to make it work and hope he gets a lot of elemental shop for the issue though. It looks like his hero power has finally completed, and look at this double Anoyo module is what you want to see with all of the mechs he has. Two Metal Tooth Weavers saved up to get maximal buff on the Deflectobot. Yeah, this board is going to get so gross so quickly. He already has the bar mm -hmm. in hand. That's two more Divine Shields that he's able to add to his board with the Annoyer module. And of course, he is just Rag, which means any Divine Shield is just insane in the left-right positions. Look at the strength of this board state already, and that's before the end of turn buff even kicks in. That's right, plus three, plus three on those. And he also has the reset on the Deflector Bot Shield because of the Harvest Golem. I was going to ask, do you think it's worth using the Anoyo module when he doesn't necessarily have another mech that he wants to put a shield on right now. I generally think you'd want to get a, a Mechano Egg for that, but maybe you could even just put it on a Metal Tooth Leaper and have just another um, high attack minion with Divine Shield. Yeah, it's definitely worth buying in my opinion. There's a lot of possibilities. Uh, the Egg, as you were talking about, is definitely up there, but you could also just triple this Metal Tooth Leaper, right? And just like put, it, put the Divine Shield on that for just another huge minion temporarily. So uh, I think you know, Annoy Module is uh, one of very few, like, must-buy minions a lot of the time, because even if you're not going to play it immediately, as long as you can afford to buy it without dying, like, you'll probably find some value in the late game with, like, an Amalgadon at the very least. So I think it's such an insanely powerful unit that you should generally pick it up in most spots, even if you don't already have the mech base board that supports it. And now Millhouse, the Nomi, is just getting murdered. It's so much damage to take when he's trying to set up to scale. I was going to say, it was so poetic that we were talking about Milhouse's potential, but he has to be careful and really hit that spike right away because he has yeah. little health to work with. But then he runs into probably the player that has the biggest spike in that turn. Milhouse also on oh. mech. I, I want to say that's oh. not where you want to be. Oh. There's finally an elemental, but he has no money left. That was just straight up minus eight. Four rolls down the drain just for Fritteris to find one party elemental here. And that's the danger. When I talk about, you know, the, he, they really like this uh, these scaling minions because they can buy so many minions, you do still have to hit them. And that's why, like, generally Calagos is so much more reliable for Millhouse because you will have Battlecry minions in your shop. Like, you'll have to get ridiculously unlucky not to hit Battlecries on, on most rolls. But, you know, hitting a specific tribe is slightly more uncommon and does rely on a little bit more luck with those rolls. And you can see Fritterus very rapidly just rolled away eight gold at the start of his turn and suddenly it's not looking too good. I mean, it's really unfortunate because I want to say Milhouse got stronger in this uh, meta as well with the introduction of Elementals because of the constant buy and sell you can do and also right. because of this rightmost card in the shop right there, the Refreshing Anomaly, yep. which essentially acts as two gold discount when you're Ooh. playing Milhouse. For show sure, though, he is on the brink with just seven health remaining, but he has Baron Rivendare with Goldrin already putting together some nice Death Rattle Beast synergy, except that he doesn't have that many beasts. He doesn't, but he can just piece it together here. That additional Rat right. Pack pickup is huge now alongside the Baron. And he's going to try and engineer this Ginny as well for maximum value. If the, he goes first and the Goldrin attacks and dies, and then there's good potential for that Ginny to give maximum value off the Baron as well. So Sho is certainly putting something together here and certainly looks heavily favored in this fight against the Lich King. Genie Baron is pretty disgusting. And it tells you something about the strength of Genie if the fact that you have it with Baron means that you can use Goldrin just as a transition. I mean, you can use it for now and then try to go for elementals in the late game. But also, Sho still has the potential to go for all in on Beast, yep. depending on whether he sees uh, say another Baron. It's tough to go for Macaw because he does have two other beasts with Death Rattle. But yep, oh, that was oh. a Gar we saw. <laughs> yeah, and that does not look good. 16 damage coming through, and it looks like Millhouse, unless someone else is going to die with Frithras here. Nope, solo death. So Fritterus, after I hyped him up so much, is going to end our first lobby in eighth place. Very unfortunate. I'm glad that we at least got to see the turn. Nice you can kind of see what directly led to that, right? Pick up right. a pick up a Nomi. N don't hit any elementals on Millhouse. Have to roll away so much of your gold because you're just kind of tunneled on that elemental strategy. If you didn't hit them there, he's going to find himself in trouble, and that's exactly what happened. Go ahead and hire and that means it's up to show to try and shore up the points for his team. He did get a big win a while ago, and here's a triple on the wrap pack. Some potential to go for elementals or maybe even a second Goldrin if he finds it. I have to say, though, the two drops off the Ginny were not too great. Nope. 
Free money is free money, though, especially since he gets this one free roll as well off the uh, refreshing anomaly. So he's actually done great things for his economy at the very least that turn. But I think this six drop discover is going to really secure where Sho is going in terms of direction this game. Does hit my Exner, so that suggests that he's probably going to lean more towards Beast now this game. That's right. It looks like the only pickable one here. You can take Imp Mama if you're a little bit earlier on and try to cheese some damage with the beast that it spawns, especially if you think your opponent has, you know, small mech, small tokens. But I do think it's too late to take that. Um, my ex going to get that buff from Goldrin, but I'm worried about where Sho can go from here because it doesn't look too much in either direction. He's very possibly just thinking that if he can just survive and try to get a top four finish, though, that's good enough. Keep yeah, if he can find friend. some selfless heroes, then he might just be in business here. Already has Poisonous Minion, already has Baron. I can push him in the direction of a pretty competitive comp in the late game. But he's kind of missing the parrots right now, right? Because normally when you get this far into the beast comp, you want to look at selling your death rattle beasts and transitioning into the Macaw Goldrin. Uh, strategy instead, but right now a lot of Sho's power is just in that golden rat pack, so he might not have the time to transition out of Death Rattle Beast here instead, so I do agree it's a difficult spot for him to be in. And this fight matters so much because very possibly who loses here is just straight up out the lobby, and I was going to say it's such a big deal that the unstable ghoul and the Khadgar had synergy with the um, security rover, but just the size of uh, Sho's other beasts will definitely I believe, especially since the Mayak has one shot junk bot, which is Silver Name's last threat. Yep, basically every other minion just going to suicide into that giant battle master, and that means that uh, these two oh. trades are going to pick Wait. it up. But with that sequencing, that means the tie is going to be forced, and both of these players live to fight another day, and that's huge for both of them because the Noz Dormu was actually the player in the end that died that turn. So that tie is huge for both of those players really big that they get to have another chance and also the fact that we end up on an even amount of players means that nobody will be facing a ghost this round but god damn it i want to say little rag is an insta pick whenever i see it but i don't quite see the rest of his board i see the savannah high main so he's got to be thinking about great wolf too yeah it's also very very late in the game to be picking a 6-6 six, six. like how many turns are you actually going to have oh. to be, be scaling the little rag up at that point um, but yeah with a barren beast board already I think he's definitely in the uh, Gauldron School of Thought, even if it's not really adding that many significant buffs to the rest of his board right now. I thought we were playing that game where we're super zoomed in on the art, and as it zooms out, I realize what the pick is. And as I zoomed out and saw the Baron, this looked like the easiest Gauldron <laughs> ever for good dummit to pick. He is facing off against the Fishu, who is top of the, um, the yeah. lobby right now. I do wonder what his comp looks like. Well, just scaling back into what we saw when he was setting up, I think he just hit his hero power on the last turn we saw him. Just scaling that into, yes, this. I was going to say, I imagine that uh, the Rat King is going to find himself in some serious trouble here, just adding the stats to what we saw previously from Fishu. Big deal that he, uh, Bow Reaper, was able to get a snipe on the poison. Maybe not so much of a big deal versus mech compared to elementals, where the poison, small poisons can just get eaten up by divine shields with this type of composition, or even the small tokens that are generated. Unfortunately, not enough damage goes through to that Harvest Golem, which means 19 attack goes into 20, and that's a great trade for the Fishu because it was all the way down at 2 health, and that means I think he is just going to clean things up very, very nicely from here. God damn it though, it's good that he has quite a lot of health to work with. And with this Baron Beast strategy, you can still find direction later on if he hits the Macaws like you were talking about, trying to get Goldens, then he can scale further. But that does mark the end for Silver Name, losing by a ton of minions to the Lich King. Which means we are now down to our top four with uh, just XQN, Goddammit, uh, Rogojin, and the Fishu left remaining in the lobby. And once again, Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's looking set up, from what I can see, for Ragnaros to run away with this lobby because he was not punished for that extra turn of setup time in the early game, and it's looking like his scaling might be tough to beat. That's true. It's not often that the mech scaling is the one to beat in the lobby because a lot of the time I look at mechs as a comp that's pretty safe for top four, but if mm -hmm. there's anybody who went in on elementals a bit early on, then they can just... Um, 
make it so that one mil minion can eat up even three Deflectobot attacks here. Do we have room but for this Brangia? I'm such a brand <laughs> gamer. Like, I want it so badly whenever I see it. And it's just already there with an Argus, which sets you up so insanely for a strong shell later on, potentially. That is true. And any Metal Tooth Leaper suddenly becomes insane with Brand because it's all about attack mm -hmm. buffs on these minions with bubbles. Mm -hmm. Another Annoia module, too. That looks like it's going to land on the Faux Reaper real soon. That's right. He is facing off against teammate Rogojin, though. Uh, these two are looking in a great spot to just rack up all the points in the lobby. And that is why we see the Fishu not committing his Zap Flywick as well to the board. I think this is going to at least be fairly close to a tie. I think they've set this up pretty nicely overall. This cleave is obviously a big factor because it right. has the potential to cleave away so many of these Divine Shields from the Selfless Hero. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually going to work out pretty well now. I think so too, especially since they're both healthy. I think it's very low odds for anyone to die. I'm just curious what comes out of this gentle genie because uh, Rogojin does have the little rag now, so any high cost That's elemental true. will be majorly buffing his board. Oh, oh wait, a gar? That's bad news though. That oh, is man. bad news. This is so much damage coming here? through oh, now. No! Oh no! Did I oh my it? goodness, okay. it's so much damage. Those are all six stars. 13 on board. Okay, he's alive, but that 16, is 17, a gross oh. amount of damage. Wow. Huh. Really well, he's alive, and if you can farm the next person, it's alright, even if you finish second to your teammate. But we do see here from XQN, last one standing really because his teammate Delicious did fall early on. He has a halfway elemental and mech comp, I think you'd really be looking to pick up the Toxfin to use on this amalgam. Yeah, crucially, Murloc's not banned in this lobby. Which uh, minion pools are banned really does affect Amalgadon very, very heavily in the late game. Um, it's not uncommon, for example, like if you play an Amalgadon off a of Discover and it doesn't hit Divine Shield yeah, and yeah. mechs aren't in your oh lobby, God. that you might just end up selling it straight away and just looking for another one later on to try and roll that Divine Shield because there's no real other way that you can get to it. But with Murloc's available in this lobby, Togspin is huge, as you now see coming down here, making the fabled Divine Shield Poisonous Minion one of the absolute best things that you can find. I do think that I was going to say the Ghoul could come in really handy here for XQN because he knows there's still a mech player in the lobby and being able to get right. rid of all those shields immediately is huge. However, it does have a little bit of anti-synergy with his own Amalgam. You can see here from Rogojin that uh, he has now Selfless Hero with Baron and crucially, the selfless hero has been buffed, so it doesn't actually activate off of a ghoul death rattle right away. You. Watch out! Yeah, that's a really big deal, actually. After the trade, it still has two health remain two health remaining if it smashes into a unstable ghoul, and then the the death rattle won't finish it off. But certainly, we are still seeing the power of selfless hero coming into play here. I was talking about how divine shield poisonous minions are about the most valuable thing you can do in the game. If you can't do it. The, uh, the hard way, then you can do it the easy way with the Selfless Hero instead and just try and force those situations, which is what Rogojin is trying to do right now. That one hit uh, into the Amalgam with a minion before the Amalgam could hit the Gar, I think, decides this entire lobby. That thing is monstrous! 83 health even after tanking a bunch of attacks, and it has yep. enough attack to one-shot all of Rogojin's board. So I do think that the Lich King will be in a pretty good spot here, but still, the Shredder with Baron, maybe some Miracles, Mayaxna. I mean, my Exner would be the absolute one here. Shift to Zerus, <laughs> certainly not, I'm afraid. Yeah, and this is just going to be a march of minions into that giant Gar, and that is going to be a ton of damage coming through. 18 damage, putting Rogojin on the chopping block now as well. Basically, everyone left remaining is just one hit away from death. But he is alive, and that's all the difference because he has all these elementals able to keep stacking with a little rag. How do you even make room for the second little rag here? I feel like the siege breaker might be going away soon. Yeah, siege. I mean, it's so close to the end of the game that you could even argue that like maybe the extra couple of minions that you're going to get scaling off Ginny isn't straight up worth it over the uh, the increased stats on the demon would... taunt here instead, but he ends up going with the selfless hero cell instead, which is interesting because I think he's now banking on getting through the dead guy fight and then trying to pick up another divine shield and going back into the following turns because those divine shields are incredibly valuable with that Baron Ribbon. That's right. The 
the fact that he's fighting the ghost makes all the difference here. It gives you so much room to be greedy. And he is fighting, I believe, Good Dummit's ghost. And he had the uh, Death Rattle Beast comp from a while ago, if I recall. Mm, that's right. Huge buffs coming through oh, from these tier lag. six, tier six elementals. And speaking of tier six elementals, that is, I think, the first time I have seen a tier six golden rag. Gia. I'm not sure about the order on that because he could have gotten more buff if he had played the little rag first. I guess he didn't want to play it at all then to give him a bit more information on what to choose. But I can't really think of a reason. Mm. Either way, he's going to be very comfortable in this fight. Uh, even with the uh, Poison Murloc missing the Divine Shield here, but it looks like we've got another fight coming down to the wire here between Fishu and XQN. And once again, without enough poisonous minions to contest these guards, they are absolutely running away with this lobby for XQN right now. As he says good night to the Fishu, and he is going to be in prime position overall, it looks like here, Gia. Definitely does look like it. It's just really impressive. XUN has stayed at sub 10 health for the majority of this lobby, but he's been pulling it back. Another little rag. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you can always make room for that. Tons of expensive elementals. But there's seven of them total, right? And there's five of them in, in these two <laughs> players' hands right now. Like, what? Hello? Is this legal? Bob's just being friendly today. And. I did say we can always make room for that, but I do not know what to sell. I feel like Little Gar might be close to the chopping block soon. Yeah, I think honestly, he's just holding it with the hope that he can pick up a triple. I really don't think Got he it. can sacrifice the, the board space here to be able to get through. I think it was just worth the buy on the off chance that he did pick up the triple. That's fair. So what are we thinking in terms of the last minion to close out? I think he has one more roll to try and look for poison! There is a deadly spore! <laughs> now he has to evaluate though whether that one poison or the unstable ghoul is more valuable to him because he does not really have divine shields right now. One divine shield is not a lot in the late game. You would expect your opponent to be rocking a lot more than that. Um, so you might get more value out of just having the Unstable Ghoul in this situation. And yeah, I kind of like this. He's going to go for the Unstable Ghoul and try and get value out of his Divine Shield first. And then tr actually picking up the Microbots as well means that he has the opportunity to pick off Divine Shields from Selfless Heroes with those Microbots as well, even if the Unstable Ghoul doesn't do its work. He did put the Reborn on the Unstable Ghoul as well, mm -hmm. which... Um, you kind of want to do in case you, you expect this. Divine Shields You're to maybe reset, ahead. or if there are some minions oh. spawn, on, small minions spawn on the other side, but he didn't have room to put down the Selfless Hero. I mean, time. Oh no! Disaster. Absolute disaster indeed. And with oh, just this one that hit, poisonous though. minion, he didn't really need that Wind Fury to line up on both of them though, because now the rest of his minions start the march into that huge taunt that's remaining on the right hand side. I am sorry for ever thinking about selling Little Gar. He is what's going to carry this game, and he is by no means little at all. Um, the fact that the poison was able to tank one of the big walls, but not both, makes yep. all of the difference here. Yeah, now just what, 14 attack left to march into it, nowhere near enough to get the job done. And even this little rag is going to get a value trade onto a 1 1 as well, and that means 24 damage going to come through and end that lobby. You got to have some questions so over that those last couple of turns from Rogojin where it looked like he roped out and did not manage to get all the decisions through that he was looking for. And the result of that is that XQN on the Lich King is going to take first place in our very first lobby tier. That is really huge, especially since his teammate, I believe, finished seventh, Buddy Licious. Um, and they will average out here, but I do think in the grand scheme of things, it's the purple team that we should be congratulating here because Rogojin and Fishu at second and third have definitely racked up enough points to be in the lead here. Uh, we do have to call out that bit of roping at the end. I want to say even if you're playing alone on Battlegrounds, this current patch does have a little bit of lag with elementals. And now you have to communicate with your teammate as well on top of all of that. It is so many decisions to make in so little time. 
Yeah, and the game has a way of trolling you sometimes, right? Where you have mm -hmm. a really tough decision at the start of your turn. So you take like 30, 40 seconds, like thinking about, oh, do I buy this? Do I tavern up? Do I roll? What do I do? And then suddenly with 10 seconds remaining, you roll into like Tavern Tempest and you have Bran on the board. And suddenly like you have to do 25 things at the end of your turn uh, through all of the animations as well. So it can happen and it happens to the best of us. But of course, um, with as much as is on the line here as we have in this tournament, uh, you really want those players to be completing those turns wherever possible. It is true. We'll have the standings um, up to date in just a little bit, but I have to say it's already looking quite scary for Fritterus and Sho. I think both of them did finish in the bottom four. And because there are only eight lobbies in a day, it already can feel like a, a huge mountain to climb if you fall behind in the first couple. Yeah, it's true, especially if it happens to uh, both members of your, of your team, as it did there. Obviously, we saw Fritrus going out uh, in eighth place and show not far behind. Um, so a disappointing first lobby uh, for the white team, for sure. Um, but still plenty to play for here because you can you can look at it glass half full, you can look at it glass half empty, right? Like it's a bad start, but you can still frame it the other way and say they have seven lobbies to recover here. And that's kind of the nature of the points as well, that if they can put together some consistent placings from here, it's not like the team that finishes first and second have like got this huge spike of points ahead of you, right? Because it's flatly distributed um, throughout mm -hmm. the curve. So you can still close that gap over time. Just think about it as it's one first place away. At least that's what I tell myself when I'm trying to hit a milestone in MMR and then got sixth place in my next three lobbies and it's just, it's four wins away or something. <laughs> oh man, Battlegrounds is addictive and it's really cool to be able to cast this event because it's been a while, I think, that people have been clamoring for qualification-based events and this is the first one that we're seeing that is not purely invitational. But to be fair, even the players that were invited straight away have been practicing quite a lot. I want to shift the focus over to Rogojin and Fishu once again, because these are the two players that finished uh, collectively the best in Slobby. Um, the Fishu, quite a prominent streamer. Do you know him for anything in particular? I mean, I certainly remember his name from the early days of Constructed as well. I um, haven't finished, haven't followed him particularly recently up until this point, but uh, was a name that I was aware of in the early days of Constructed, and it's good to see him now back making a big splash in Battlegrounds as well. Man, I thought we'd have some time to look at the standings, but we're straight away into the next lobby. I love to see it. This time we I'm, have dragons and pirates done away. I'm going to be honest, Gia, I am stunned. I was fully <laughs> expecting like a hard 20-minute fill there before all of these players were ready to queue up again. But respect to the eight players knowing that this is serious business and staying in their seats ready to queue up the next lobby. Well played to everyone. I do love that. And from Rogojin, the straight away free roll because he's Nosdormu, taking away three minions that technically have synergy in the uh, Wrath Weaver with the double vulgar homunculi, but he is definitely experienced enough to know that th that's a bait, at least in this meta, where demons can easily be outscaled by elementals and dragons. Tough decision from Silver Name. But I am a hero power turn one gamer, so I respect this from Silvername as well. I think the dynamic might have changed um, because of the nerf hitting the hero power specifically, like the minion does not get as big as it was previously. But that in particular is a 1-3, so still hitting it with the hero power I think is quite valuable just to get the attack buff. Um, but in general, I do think hero powering on turn one with my is very powerful. It was quite interesting, too, that he deliberately chose to freeze the other refreshing anomaly because we could have seen there buy one refreshing, play it, so you get the free refresh on the next one and then sell that one in order to hero power the other one. It does look like that he wanted to play one of those elementals as early as now, though. For the Barrow player, though, first bet Ooh. online. And, uh, well, that's tough because you expect Mayab to have bought more minions, but then if Sho got a single Divine Shield minion, this could end in a tie which you don't get the benefit from Barov on. Well, do you though? Because again, Maev could just hero power on turn one. They don't oh, necessarily true. always double buy in the early game. So I think that's actually even more of a difficult decision to make as to who you're betting on. That is true. It kind of depends on what kind of tech you think people have landed on after this patch. I've personally thought that it would almost always be a buy on turn one, but it also just depends on the quality of the minion. Like you were saying, one attack or two attacks can make a big difference. But nice. in the end, he does get the bet correctly, and that is so huge for Barrow's economy. But speaking of economy, we have an Omu player and an awkward teacup. 
A very awkward teacup indeed, yeah. The fact that it wasn't necessarily bought first here. Maybe it's not being bought at all. Maybe he's just going double dragon. No, he is just going to buff up the Glyph Guardian here. But obviously, his big regret right now would be no economy minion in the first shop. No no pirate, no token, no Salamental. And because that makes everything wonderful if you're an Omu player, you can essentially just curve a full turn earlier without losing any power on your board in most situations if you do hit that token early just by uh, leveling and buying a second minion. Uh, on four gold and just following the curve from there. So the fact that he did not hit that curve means that Omu has to play a little bit more honestly here, at least for a couple of turns. Follow up on that point. Sorry, I did make a mistake about the banned minions a while ago. We've updated it now, and it turns out it's Beast and Burlocks that are banned. So actually, the oh. only token minion you can get is Selemental. And if you want to treat the deck swabby that way for yes. economy, mm -hmm. so it's much harder to get those blisteringly fast starts and also to Deathwing. Uh, to a certain extent, is going to be a bit difficult for him to go wide and really make use of the attack buff. It also means we will not be seeing any Cadgar lines in this lobby, which is mm -hmm. always disappointing to me. I don't really know if any of these players are known Cadgar players. Like, it's either a thing that you do or you don't. It's not really a <laughs> thing that you just bust out every now and again. Um, but I do think it is the... Uh, probably the coolest thing to watch in Battlegrounds overall. And outside of that, like, it's not just a meme strat. Like, I generally think it's powerful and it's something that people should learn how to do a lot more. I know Language Hacker recently has been forcing it just for, like, two or three days, just so he could specifically get good at it, because he understands that it's a weakness that he has in his game. Well, Saddle, at least half of each lobby is streamers, so I want to say at least half of each lobby should be aware of how to do Khadgar, because that is definitely one that gets the viewers going. It's true. But now, Take a look at Fritteris' second shot, definitely has to make up for last game. And now he has Pokey, which is another minion with a one-cost hero power, but not necessarily the curve you might expect. No, you do have a lot of options with Toki, just because you can choose to stay behind the curve a tiny bit if you want to. There's also the opportunity here to do what Fritteris is doing, which is the, the curve I favor myself, which is to push um, and roll immediately on seven golds. This is the normal turn he would level, but by getting the discounts from the swabbies, it's so huge because he's able to just roll into a tavern four minion immediately. Uh, normally, you might just have to sell and buy here or just freeze the minion and then potentially buy a Tavern 4, roll with your hero power again, and buy another Tavern 4 on the following turn. But since he's played the Swabbies this game, he essentially just gets a free Tavern 4 minion a, a turn early, as if he tripled into it here, essentially, on this turn. And it's a great one, too. Bolvar is one of those you can take, even if you don't necessarily have that much support for it, because it's just good in the mid-game. But he was also given a Bronze Warden in that shop, so it's no surprise that he'd be freezing it there. He did, yep. however, hold the Bolvar because he was going to face show his partner. Uh, we do have XQN, winner of Last Lobby, now on Elise, which is a hero that I tend to think, uh, when I looked at the hero power first, that didn't seem very strong, but some people favor it for the consistency. Yeah, there's one thing that a lot of players do really enjoy about Elise, myself included, is that you never really whiff on your Tavern 2 shot with Elise, which is specifically one of the most frustrating things in the game. If you feel like you're getting set up for a very bad game when you just get offered garbage in your Tavern 2 shop, speaking of which, nice goal, by the way, that was insane. <laughs> um, yeah. But with Elise, because you have the recruitment map specifically, you can almost always get a fairly premium uh, Tavern 2 and at least just be set up to be competitive through the early game. I also favor Sindragosa for that reason, but looking at Fishu here, he does have the opportunity once again to level a turn before the normal curve because as Omu, you have the economy for it. However, his board isn't necessarily that strong. It looks like for now he's trying to leverage the Khadgar effect with these death rattles to give himself more minions. And to be fair, that's got to be pretty strong against a death wing coming up. Yeah, I think specifically against Deathwing, he's not in that bad a shape, right? He would have loved to have seen that Bronze Warden a turn mm -hmm. and uh, roll earlier and picked it up perhaps instead of this uh, Crackling Elemental. But with having Khadgar um, with a couple of Death Rattles available and the board space to leverage it, uh, you would imagine that Deathwing has a better board for being Deathwing. But actually, as we switch to Show, he really doesn't. Like, Show is not taking advantage of the, uh, the Deathwing aspect as you would expect a player to be doing in this situation. That's right. In the early turns, you generally, as Deathwing, just pick everything with Divine Shield, Reborn, Death Rattle, win. no matter how small they are, because they stack with Deathwing. And a lot of the times, in order to predict how a fight goes, you can just count how many minions do they have on board. Yep. To be fair, Sho doesn't have quite so many activations, but he did freeze <laughs> a trip. Oh, more bad cards! <laughs> 
Oh, Saddle, you said we wouldn't see any Khadgar shenanigans against this lobby. What happened? I know. What on earth am I talking about? Yeah. Uh, but Cho did freeze the Lieutenant there so he can get a triple into a 5-drop. I assume he'll be leveling next turn. A common strategy you see for players to freeze their triple activators for turns on end just to be able to get the triple on a tavern tier that they feel is the biggest power spike. And perfect like timing. One. Yeah, we come back to Silvername, getting the payoff for that play that we saw him making on turn one as well. Hero powering the first refreshing anomaly and then freezing for the second one for the purchase. He now gets the triple on it. And as I was mentioning, because you get your triple so cheaply, you can very often make this play specifically as Maev, where you just got a triple for free that turn, having invested the gold on a previous turn. So that enables you to just spend the whole turn pressing the level button and power spiking into the absolute dream minion here. That's a nine gold Calicos for Silver Name, and he will be looking to scale that up as quickly as possible now. Huge. You can already see him freezing for the Menagerie Jug in order to get a guaranteed battle cry. And he does have a pretty Menagerie-looking board at the moment. Elemental, Dragon, yep. and Mech all represented. I assume the Micro Mummy might be leaving soon in order to guarantee the buff on the bigger minion. Needs old Shredder. Uh, for now, Silver Name's board doesn't even look all that weak for 9 gold. A lot of the time, when you freeze that long to hit a spike on a 6-drop, the rest of your board looks pretty fragile, but it looks like he has the best of both worlds here. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing with early Caligos that people don't necessarily talk about, is it's a freaking 4-12, right? Like, when you discover <laughs> early Caligos, normally a 4-12 is pretty insane against most oh, of the cool. sizes of minions uh, that your opponent have. Gia got very excited about the opportunity for some Pagel value, but it was immediately snatched away from him. I'm very upset. You had a very good point, Toddle, but Pagel could give you another Caligos <laughs> if he gets to attack. Have you ever golden a Pagel? It just feels I have. good. It does feel good, <laughs> I agree. But that, what doesn't feel good is the 11 damage that you just took to the player who'd spiked a Calicos on turn right. 9, on 9 gold even. And let's not forget, Silvername has two zero mana rolls banked as well from that golden refreshing anomaly that he played on the previous turn to go digging for some of those tier 5 dragons, find a Razor Gore, uh, find Divine Shield dragons, look for really powerful minions to start scaling with that Calicos. Good Dummit is just winning these Barov rolls. Already the fact that he is on tier 5 this early with a tripled uh, Deflectobot into the Full Reaper, I assume, and still has coins to spare means that he's gotten a lot of these guesses right. And that's an Anoyo module that he can slap on his Full Reaver, Reaper so that it can be a bit more durable. And he's also picked up the Light Fang to continuously buff the board. Yeah, and when you were talking about how Rafarm maybe plays into this teamwork aspect a little bit, I think Rafarm might be the old meta in terms of the most powerful hero, because I was thinking about Barov the whole time, which, because every time you would fight your teammate with um, with Rafarm, you're just as likely to be able to bet on your teammate as Barov, and that gives you so much extra information as to who is going to win or lose that fight, and can print you so much money if you're able to get it right more consistently. Right, they can give you information on everybody that they've faced so far on top of who you face. So yep. Barov definitely is a lot stronger in this type of format and also in quad queues. Um, for the Nosdarbo player, Rogojin, though, he's finally hit the little rag. He has the gentle genie, just needs to survive a little bit longer so he can get all the value off of it. The divine shields are looking a bit scary, but he does have some stats on his taunt. Yeah, that's true. Like, he does have him heavily covered in terms of stats, but obviously all of these minions basically have two attacks for the price of one on Rogojin's side, and these uh, Bolvars are going to scale up very, very quickly indeed. It's looking like he might just be in a little bit of trouble here overall, depending on whether he can snipe the dragon before it gets out of range of bigger attacks. He really, really wants to live now with that Amalgadon online. Oh, it was such a big deal that he was able to snipe the dragon at the last hit, but these Bolvars will be cutting Rogojin's dreams short, and that is the worst feeling. You have the little rag, you got the value out of your genie, but you die that very same turn. I think Fritteros might have done the whole lobby a favor in, re in removing Rogojin because he was about to get nuts out of control. Yeah, someone's going to need to do the lobby a favor and give Silvername the same treatment, though, because he, to me, is mm -hmm. the one threatening to really go nuts with that Caligo scaling, backed up by Maev. I mean, honestly, name a more iconic duo, right? Like, <laughs> Maev, Maev and early Caligos, like, that's just what you do when you get that hero. 
show, however, an opportunity for Lil Rag as well. He doesn't necessarily have elemental synergy, but the good thing about Lil Rag is that elemental is the activator, but any minion type is the benefitter. That's true. Now, Khadgar in play again for Shone does have that upgraded egg, so that's a couple of 16-16s being summoned out here as long as the board space is available, which it will most likely be. Uh, this is the importance of just having a taunt minion, at least in your composition. I think that's one of the mistakes that some lower MMR players will make is they just don't value having taunt for the sake of having taunt because just guaranteeing where your opponent's first attack will go allows Sho so much more freedom to be able to set up the left-hand side of his board so cleanly. That's great. Even Righteous Protector, that little one-drop, can thing. make its way into late-game comps such as yep. Battle Beast just because it's able to force an attack or even, two, the fact that it has the bubble on it. He also has this Pagel set up to try and give him value, but unfortunately the taunts on the other side both have Divine Shield, so he won't be getting additional value for that. I do expect that the Pagel is going to be replaced by Lil Rags, too, though. Yes, and not only did they have Divine Shield, they were also the worst possible size right in that sweet spot um, for the Fishu where they killed the Pagel, but they didn't kill the Egg. So the Egg actually picking up a value trade here is arguably bad. Not anymore, though, because the Snipe on the left means that the two 1616s do still summon before the Khadgar gets to attack. Big deal. I don't think it's going to make this a win for Show necessarily, unless he gets all of the... Oh, okay. Too late, the Draconid Enforcers have got bigger, but a tie is a win in this circumstance where Sho has a little rags, he has scaling potential, but he just needs time. What is happening here, Gia? This is a very scuffed looking elemental board right now. <laughs> it looks like it's in desperate need of a Nomi. He's just using party elemental as budget little rag. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it's worth it to take the Arcane Assistant. It essentially feels like a demon board, and you would take that as the 5-4 in this situation, but that doesn't necessarily win lobbies. It's true, but like I'm struggling even really to see where XQN is going with this comp. Like He might just feel that he's on a pretty low-tier hero here and didn't get a good choice. Mm -hmm. So he's just scrapping, right? Like you see he's still on tier 4 here, which is kind of late in the current metagame uh, to still be on Tavern 4. So he might just honestly be uh, be scrapping for position, just trying to find like a 4th, 5th, 6th place finish because he was not happy with his hero choices. I do like that he went for the level here and the recruitment map. I think the thing that could have maybe helped him bridge the gap is Baron Rivendare if he discovered that on the true. Tavern 5. Yeah. Um, the Spawn of Nazoth could have given him a bit more stats and the fact that he has the Genie could give him the value later on. But it looks like this is a little bit too much on the other side, especially because of the Divine Shields and even the Selfless Hero. Yeah, the Divine Shields are nuts, but also just these first three or four attacks, just all value trades for the Millhouse here as well, which is insane. That's about the worst possible outcome that can come off the Genie, though, just in terms of stats immediately in the fight. Obviously, in terms of money for Millhouse, that's fantastic. He'll take that. Yeah, I think just the fact that SQN holds on another turn and is now on Tavern 5 is a very big deal. Yep. He can try and leverage these Tavern Tempests to get him those triples because I do believe he ended the turn with the uh, double Tavern Tempest and the uh, double Arcane Assist. That's right. He could uh, find himself a brand there in his Tavern 5 shops that could potentially be huge for him uh, with those Tavern Tempests as well. But speaking of brand, there's that brand Mex combination that we were talking about in the previous lobby as well. And uh, Dummett even has an Amalgadon in his hand, just trying to look for something else to potentially get value out of it. Now double Amalgadon. This is a huge turn for Dummett. It really is. Honestly, it's just hard to think about what he wants to remove because he's obviously invested so much in these mechs, but I think he has enough money and health to play with to make a full transition to elementals if he just hits one of these more impactful six drops like a little rag. Because we do know mechs are quite strong in the mid game, but if he doesn't hit more attack buffs on these, they can maybe get outpaced by the dragons on the other side. Coins actually being spent on rolls here, which is not something you see particularly often, but Dummit is really digging for that uh, potential Annoyer module, but while he has the board space available, right? Like, he's about to board lock himself again, potentially, at the end of this turn. So he felt secure enough to say, you know what? 
I will uh, take these rolls. I'll actually coin roll, which is something very strange to do, just to look for that annoyer module while I have the board space. He also has potential to do another thing strange, which is triple the yeah. uh, the Amalgadon, because right. there are no Murlocs in the lobby, so he has no potential of hitting uh, Toxfin to hit on this non-poison Divine Shield one. And with their powers combined, you can get the uh, poison and divine shield on the same thing. Yes. Normally you do everything in your power to avoid that. Like you'll actually sell your genie so your genie doesn't drop you another Amalgadon. Mm -hmm. You won't play Murazond against a person who had an Amalgadon on their board. Um, so right. you do avoid tripling Amalgadon. But in this situation, I agree. I think it could actually be very beneficial for Dummit to be able to triple the Amalgadon here. Casual 31 damage. Elise obliterated out yep. of existence. And that's just the runaway advantage you can get with Varrock if you get all of those early guesses right, give you the gold to level up early and have easy access, or rather early access to all of the premium minions. Toki though, also going to deal lethal damage to Bootylicious's Millhouse, which is quite unfortunate because that's another 7th place finish for Booty. It is, and once again he hit the Salamental, so I'm sure he was doing well in terms of economy, but just was not able to find the stats to compete with this... Uh this board state right. that we've had from multiple other players. Sorry, that was fifth place. A bunch of people died there at the same time. Yep. XQN, the leader of last lobby, um, falling down That's to seventh. And be. both the Fishu and Rogojin, who were second and third, last lobby, are in sixth and eighth. So it already feels like things are starting to equalize, even though we don't know the order of the top four fight yet. Yeah, and this is huge for uh, green team and white team here, actually, because all four players who are remaining are from just those two teams. All of Team Yellow, XQN and Budalicious, have been uh, eliminated, as well as you said, Fishu and Rogojin. So, um, big swing here towards the, uh, the Team White and Team Green players. Right? Just dragon things, very simple, hitting a lot of the battle ties. What Critterus wants to really close out and be the cherry on top is maybe an Anoya module to start on the uh, Amalgadon because sometimes you can get Nadina to double up if your one taunt minion is the one with Divine Shield and mm. possibly find a second Nadina later on. Keep up the momentum, friend. He's going to be going into Dummit here, as we just saw. Um, but still, oh, he did find! It looks like um, during that turn we left him, he found the Annoya module for that poisonous Amalgadon, which obviously was the best solution. We were talking about tripling, which I think would be a consolation prize, but actually picking up the Annoya module there to create the Divine Shield Poisonous minion is huge. As Gia was saying, no opportunity to do that on the other Amalgadon, because there are no Murlocs in the lobby to pick up the Toxfin. It still increased his power so much. That little plant taking down the Divine Shield on the poisoned Amalgadon was so huge. It made all the difference in yep. this lobby now because Chris is able to survive with two big dragons. And while uh, Goddammit is nowhere near dying, he definitely has to think about how he's going to scale later on. And I don't think there's too much of a problem with that because he does have a friend. There's Shogun, absolutely obliterated. 26 <laughs> damage taken from Silvername, and yes, you can see how things have progressed from this point. Silvername, board full of giant dragons. He's even hoarding a golden brand at this point, which is yet another advantage of Maev. You can go for extremely greedy triples that you normally would not do with other heroes because it just costs you that one gold uh, to be able to freeze it. So, and I'm really interested in using the Stasis Elemental to give you maybe rolls at finding Amalgadon, but it's just less efficient than Tavern Tempest. So, do you think that's worth it? That's a good question, oh. actually. Yeah, I didn't really it's thought of it that it. way. But he did end up going for it, indeed. It's also just awkward about the space he has, because as Mayav, whenever you uh, use your hero power to make a, a minion dormant, it does still, still take up a space. So, yep. um, as Mayav... In Tavern 6, you don't also necessarily want to have two minions hero-powered at any given point because you'll be taking up one board space. Yeah, and at that point, you've almost wasted a large amount of the gold that you spent going to 6 because that's one of your big advantages is the extra minion that appears in each shop. It's not necessarily just having access to the Tavern 6 minions. It's the just increased likelihood of hitting everything because of the uh, increased size of the shop. I do love seeing teammate positioning. Nadina last... I don't want my shields. Uh, they're trying their best to tie each other because, again, Silver Name, Good Dummit are teammates on the green team. They're the ones that a lot of the other Russian speaking players said that um, they're most scared of. And mm -hmm. they're definitely the two players that seem the most confident going into this. Game. 
Absolutely, yeah. Divine Shield hits for Divine Shield on the Poison, which I think is the best possible outcome for Silver Name. And I think might just tilt this fight into dealing a little bit more damage um, to Dummit than he might have liked. Because this is the potential downside of putting the, the Nadina last, right? That's a six drop that's now just going to be alive on the board at the end of the fight. But it very well could have been like oh. three, two drops that yes. stayed alive before yes. if you put you Nadina so in front. Up. But oh my Ooh. goodness, <laughs> leaving him alive at one. What we say there, Jir, is that was executed to perfection. That's all they needed to do, was just su both survive <laughs> that fight, and they absolutely did it. And now, uh, Silvername will have the uh, privilege of most likely being able to uh, eliminate Fritterus here and securing the 1-2 for him and his teammate, because Dummit has the luxury of the ghost fight. And dragons are just so powerful in a lobby with Urlocks, where it's so difficult to get poison and divine shield consistently on your yep. Malga Dons. This is my realm. That's what I would have picked. Dummit at this point just largely doing whatever here. He switches over to the uh, double Lil Rag setup and figures that he has a couple of turns to scale here. But uh, honestly, as long as Dummit trusts Silvername to do the job here and knock out Fritterus, they will have done their job. It doesn't really matter which one of them ends up in first and second position. That would just kind of be a friendly little showdown between the two of them at the end. But if they can secure the first second, that is the best possible result for these two players. I mean, Collins and I were talking about it during practice that if it's the same people on a team in first and second, and they're facing off just to decide who's first, you might see somebody just sell their entire board. But oh my goodness, this Pokey is just a little gold short of being able to triple the uh, Draconids and try to find another Nadina. And it's actually slightly closer than I was giving it credit for. Um, Silvername having the Divine Shield already on his Amalgadon might be a big kicker. And if this rolls Divine Shield Poison now as well, which it did, that's a huge boost as well. But I did not give Fritterus and Toki enough credit here for the uh, the size of the giant dragons they had themselves. But that extra roll on the Amalgadon at the end with the Divine Shield Poison is absolutely massive. Big all the difference here. The fact that the Nadina stayed up for Silver Name is also a big deal. Uh, I don't see Toki surviving this. <laughs> and then got absolutely smoked by the Wind Fury on that Amalgadon as well. Mm -hmm. Dodged the Divine Shields to perfection. That is going to deliver, what, 21 damage at this point through, and that is going to be the one and two for Dummit and Silvername in our second lobby. Huge performance, best possible performance from Team Green this round. Extremely impressive. I'm just curious to see what Dummit's going to do? Is it going to be sell the whole board or call it a fair fight and see who actually deserves to be first here? Because he does have 32 <laughs> points of health in terms of a difference to overcome. Yeah, and if you look at the two players right now, they're clearly discussing what is the most entertaining thing to do in this scenario. <laughs> Uh, generally, if I want to give up, I will spend That's 10 gold on rolling for the objectively funniest minion to leave solo on my board and then just leave that one minion at the end. But we'll, we'll see what Dummit ends up doing here, because he might still choose to fight this out. He has so much money. Just roll he them does. all and look for a Pagel, the solo Pagel. That's what <laughs> I want to see. Yeah, both players smiling. They know the job is mm -hmm. done. But honestly, uh, Dummit's board is actually pretty huge in itself at this point. That... One turn of scaling he took out to switch to the double Lil Rag has actually boosted up his stats enormously. But again, that second Divine Shield Amalgam has just ended up being so huge for Silvername in terms of breaking these ties. They have largely similar boards, strangely enough. And yeah. just the fact that Nadina goes on Amalgadons means that it's not necessarily a <laughs> dragon-only type of minion. God damn it, <laughs> betting on Silver Name, which is the right thing to do because if he loses here, then it's just over. If Silver Name wins, it might not be lethal, and then God damn it has more money to work with. No, other way around. Silver Name has 33 health, Dummit has one. So he, he just bet on himself to lose, in which case. Oh, wait, I thought he bet on Silver Name. Yeah, he bet, he bet on Silver Name, exactly. Silver oh, sorry, Name has... sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just confused myself. Supposed to bet on himself if he was yeah. trying to stay alive longer. Yeah, yeah, you were trying to make a real point, but your mistake there is not realizing that Dummit was just trolling and there was no reality behind what he was doing. <laughs> Clearly, I don't watch enough streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just not big enough. Silver Name, absolutely off the back of the nerfed Maev. 
still doing what Maev does, hitting those early triples, hitting that early Calicos, scaling way out of reach of the rest of the lobby. Um, but that last fight was merely a formality, and the teammates of Dummit and Silvername are going to take the fabled 1 and 2 finish in our second lobby tier. That is huge, um, and purely because the two top performers uh, outside of first place last lobby did finish 6th and 8th, I feel like that would put them in roughly equal positioning. Uh, we would have to also tally up the results from a previous lobby to really find out, but I do think it's quite close between green and purple right now. And honestly, just the fact that um, the slots from last lobby and this one were kind of reversed means that it could have been a lot closer. And there is confirmation of what that means. Just that insane performance means that Green, Silvername, and Dummit have been able to stretch out a small lead. Remember, this is the team that not only when we asked them themselves said we're not scared of anyone, we're the team to watch, but also the most common names that came up when we asked other players who they were scared of in this tournament. They were um, really picking this as one teams so far just through two lobbies long way to go still but green is just starting to stretch out a little bit of a lead for themselves it is true but it's crucial to note that even though the other three teams are all around the same mark even if you're the bottom place team right now 12 points that is just one first place away from trying to even out the score on the other side of course you need to consider how the top leading team so far will be doing in the next few lobbies and you're hoping that they'll fall behind but the fact that we still have six lobbies today means that anybody could pull ahead. Any closing thoughts about those first two lobbies you watched, Lalo? It was so fast. It was, yeah. It feels like it does go at an incredibly fast pace, uh, especially when there's so many players to follow. But I do also think it's crucial here to just remember the long-term game plan here for these teams, which is you don't necessarily need to win today, right? Like, you just need to finish within the top two teams, and then you will be progressing through to Sunday where it's all on the line yet again. So, as you were saying about those teams that are now congested towards the bottom with green out with a uh, slight lead, uh, it does mean that, you know, they are basically in second place, all of them right now, functionally tied, um, behind Silvername and Dummit. So still absolutely everything to play for for all of these teams, even with so many lobbies still left to conclude throughout the day. Right. I definitely enjoyed seeing Mayev, especially proving that she's still very usable despite the nerf. We'll see if the same holds true for Jandis and Rag. I don't believe we've seen a Jandis in a lobby just yet, but I'm also personally excited to maybe see Shanvala get some love <laughs> later on. But we'll see how the rest of the day goes because for now we're going to go to a short break. Don't go anywhere. When we're back, it's going to be the third lobby.
Welcome back, everybody. You're watching the Hearthstone Battlegrounds EMEA Cup, a team tournament for a $10,000 prize pool. My name is Gia, and joining me for the next two lobbies is Battlegrounds expert from the Americas region. It's Educated Collins. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. There were some a lot of interesting games and decisions I saw in the first game. I saw a couple of mistakes from some of the players, but hopefully they'll wrap it up for these lobbies so I don't have to call them out. I don't want to ask you for anything specific, but for me, as somebody who's a little bit newer to Battlegrounds, I find that mistakes are really tough to pinpoint because um, looking at macro strategies and looking about how to plan a curve can be opinion based. But did you see anything technical or more macro? Um, there were some technical plays. People, there was a turn where people didn't play enough minions. There were also some ordering with some of the elementals. That can be very difficult with the lab going on for some of them, but sometimes where how you play or uh the elementals do matter uh and there are just some small decision makings there was one uh turn where someone didn't buy a brand where he was into the ghost he actually could have gotten so many buffs if he actually bought that brand he also found an amalgadon during that turn so it, it really felt like a big uh point of contention there that he decided not to use that three gold but he ended up losing like almost like 20 20 in stats that one turn that he didn't buy the brand Oh man, I'm so excited to have you cast actual lobbies. I know that you're prominently a streamer and most of the time you're talking to your audience, but I do think people have a little bit more of their critical hats on when they're actually looking at a game and uh, having somebody who has streaming experience themselves uh, cast a lot of players who are streaming themselves and do this for a living gives us a whole new level of insight. So from the first two lobbies, um, do you feel that the players who ended up winning will continue to do so? Uh, I am impressed by uh, Dummit and Silvername. They really uh, played really well, and they, they are in first place. I was also uh, looking at White Team. I know Furters and, and the, their team also. I had a lot of expectations. They're unfortunately in fourth, but they're only one place away from uh, reaching those top two spots. So I'm actually looking for those two teams so far. And speaking of Furters, we are seeing him once again. Now he is on Millhouse and has picked up uh, not a token, which always feels bad with Millhouse in terms of economy, but the next best thing. Yeah, he did buy something and sell it to buy that um, Don't tell the that 2-4, ah. knowing that he had one minion on in the shop, normally you'd have two. So I was wondering what he bought there, because if you do that play, you're normally going to lock, but it looks like he didn't care about the minion on the board. Maybe he just didn't want to float a gold. That is something I do as a constructed <laughs> player. I hate floating mana. The that issue, is however, definitely true. On on Maiev, uh, did buy and sell a minion, which you normally do when you get a token, and is already going for a similar strategy to what we saw won the lobby last game. Uh, what do you think about this next lobby? 
Uh, the, the swabby is usually uh, useful. It, it's, it might have curves. Sometimes you don't need the swabby if you're going to stay on tier one lower. You can use the swabby if you're going to level earlier and start trying to get uh, gold advantages that way. But it seems like he's just going to hero power and save it for a later turn. Yog player looks like they did hit the token, so they're going for the aggro Yog curve, which is something Yog you can do. Uh, you don't level on four, but instead use hero power and buy minions. Do you favor yeah. the aggro Yog curve I, in this? I setup? do this a lot because if if you play this out well, you can get to seven gold and have a full board and continuously hero power and level and get to tavern five while still being relatively healthy if you get hit lucky with your hits. So. And we'll see how this turns out for him. In terms of the curve, it does end up matching the normal one around the 7 gold turn, right? Because you level for 5 yeah. gold and still press the button to end up with another minion here. Yeah. Uh, does the deck swabby ever change anything here? He's yeah. getting so lucky. So uh, he, he he started with the uh, Wrath Reaver and has hit two demons already. He's so strong. This turn probably strongest in the lobby right now. Definitely seems like it. He's going to face off against Fritterus on the Mill House, which is bad news for any Fritterus fans out there. But we'll see if he was able to Keep make use of his own demons because he did start off with a vulgar homunculus. Yeah, usually Mill House is a spot. Oh, wow. That's a pretty good setup for the Mill House for next turn. But usually Mill House is spike on six gold when they can buy three things. But on turn five, it's a little bit more up in the air if they're going to win the, the round or not. It does feel bad that um, he did get the buff on the Vulgar, but it was immediately perfectly value traded by the 6th Wrath oh, oh my wow. goodness! <laughs> Sometimes actually tripling the uh, uh, the spawns this early is a bait because you're, mm -hmm. the attacks become too high and they won't actually kill a minion in the first round. So I, I, I do think you still make this play and buy it anyways, but... Uh, we can really see him getting punished and taking a lot of damage because those spawns won't actually pop. So we'll see what he does. Yeah. I do imagine he's going to buy all the minions. Just the fact that your mill house means that freezing a shop has you know, kind of double the cost because you're missing the refresh, which I think yeah. he was oh, deciding wow. whether to level. Yeah, I think this okay. makes a lot of sense because uh, he knows that getting the triple now won't actually give him direction while he can just take the damage here uh, and then go for a four drop see if he can get anything uh more useful in the next round so he's just uh, understanding that if he takes the triple here he actually might not get stronger because he loses out on the spawn i mean he will be stronger but not that much stronger and he doesn't get he just gets a three drop no actual direction for him to actually uh make a game uh playoff so i i think this makes a lot of sense in the position he is to actually just level and take the damage Really good insight. I'm curious to see what kind of minions would give him the most direction on uh, Tavern 4. I, gen I tend to think that it's Tavern 5 where you get the really comp defining well, minions. So what are we looking for? You do have pirates here, so he could get a gold grubber. Um, that would be the best thing to hit. He also could get egg and, and just uh, good tier 4 minions that could just solidify his early game to allow him to level earlier. These rolls are a little bit weak. Uh, he could have considered taking the jug and just uh, buffing up the Murloc in the shop, but I think uh, the Wildfire is also a, a decent pickup here. Not the greatest, but it is going to be okay. I think what he was looking for was particularly the Gold Grubber because it has permanent scaling, but he could have also just found a good strong minion to, uh, to pick up. Probably the Egg would have also been a really good spot, but uh, unfortunately he got maybe a low roll, I would say, of the options that he picked up, but... He'll probably be stronger than most of his peers this turn. I do love... Uh, sorry, I do want to ask about the small Nazoth positioning because you're talking about how you don't necessarily want the additional buff on the tripled spawn of Nazoth, but the smaller one is likely to die, so why does that not go first? Um, he He's hoping that the 4-4 four four, uh, pops first, and then he's also hoping that he can use the wildfire to cheese some... Uh, some damage before the the spawn goes. So he's he's prioritizing the wildfire and getting the trigger off before the spawn because if the first spawn goes first, I mean if the first spawn triggers, he won't ha you ha enough have enough minions for the second spawn to buff. So he actually doesn't care about the second spawn. What he's prioritizing is the wildfire uh, hit, and he did actually uh, win that uh, round, so it, it worked out for him. It didn't work out in the way that you were necessarily explaining, but it does make a lot of sense. Just the fact that he had stats from the wildfire is such a big deal. Oh. Uh, 
None of these picks actually do too much for him at the moment. Yeah, the spawn guy definitely wanted a Baron, but uh, <laughs> you just take a Murazon because of the economy it gives you? He could just take the Murazon and try to use the money uh, for a later turn. It's also probably going to be better than a lot of the things in his round. He, it actually looks like he's trying to force a Murloc composition uh, right now. He just doesn't have the pieces for it, so we'll kind of see what he, he does here. It looks like he's deciding on selling one of his minions to buy the, the Murloc there. I think the fact that both the war leader and the navigator look pretty good for the minions that he had on board pushed yeah. him to take Murzon even more for the gold flexibility. We do have a dancing Daryl in the lobby. XUN is uh, going to be who Buddylicious faces next. And because they're teammates, we're going to see more holding from Buddylicious there. And it's also pretty curious that if you know you're going to face your teammate, it gives you a bit more uh, comfort to do something like buy a Shifter Zerus, which is low tempo <laughs> on the turn you buy it. Yeah, I do think we're going to be seeing a decent amount of Shifter Zeruses in these lobbies just because uh, it can high roll for you and you know getting those uh, nutty hits is really one of the ways to get a clean win. So I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of players picking it up in, in these games. Pretty cleanly achieved. Not a perfect tie, but minimal damage taken for the Alex Straza player. Uh, Alex being this low health is not to be unexpected, but it feels scary because you do just want to spike the vibe. Yeah, this is the moment of truth for him, see if he can triple. He does have a steward of time in his board, so he might take that just to see if he can triple it that way. He could also take the Murazon just to uh, get extra economy, maybe roll into something more useful. So he's really deciding. This is a major um, decision, probably the most important turn for this player right now. So he's going for the money and he finds a Kali Ghost. Uh, I looked uh, recently, the percentage to find a Kali Ghost is, is super low, probably around... Um, it, it was something like four or something percent. Very, very unlikely to to hit that. So uh, same percentages as the Malgadon. So really lucky. Really gives him a clear direction. And this is why you pick this hero, just so that you can actually just hit the nuts and uh, cheese some lobbies this way. So uh, he has a good game plan. Uh, we're not really worried about this player anymore. So he's laughing. You can see his player <laughs> just laughing, uh, realizing his in insane luck there. Keep and we'll see how the dragons get scaled later, back when they're in range where you just want to pick up an Adina. But for now, let's check out Show on the Lich King. He has the Reborn on the Gentle Genie, which makes Lich King a lot more valuable to pick. Let's see what he gets off of these. Yeah, the fact that you can uh, Reborn the Genie and get free gold from that way really makes uh, Genie one of the more powerful picks for Lich King. Uh, usually for Lich King, you, you kind of want things with really powerful death rattles. Uh, for Beasts, that's Goldrin, right? But uh, with the Genie pickup on 5, you can get it really early and just start uh, getting a lot of extra free money that way. So it's nice oh man. I know you're phrasing it in a way where you pick genie if you're lich king but i just tend to think you should pick lich king because there are genies in every lobby but we'll see um the rest of this board is not looking like it has a direction just yet but i do think show has enough health to play with that he just levels here also he's facing his teammate yeah uh his direction is to just hero power the the genie and hope it gives him a direction and <laughs> he doesn't really have any other uh, real game plans right now um do you think the positioning was okay there for show because he did have a divine shield minion far left given it does have wind fury though it's so it's very likely to die right away okay i, w I was wondering if he was going to sell the minion and buy the pirate so he does do that um his positioning seems to be okay he he his his main purpose is to make sure that the genie pops uh early because that's that's really how he's going to find his direction unless he finds some type of uh brand burger or something like that so Generally, he just wants a position where the genie will die and, and everything else doesn't really matter uh, so far in, in this stage of the game. Okay, so let's take a look at who he's going to face on Frideris' side because you can imagine Frideris was also Keep maybe momentum, holding friend. back a little bit of his resources knowing that it's going to be his teammate on the other side. Does, does not look like he's holding back at all. <laughs> <laughs> <Pause>. <laughs> Disgusting. Uh, it looks like uh, he might be punishing a uh, show for 
uh, going easy on him. Uh, we'll see how it turns out on the board, but uh, good for him. The golden spawn didn't pop, so uh, he, lo the, he lost a lot of value in terms of how much damage he could have dealt with the just to show there. Yeah, still even take, Genie taking a lot. giving Selemental is just such a good economy, even if you would consider it a, a low roll because it's a one star minion. Just goes to show you why this minion is the centerpiece of the current meta. We were talking about Gold Grubbers a while ago, but this is a different yeah. player we're seeing it on. Yeah, he had a early Gold Grubber, um, super early, and just uh, started forcing for extra Gold Grubbers. You can see that most of his board is Golden Minions. He has three tokens, all of them Golden, and he's using that to get the plus six plus six for each of the Gold Grubbers. So he's kind of just uh, casually doing nothing and just getting strong enough to do anything he wants. You can see he's already on tier six and just... Uh, rolling and rolling and just trying to find a way to transition to a full murloc composition you can see he has murlocs in his hand he's just waiting until the gold grubbers get work get good enough that he can or find the pieces that he needs probably a brand to transition everything out and just uh make a murloc composition with maybe a golden gold grubber as the extra scaling so ooh, yeah. that's an interesting buy yeah. Goes to show where Silver Name's head is at, but I'm glad we saw this Kaladukos. It was immediately picked up even though he has just one dragon. Do you feel like this allows Silver Name to replace maybe some of his Murlocs with dragons? Yeah, so he initially wanted to do Murlocs, but decided that, okay, I can't find the brand, uh, so it's not really working out for me. I felt he found the Caligos. He has the Bronze Warden, which is a really good buff for the Caligos. So instead of focusing on Murlocs, he's now made that decision this turn when he hit the the Caligos to get out of Murlocs and go into Dragon. So we'll see how that plays out for him, but I think it makes a lot of sense for him right now. He has a lot of time to make plays, and... Getting an early Caligos is one of the directions he can. So when we talk about early, um, at least in terms of how many gold you're at, definitely uh, at around 10 gold, it still seems early enough. But how about uh, two turns after the 10 gold? Do you think that I, would, would be... I wouldn't really say um, early is based on the gold. It's probably based on player health, like player health and, and what board state your opponents are having so even if it's like turn seven or nine gold if three players are already dead by that time it's not early anymore you know you got to make your plays because they're going to kill you so uh i, I would say he early come most of the time refers to your health and how much damage you're dealing or taking so if you're at 40 gold but you you just lost a round and you took 20 you have like a turn left to make a play so he's fairly healthy silver name being at 28 still pretty high in the lobby still dealing damage to opponents that's why i think he has a lot of time gotcha. unfortunate for show there even though he did have the genie value trade as train as lich king he got the nomi a little bit too late and died right before he could start popping off rogojin too that's Pretty bad to have another bottom two finish after last lobby, but his partner, the Fishu, is definitely looking really strong with the dragons right here. Yeah, he's got a clean Kelly Ghost. You can see in, in the lobbies, there's been a lot of uh, Kelly Ghost gameplay, right? A lot of people were saying that, oh, uh, dragons wouldn't be as strong because elementals scale uh, really quick and really efficiently. But you can kind of see in these high level lobbies, the power of Nadina just overshadows whatever the elementals can do especially if you find a poison of malgadon with a refresh so uh dragon's still not out you saw fishu at the end there hero powering the murloc as another battle cry and sometimes for more economy but do you think that there was any potential to hero power as a ghoul just to have it in his back pocket as a tech choice uh I think you'd maybe hero power the ghoul if you knew exactly what your opponents were running and you knew they had divine shields. But I think this early in the in the lobby, you just want the extra stats and you don't want to, uh, you know, commit on the tech choice when you can get the stats until uh, maybe last turn or second to last turn. True. It's also a big deal that mechs are banned in this lobby, so you're less likely to see just really wild divine shield comps. Or Bootylicious, he does have the double selfless heroes and a poison Murloc, so he's definitely looking to triple this, hit the Baron, and try to go from there. But I do think it's difficult for him to scale a lot farther because he did dance on a couple minions and just commit to those, which is a fair strategy to go for if you're just 
aiming for consistent finishes. Yeah, the, the Daryl is actually in a weird spot because he needs to triple the selfless. Here, it looks like this guy is getting, the Millhouse is getting a ton of triples this turn and really found a golden uh, major drummer, which we hadn't seen before. I've actually never seen a triple of that. So <laughs> it's nice to be seeing the buffs doing something. Wow. I mean, normally I'd be very excited about Caligos as Millhouse, but he doesn't have a Dragon Comp at the moment. Um, it's still going to continuously buff his Amalgadon, which is better than... Oh, the, didn't the even game. want it. Wow, okay. <laughs> he didn't even want it. I, I think that that's fair, because it's only a plus one, plus one buff at the moment, so it doesn't do too much, but it's, it's funny to see. Uh, he does want to be picking up elementals, um, but he is going to go for the, uh, the buff there. But he can also get the elemental at the end too, so really nice to see. Oh, it's really tough to play Millhouse oh, with the so. amount of time you have. Oh right, it costs two goats. That's right, that makes a lot of sense. I, I forgot we're watching Millhouse. I was like, oh, he doesn't have the money to do this, but he actually does. Um, I was just wondering about buying the Hogger there last and he could have bought the Crafting Cyclone, which activates the little rags. I, I, I do think the Hogger was a little weird as a buy, honestly. Maybe a mistake there on his part. I do think the Cyclone would have been a much better buy there. So it's kind of uh, a lot of times you're he's pressured and he just wanted to buy something maybe, but uh, it does look kind of weird in my part. Uh, the time can really get to you, especially playing Millhouse. There's lag to contend with, but we do see that Silver Name got a lot of damage, not enough to kill. So I do think the Millhouse player will be still in a strong spot, but Silver Name does have already what looks like an endgame comp. I do expect that the cycle slot will be the Annihilant Battlemaster. Yeah, for sure. He's running it back with the same comp he used to win. Another <laughs> Dragon comp with Nadina with Golden Amalgadons. He knows the game plan and he's executing on it uh, perfectly so far. So it uh, looks to be a nice uh, game for him. Uh, definitely one of the, uh, the boards to watch probably will be seeing him uh, most likely unless somebody finds a, a magical board. Because that that Golden uh, Gold Grubber is really doing a lot of work for him. One of the to be a big safety net in the mid game while he spikes or, or scales up the dragon, so. Pretty insane. Uh, the only question here for me is, is he supposed to drop the second Nadina on this board? Because that kind of means that that's your board, right? You're a bit locked, and if you drop the second Nadina, you're going to have to sell something the next turn that you don't necessarily want to sell. Yeah, you'd make this play if you're not sure you're going to die, or if you're not sure you're going to win. If you you guarantee you want it, he wants to secure top four. I think that's the reason. He wants to knock a player out. He wants to secure top four. He doesn't really care, because once you secure top four, the points are relatively the same, right? So he just wants to make sure he wins this board. I don't think he needed to do it, but I do think it's a smart play just knowing that if he wins this round, he'll get top four and he'll secure the points for his team. So makes sense. For the context of this lobby, it makes a lot of sense. And maybe he did kind of need to do it. These dragons okay. were taking some value trades. That's that's true. He might have... Well, you, you got to remember he has that gold grover at the end, right? That, that would have cleaned up almost everything uh, that the opponent had. So he, he didn't need to do it. But I do think it is a good play and a safe play, especially when the points aren't as dramatic as you have to get first and second. Right, we are down now to our top three, Silver Name, Fritterus, and Bloodylicious. Bloodylicious hanging in there with one health because he's Daryl. I don't really expect him to be a big contender for this lobby, but it's still impressive that you make it top three. What, what really matters is if he tripled that selfless uh, from earlier uh, on, if we saw, he had, a two, he had two poisons and he didn't triple the selfless. So I have a lot less hope for him. Uh, having that extra divine shield, I think, would have been a key factor. You can see he has a Kelly Ghost, but I don't think it's enough scaling for him to uh, survive. I think it's quite clear that Silver Name will be taking his fight against. Uh, oh, sorry, he's up against the ghost. The I ghost, believe. yeah. So Silver is against the ghost. So let's see what Fritterus is up to and see if he has any chance against Silver Name's end game dragons. So it looks like Fritterus. Most likely has a much stronger board than uh, the Darrowed here, so it looks like he most likely will take it over to Darrowed. But you never know; sometimes things can get wonky. But it it does look favorite for the Millhouse here. Very favorite. Yeah, uh, he does have two poison minions, 
I'm really wondering how he's going to beat the double procs of Nadina on Silver Names, and it looks like he'll really need an Anoya module to get on the second Falcon one. It, it does look like Silver Names won the lobby. We're really just looking for seconds here. And uh, mm -hmm. it looks like the Millhouse is going to take it as well. So uh, we kind of uh, see how the game's going to play out. We just have to see if, the, uh, if they can pull off some magic in these last couple of games. Isn't it crazy for thinking that Ritterus still has a bit of a chance against Silver Name? I, I'm trying to grasp at straws, looking for any ways to block the Dinas. Maybe he could try and find a small taunt, but then he has two big taunts. If he can find a way to block Nadina and get a good hit on the um, the the seven three, but Silver Name really has a big lead in terms of his board state compared to his peers, so we're really gonna have to see. He did sell his second Nadina though to make room to keep buffing everything. He so had to. Yeah. Mhm. Mm he definitely did in order to keep scaling, but I think it's going to be important for him to try and find another one. Yeah, he does have the selfless. Oh, he does find the second Adina, so he is lucky in that regard. Uh, he he did have to. He wanted to guarantee top four, and then he didn't really care, so that's why he sold it. But uh, he could also just find another Nadina, like a good gamer. So you know, <laughs> works out for him. Definitely not a mistake by any means. Um, in these kinds of board states, is there just a correct ordering to the Nadinas? I tend to see players just put their Divine Shield first and then a Nadina, but I don't know where the second Nadina should go. Um, so that that a lot of times comes to the math of of how likely will your board die before the second Nadina procs, right? It's, it, it, it comes more complicated if you have extra taunts. Uh, if you have just one taunt or two taunts, then you can put it fairly early because you know they're they're likely to hit other things. But when you have other taunted minions like he does, it gets a little bit uh, easier to play uh, to guarantee the hits going where you want them to go. So. I, it looks fairly correct to me. I didn't really see any issues with his board placement. And uh, yeah, it looks like Silver Name's got the uh, the big lead here. Going for another victory. Two first places in in, in these three lobbies. He's really showcasing his, his talent for both uh, Constructed and uh, Battlegrounds. That is huge. Really cementing the green team's lead. But Fritterus picking up a second place is also a big deal because Sho did end up in eighth place. So they do average to... Uh, I don't know, still below average score after that, but we'll see how the standings shook out there. Collins, are you surprised to see that dragons are doing so well in these lobbies? Uh, I'm not surprised to see that. I think the elemental nerfs actually did hurt the elementals a lot more than I initially thought they were going to. I thought the Jin being at five would allow people to just still make the same boards, just take rely on a little bit more rng but it really does seem like putting rack to six did nerf the elementals that it's not as easy or free to just force elementals and make it work uh, in any which way so it seems like dragons are kind of taking the the lead back if you can get an early caligos it's still very very easy to play from that point where some of the other compositions are a little bit more difficult to execute if you don't have the clear direction that the caligos gives you We'll see if Dragons continue to perform, but at the moment, it does seem like Green Teed has pulled ahead even further. The interesting thing here is that the purple and yellow teams have switched spots now, so the French team has fallen a little bit, but they're still tied for third and fourth place with white team, who still can't seem to catch a break. Um, out of the results so far, do you see anything that is particularly surprising to you? I was actually also really... Uh... Hoping for the show and Frederis to uh, so, uh, to do really well. That was that was the team I was looking at as well. So surprised to see them fourth consistently. Yep. Well, we do still have five lobbies. So even though the point gap has widened from uh, between first and fourth teams, that is from seven points to now ten, I believe they still have more than fifty percent of the day left to try and pull it back. So much battlegrounds action, Colin. Um, I was asking about whether you surprised you were surprised about dragons doing well. Are you surprised about the hero choices being a Rafam and Mayev still at the top? Uh, no, I think the nerfs for Rag and Mayev and Rafam did well. The Rafam didn't get a nerf, but my Rav and Rafam, I don't think they changed what they are trying to do in the game. They're trying to get early triples or they're trying to survive so they can power spike after that. So. They didn't really change that game plan, so they still end up being really strong. So I'm not really surprised that they're still doing well. 
Rafam and Mayav do share a lot in common, at least by the way they curve out. My question is, if you are offered those two heroes, especially given that in this tournament, you can communicate with your partner, which one would you end up choosing? Uh, I, I like both of these heroes. I kind of have a little love for Rafam. I think he's really fun. Even when you don't get exactly what you want, I might go for Rafam, but I do think Maev is the more consistent choice. So, so in tournaments, I might just like ignore it, my love and just take the Maev. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny yeah. because there was one player, I think it was XQN, who did mention that they love Lich Bazial, but they would still pick an S tier hero for this event because, of course, it is a competitive event. Already, so much Battlegrounds action. And I have to say, I'm quite surprised that we haven't seen a full on elemental build take first place yet. Um, my ladder experience has been just tons of 80 80 elementals coming out of nowhere and destroying me from 25 health. Well, it looks like Silver Name's gonna get a low tier hero for, uh, or a lower tier hero for this pick. So it's kind of interesting to see what he's gonna decide on. Uh, personally, I think you could go AFK and try to high roll Dragon and maybe Hungry Dragon start and go for that way. He's been liking the Dragon gameplay that far, so that's definitely a, a line to do. Murlocs aren't in the pool, making Dino Tamer brand a little bit weaker. Patches is also kind of interesting, so he is going for the strategy that I would probably implement. Go for an early triple, try to get Hungry Dragon, try to get the Bronze Warden and see if you can use that to carry himself further. So we'll see how it turns out for him. Rough for Bran because he wasn't that strong to begin with, but as you said, Murloc's not in the pool and also uh, Pogo Hopper out of the pool as well kind of really limits what you're trying to do. For AFK, I do assume that this is an insta-freeze because on the turn that she um, becomes active, you do want to have a smooth curve to spend your gold and level. Yeah, uh, this is definitely, it definitely works. You can buy this on that turn and level. Uh, a lot of times before you need to roll for tokens so you can buy a token and sell it. This kind of works in the same uh, way where instead of selling the token, it just makes your cost, the tavern cost cheaper so you can do the same game. That's right. I really do love that Jack Swabby entered the minion pool and now sell a mental because it kind of makes it more common for everybody to get a token-like effect and not really have the entire early game dictated by who does and doesn't get these tokens. But yeah. this, we're not going to be seeing AFK do anything for a while. <laughs> Which one of these heroes do you want to take a look at? <laughs> uh, we can take a look at Verov. It looks like he might have, he might be deciding whether to level or to uh, bet. He's going for the bets. Uh, a lot of times, yeah. This is actually kind of a difficult bet unless you know that the Yogg is staying on one. Uh, the Wind Fury from the Alakir might give him the edge. So normally if you see the Yogg leveling the two, I think I would go Alakira. But if you see uh, the Yogg staying on one, then I would go for the, uh, the Yogg. I'm glad you bring that up because Buddylicious, um, his teammate is actually the Yogg in XQN. So he can oh. have that information <laughs> as to whether Yogg is staying on one or not. And he does bet on his teammate. So I assume that from XQN, if we can take a look after Barov loses this match, that um, he did go for the aggro curve. Welcome back. Or uh, he not. did not. <laughs> okay. Uh, he, he ended up tying. <laughs> yeah, he ended up tying. So uh, if if they were really trying, they could have said, "Hey, stay on one," you know. But uh, probably the board for it, the Yog wasn't good enough uh, for him to force the stay on one. Probably didn't roll into a token or something like that but he is going to face Buddylicious this time, so they can at least try and engineer it high. Um, I want to see what AFK is up to now and what they've ended up discovering. And oh, it looks did like, not get wow, the, uh... pirates though. Yeah, I mean, sure, pirates. <laughs> hey, come on, this is pretty thick. It's two five fives. It, it, it's, it's okay, but it's not the dragon scaling that I was hoping for to see. Uh, it, it, it is going to be much stronger this turn. He is going to beat the opponent uh, fairly easily. I think he was trying to... I, maybe this is his teammate because the positioning kind of seems like he's trying to give at least take one less damage. But if it was his teammate, he didn't didn't have to play both of his, uh, his minions if it was the teammate. So he could have actually dealt less damage to him, but still... Uh, reasonable play. I, actually, he did have to play both because they both trigger from that battle cry. So yeah. he he was forced to make that play and hurt him. It uh, looks like we're looking at Kalthos right now. He has um he's deciding what he wants to buy here. He doesn't have 
Uh, this seems like a pretty clear buy because he he's either deciding the level here or the buys are pretty clear because he doesn't have a demon on the board. So. Yeah, he is just going to buy the, the best one. Right. Nothing this quite yet like a... that he particularly wanted to land the Kael'thas buff on, so we don't have anything interesting to talk about in terms of do you freeze this to try and land the buff on the Divine Shield, but maybe in the next shop. All right, it looks like we're looking at Lich King. Lich King kind of has a decent board. He does have a pair on his board right now, so maybe he's looking to uh, get a triple and maybe find an early gin or something like that. His board state isn't super duper strong for turn six. Usually people have five minions. Four, if you get absolutely unlucky, don't roll any of the token generating mis minions. So a little bit unlucky with his rolls, but so, so barely lose, unfortunately. Big deal that Lich King didn't even hit a, a Death Rattle minion for tempo as a good target for his hero power, but maybe the party elemental pair can help him scale out for the long term. Yeah, definitely uh, worried about this player unless he gets a triple into the elemental. He doesn't really have any good direction. He did have a, a, a smorgasbord of Death Rattles to pick from, so he is going to get a lot stronger, and he does have the gam the gambler so he can get a power spike turn maybe next turn or in the next couple of turns so we'll see how it works out for him i would personally probably right. take the three three there and then use that Ooh. as a death rattle target it was quite interesting yeah. right because you can even make an argument for selfless hero but maybe it was a bit too early for that for show it looks like he is trying to get the triple into a five drop next turn He's he's looking for Caligus. He's just gonna level mm -hmm. into Caligus. I know these. This is the way. <laughs> actually, Caligus would actually be pretty good here because he does have two dragons on the board. But he he might go for a five next turn. We're really gonna have to see whether he dies, decides to level next turn or um, the momentum, get the five. Probably depending on how much damage he takes here. But he is against the Lich King, which wasn't particularly strong. He does buy the three three. Uh, that we were talking about before we moved on. Oh man, it just goes to show how insane this meta is that you can be on 7 gold and think about how am I going to get my Kalagos, but you're absolutely right, that is the name of the game, power spiking here, but again, for show, this is, and for everyone of course, this is a team tournament, so going for consistent placements might be the strategy you want to go for, and he's already taking tons of damage this turn, the fact that he's tripling yeah with the vulgar homunculus means he'll take a bit more damage so uh, honestly i would chicken out here and go for the four yeah drop. I, I i think the fact that he took the the 10 damage here kind of solidifies that he probably needs to get a lot stronger this turn or he might just get blown out unless he's fighting his teammate here i think getting the uh the five would probably give him some direction to do something uh for the next feature because he could if he decides to level and go for the caligos he can't lose anymore and he'll probably take like 15 damage if if the uh the omu is anyways uh, decently statted so. oh that's so interesting because omu is his teammate so why don't we take a oh, look at is. what fritteris's board state uh, looks like that that explains <laughs> the level up and that also looking at fritter's board explains <laughs> why he's he's allowed to level up here he's definitely not the strongest so uh this is where team play really uh, comes in handy where in any other situation i would say that uh you should probably almost definitely take the five here so you don't get blown up but knowing that you're fighting a teammate your teammate can weaken his board to this extent where you actually have a chance of not taking too much damage allows him to go for the six drop potentially if he wants to that's really huge. Uh, what do you it, think about he that? Still <laughs> he, he still loses. He still loses. Isn't that amazing? He had a full yeah. board. The opponent had three. He still loses. Takes nine damage. That is the. That mm -hmm. is. That is what I'm talking about. If your opponent did not make his board as weak as humanly possible, he could have been completely blown out there. Uh, the right. freeze was a little interesting though. Yeah, I was gonna ask. What do you think about freezing for? I believe the Southie captain, which was just gonna be a pair. Didn't feel particularly strong. He did. He did have some pirates on his board, so he could also take the um, the uh, there were two pirates. So he is. He did hit the Caligos. Um, he might the, be dead. <laughs> yeah, that is the the real shame here that he could actually just just be dead here and uh, won't get to live the Caligos dream if he dies. So we got to see. It is nine goals, so this isn't like um, super late where. It, it'd be unusual to survive here, so he can definitely live, especially buying the battle cry here. But uh, 
This is moment of truth here. If he can survive this turn and get us a really good nice turn next turn, he can actually uh, dominate and get top four easily. So oh. we'll see what happens to him. But the uh, Alakir board look... I don't know. Uh, I think it's going to get the, buffed well and he'll get at least five proc from the soul juggler. The, the Alakir board looks like it's ready to ruin some dreams. Right? Let me tell yeah. you that right now. It's... <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it, it's it's gonna be very difficult for for uh, for right. sure to recover here. Sho has two, three, four taunts, which you know at first glance they line up well against the imprisoners, but the two spawns of Nazoth will make his day very sad indeed. And even the thirteen health on the Calicos, I don't think is gonna be enough to eat up all of these soul juggler hits. We'll see. Maybe with all the perfect trades. Yeah, um, he does have the five thirteen, which is really the uh the the saving grace for him not to get blown out he might survive if, hopefully if uh if things work out for him but i honestly it does not look it doesn't look good <laughs> doesn't look pretty i mean if this egg stays up and the soul juggler you can yeah, kiss the calico stream yeah. goodbye Th this is this is this is what i was talking about the dream is ruined show had the setup but he just took too much damage. This is the, the issue. He had to go for the five there. And uh, he went for the greedy line, which I don't actually uh, hate. But unfortunately, he just took too much damage from his partner. Uh, if there was a way his partner could uh, make it a little bit uh, less painful for him. But unfortunately, he couldn't do it. Yeah, um, his partner couldn't do that without hurting his own game plan too much. But we do have another Dragon Dreamer here. And they do hit a Caligos in a much safer board state. Um, it it, yes. it does kind of look like everyone is looking at the results from the first two matches and saying, oh, dragons are pretty good right now. Let me just, you know, try to force dragons every game. It seems to be working out for the winners so far. So everyone's kind of learning the meta of the tournament from the first three games. People are really seeing that dragons are doing well and they're trying to force it themselves. I was going to ask you before Buddy Licious did end up finishing the turn is when you get Caligos, I find that it's hard to optimize, like, how much gold you want to spend on filling your entire board with dragons versus just buying the battle cries immediately so that you don't fall too far behind. For Moody Licious, we saw him throw away um, his full board state just to get another dragon online. Do you agree with the play? I, I think that makes perfect sense, especially because he's fighting the ghost, so he knows that he's going to be a little bit weaker. I think in the in the early game, you definitely want to fill your board with as many dragons as possible. Uh, benefits if you can hit Razor Girl or Mirazon just because um Mirazon will give you extra gold to get a lot of uh scaling razor gore skills by itself so um those two if you can roll into early sometimes you might just skip uh weaker dragons just to see if you can hit those two and uh skill from them Moody Licious here just thinking thank goodness Sho already died this early on because now <laughs> I had the Caligos in the pool and no competition for dragons at least uh, from Sho that's definitely true definitely good uh, uh safe play from him getting the the Kelly ghost from show's dead body i would say rogojin Rogo gonna take quite hefty damage here by virtue of the Olvar able to take a okay take a value trade potentially but in the end it still gets rid of the wildfire elemental yeah uh, the wildfire elemental staying alive would have been the big punish there but unfortunately he gets to kill it off before it uh, he takes too much damage. So. He does have a lot of pairs, um, two pairs in his in his board. Yeah, the Baron is also a good pickup for this turn to make him safer. Right now, he needs to triple something, otherwise he he will definitely fall b far behind. He doesn't have okay, so he he doesn't have a void uh, <laughs> lord, which is what I was about to say, but he does pick it up, so he's in a much better spot, I think now. Uh, he does need another e extra juggler. If he can find another juggler, I think he'll be in a really good spot as well. This is pair gaming at its finest. What does he end up selling here? And does he probably even need the to two play four. the Baron? I, I think he can... Uh, probably the Baron would be better for him this turn just because he does have two spawns on the board. And he is going to go for the Void Lord. The issue with the Void Lord over the uh, Baron here is that the Void Lord can get sniped. So you're, you're adding a high uh, variance of RNG. Also, the Baron will uh, trigger the double death rattle. I do think this is... Okay, so he is going to sell the egg to do both. Okay, I think that is a way to salvage it. I don't think he needed to do that because the egg with the spawn is is very strong. Mm -hmm. I do think just generally he could have just held on to the 
uh, the Void Lord for it this turn and been strong enough. But this is a good uh, salvage play to uh, make sure that he, he can be strong enough. He did definitely give himself the most tempo this turn at the expense of some gold flexibility for the next turn. But maybe he did have some knowledge on Bootylicious being this strong. Really strong, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, I, I'm definitely big on holding gold to utilize it when you need it. But I do think uh, in these tournaments, sometimes holding gold might be the determining factor of you taking like 10 extra damage that you didn't need to. So uh, it makes a lot of sense. You get a lot of extra information from teammates, so, and yeah. all of these juggles will be the saving yeah. grace for Ogajin. Yeah, Void Lord doing a lot of work here, uh, saving him here a lot of damage. So it's nice to see he's also punishing the player here, taking, dealing about 15 damage to him. So uh, very good punish from him. Uh, found the turn. Ooh. Ooh, two triples this turn, getting two six drops. Yeah, that is a lot of chances to hit. Little Rag, Amalgadon, even. <laughs> Selling the spawn. I like this play. Yeah, it's I think actually this makes a lot of sense. The worst minion in this case because he wants room to really go for this elemental train. I love it as well, but uh. He has to buy here, right. or he'll throw a gold away. Okay. I wonder if he's looking at the mirror zone, depending on what he fought last turn. Um, he will be facing Fishu, who is the leader of the pack at the moment. So definitely thinking about just getting more stats in the board as well. Yeah, this Yogg is is definitely getting a power play. Uh, hopefully it will be enough because uh, there he he has he is on two lives, so he needs to be strong this turn. Um, doesn't have an extra roll, so he just has to hope this is enough. This board is okay. Uh, hopefully, the his things on the end can carry him the twenty, the twenty six eighteen and the nine forty three. Hopefully, there are enough stats for him to be able to uh, survive this turn. Ooh, well, I like having, his positioning. Yeah, the Nomi in front is such a big deal here to snipe the Divine Shield off of the Poison Amalgadon, which means the Wildfire Elemental can also just fill that off and remove the Divine Shield on the track. Yeah, I think he had absolutely no chance if he didn't position there correctly. So you can see the difference in positioning where here he it looks like he does have a chance to actually survive with the 937 uh, killing most of his board. Where before if he had uh, the poison, uh, the big minion just go into the divine shield, he would have had absolute, absolutely no chance to survive. So you can really see the difference in positioning causing uh, the, whether him, him taking a lot of damage or, or dying here. So That Gar was MVP. The big one, that is, but also the little ones generated because that's a free triple that XQN gets. Oh my goodness. Nar triples are also insane. So he's in a lot better spot than he was just a turn ago with this uh, with this triple. So we'll we'll see if this can carry him. We, this is our first, I think, Nomi Gamer that we're seeing of the tournament. And you can really see how powerful it can be. Everything's scaling up really effectively. You can see he's, us he's utilizing the Jins. That's kind of scary because... The jins are weak themselves, so there he might want to sell those jins at some point and and replace them with a lot stronger minions. But maybe he'll be enticed by the greed to keep the jins alive for a little <laughs> bit longer. Oh, I am always enticed by the greed, but you make a really oh, good. Wow. Oh wow! Okay, well that's one way to do it as well. Just triple it off of the uh, the discover. So really, really nice to see him Man, <laughs> getting all the lucky hey. needs. I'm gonna make this poignant point about, you know, when you have two Jins and the Nomi, that's essentially three board spaces deleted from your actual threat, but now he gets to have the best of both worlds. He needs to roll into a... okay, uh, okay, he found it. He, he, he doesn't have a lot of time, oh, though. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot I would of time. push the button oh, here. He, push the button? Yeah, he, okay. he, yeah he, he pushed it. He didn't have the time. Um, but uh, at least he got it. He got the, his plays down, so... Uh, he he preferably wanted to swap the nine ten for a big um, uh, ooh maybe not maybe he knew his opponent's um, board but oh the the juggler doesn't work here because the uh, the juggler is golden and it's just gonna go into the uh, this is unfortunate yeah, uh, but we'll see if he has enough stuff yeah I, we'll I'm see not if he sure has if enough stuff he had direct information on the board save but he could have just seen demons except for one yeah. and you can kind of uh, yeah. just yeah, assume make that, that that's a juggler bail. Yeah, it looks like the jugglers are going to be too big. Uh, I don't know if even picking up the extra um, 
the extra elemental would have been enough. Actually, actually, I'm disrespecting. The I'm disrespecting the no. Yeah, yeah, I am definitely disrespecting the guy. It's it's gonna be big enough. Oh, Gar. This Gar from XQN, even before it was golden, before when it was a little baby, it soloed the last board, and now it's golden, all grown up, and it's soloing the, all the juggler hit from this Alec here. And that means the Yogg from 2 health is in prime position to pull everything back and maybe even land. A good tactical yeah, I, I, I did not notice how big that thing was. I, I was <laughs> just looking at everything else on the board, and I did not see how strong it was going to be keeping it alive. So, yes. Uh, it looks like he's in a really good spot now, though. Uh, with a Golden Jin getting a lot of double value every turn, with the scaling from the Gnar, as long as he can avoid uh, poison poison opponents, it looks like uh, Murlocs aren't in the lobby and Beasts aren't in the lobby as well. So it's actually extremely difficult to get poison in this lobby. So the Elemental, this is probably the main reason why Elementals are, are doing so well in this lobby. Both Murlocs are out and the, the Beasts are out, so you can't get an easy 2-8 poison. You only have to rely on Amalgadon rolling into Poison or the 1-1. One, one. So uh, Elementals look to be doing a lot of damage here. It's also a big deal that one of the Caligos players got poached by another one. So the Dragons couldn't quite um, out, <laughs> like try to bully the Elementals before they could really pop off. But That's last true time we well. checked in with Silver Name, he had two Pirates. Now he has a full Divine Shield build, which definitely looks like... Um, just trying to make sure he can land in top yeah. four, but there's no chance against elementals in this <laughs> He found another Nar, so they're they're really doing a lot of work. Uh, it looks like Silver Name was trying to go for a top four gameplay, uh, just avoiding the uh, the really strong people in the lobby. But uh, he did have a you know not a top tier hero AFK. Didn't get a top tier start with the. Uh, with no Hungry Dragon or Bronze Warden, so uh, he was trying to salvage it. He did uh, end up uh, not being 7th or 8th, so uh, he does have that going for him. Maybe he can be... He's definitely going to be 6th here because he got lost by the person in front, so even if they, even if the Omu dies, he'll still be 6th. So. Right. He was just yeah. making the best with the resources he was given, but it's a very big deal because his partner, Goddammit, did finish at 7th, so... This is the lobby where the other half of players who have been trying to catch up the green team this whole time, this is where they can try and equalize things. We have now the dragon player looking for Nadina. Is this safe to level? This is unfortunate because Fritteris and Sho also got bottom four here too. That was the white team that we've been talking about there. Unfortunately, got another bad performance here. So it uh, looks like the other two um, teams are going to be... Uh, catching up the, the the second and third places are all here so they're really going to get a lot of value this uh this round i was about to ask about the argus positioning because i tend to think there's two ways he could have gone about it just put the buff on the things with that have taunt already if you don't want to play into cleave or just put it on two without taunt to give you more uh chances of value from strong shell so this um this positioning makes a lot of sense if you are planning on hitting a Nadina. It means that um, the Nadina is a lot more uh, uh, controlled, where you know what are going to get the Divine Shields in, and you're not going to get randomly blown out by a random cleave, right? If you have everything taunted, then sometimes uh, your opponent goes first, they have a gigantic uh, four Reaper, it blows out three, four of your minions, you know, not four, but three of your minions out of there and you're you're uh, far behind. So this is a much safer play, uh, especially if you're going to find an Adina to just make sure that you don't uh, get unlucky in those hits. However, it doesn't look like anyone has cleaves, but it's still just good habit for me if you are going to play that way. Oh my goodness. Golden Juggler, regular Juggler, Golden Malganis. I <laughs> yeah. These dragons, I want to say they're big enough, but I've been proven wrong by many a juggler. Yeah, um, this, this is the difficulty with uh, juggler comps. Um, you are going to be extremely strong in the early game. You can see he's still in first place because he's been able to uh, avoid a lot of damage by juggling off a lot of the problem minions and just like being able to kill things. But eventually juggler comps do get outscaled. There's only so many jugglers you can realistically hit unless you're in Mama's uh, hitting extra Void Lords and things like that. So uh, he was actually fairly close, not going to die or anything here, but probably going to fall off in the next couple of turns. So uh, Rogo Jin, we can see him probably going to, uh, you know, take top three or so. However, I feel that he didn't get lethal damage, though. 
Um, yeah. I was gonna say before the Lich King died, the top four were two pairs of teammates. That's now it is Udilicious and XQ and teamed up against Rogojin. Yeah, it looks like um, I, I I had a lot of faith in Rogojin actually winning the lobby just because he had a really good setup with the Nar and the elemental scaling with the fact that there aren't that many um, answers to his board state. People have to find the one one. So unless you fight this guy before, you're not gonna know how big the Nars are, right? And if you fight this guy, you're gonna die. So the moment you know you need to start picking up poisons is the moment you're dead. So it really looks like he's just gonna take the lobby, especially when he already has a teammate in this in this uh in as his opponent. So it's looking really good for him. It, it, he he really found the the way to make things work. Yeah, XQ1 should also have knowledge on what Rogojin's comp is because his teammate did face him a while ago. It's definitely going to be really difficult for Rogojin to try and pull it out, but it's such a big deal that Bootylicious and XQN are able to get this win because they were definitely okay. falling behind. He did find the poison. Oh, if he could... um, it, I, I actually don't think it would have been enough, but if that poison <laughs> could have hit the... the, the the Nar or the Gar, it would, it would have, it might have uh, made this look a little bit closer, but probably still lost. I mean, those Amalgadons are so huge as well, so mm -hmm. it, it, it'd be really tough for him to to have an answer here. But he did, he did play to his outs. Uh, you know, sure. that's something that good players do a lot. They know they're unfavored. You know, they're they're likely to lose. What are the one thing I could do to maybe? Got a cheese win. I could buy the one-one poison, put it first. Maybe it kills both of the Nars, and I have enough damage from the other sources. But wasn't good enough. Absolutely, for Rogozin in that type of spot, if he knows that he's just faced with an even bigger board than what he couldn't destroy Ooh. the turn prior, it wouldn't be he surprising skipped. to see him just go for a bunch of. He points. skipped it's the uh, Anora module. I know he's fighting against the opponent, uh, his teammate, <laughs> but he skipped the Anora module that he could put on the Amalgadon. I just. <laughs> Just want to mention that. No. Yeah, he doesn't care. He's selling everything. <laughs> yeah. All right. That that's fair. I I don't think he could have beaten uh, XQN anyways. But if you were trying to play this out realistically, you could realistically just uh, get that poison and put it first and see if it could snipe the Nars and then the other yeah. uh, minions only could do something. They still cared, but the only thing they care about now is finding um, either a Nat Pagel. Oh wait, sorry. There's are there pirate? Yeah, there are pirates here. Or a shifter Zeris. Those are the only he's, two minions I'm he's interested going, in. He's going. He's he's going for the Imp Mama. They're 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 going for which is the strongest one minion I can play to to win here, and he's going for the Imp Mama. I think that's that makes a lot of sense. I think Boat would be another good option here. You could also just uh just go for a, a poison. <laughs> you know, See if that works. It's so interesting that two lobbies now we've seen. Bar uh, Lord Barov in top ahead. two with a teammate. It really just goes to show you how much stronger this hero can be when you get the additional information oh. from your partner. Oh, this isn't fair. Wait, this isn't fair. I thought this was gentleman's agreement. We both play one minion. What is this? What is this? 20, 2351. That, that's not fair. Uh. <laughs> 41 damage, a true OTK unless it was patchwork on the other side. Really, really impressive from both Bootylicious and XQN because now they are um, teammates in first and second and XQN also just won the first lobby. So maybe trying to equalize their uh, silver name though and good dumb it, still shouldn't feel too bad about their performance because they did give themselves quite a bit of leeway earlier on. Uh, Collins, not so much dragon action this time. I, I do think that this is going to shake up the standings. And as we can see here, they actually took over uh, Dummit and Silvername here with their performance. I, uh, their consistency has been showing up here. Uh, you can kind of see there, there are some people falling down behind. A, a lot of um, eight places for some of the uh, people at the bottom standings. But uh, there are two people, two teams in the lead. Hopefully they can uh, continue showcasing their performance. Uh, you are right. There are no. There were no dragons here, probably because. Sorry, Elementals it was the Barov right that was dragons, yeah. and he did end up second. But it did seem like elementals were king in that lobby. I'm just really curious the fact that we've seen dragons in top four pretty consistently. What's going to happen in a lobby where they're banned away? Um, if dragons get banned, I think 
players might revert to Murlocs. They're still pretty strong if you can get an early brand and an early uh, lookout. You can do something like that. Another thing is elementals are going to be in every lobby. So uh, they're probably going to be seen in almost every game just because uh, there will be some elementals at, at some point. So we'll see what goes on there. Very cool lobby overall. And if you're going to ask me for a highlight, honestly, I was very happy to see a demon player get as far as top three. I think that's extremely impressive with the jugglers play. And I think it all came off the back of that one turn where he was not overly greedy with holding the Baron Rivendare. Uh, do you have any expectations for demons moving forward? Uh, I, I think we might see more juggler demons. I don't think we're really going to see Wrath Weaver demons just because you end up taking a lot of damage to have similar stat lines of what elementals can do. So you end up just being just as strong as elemental players or maybe even weaker than elemental players, but you're like 20 health less than if you just went elemental. So I really don't see that doing a lot of uh, damage in these lobbies, but only time will tell. Thank you for all of the insight, Collins. That does mark our halfway point for the day. Four lobbies in the books, and now somebody has taken over the green team. It's now the yellow team to watch, and white team, unfortunately, have a lot of points to overcome if they want to close that gap. For the second half of the day, don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Hearthstone Battlegrounds EMEA Cup. Um, we are flying through the day. We're actually just past the halfway point of the action for today with these players trying to qualify their way through to Sunday. Uh, my name is, of course, Soto, and I'm joined once again by Educated Collins. And it's going to be a privilege for me, Collins, to be able to chill out in the host position for once and rely on your big brain to carry us through proceedings. How have you enjoyed the day so far? It's been really fun. I'd like to see everyone play. I'm surprised that... Dragons have been so dominant, but Elementals have also been uh, taking a lot of victories as well. So those two uh, minion types have been doing a lot of damage. Yeah, I know we were just uh, talking a little bit in the break about both of us kind of picked out uh, Fritteris and Sho as one of the teams to potentially look out for, and they're having a bit of a disappointing performance so far. But we're just saying, you know, they, they do need to keep their head in the game because although they're a little bit stranded right now in fourth position with top three all quite close, they don't have to shoot for the top, which I think was a really crucial point that you made. They just have to scrape back into that second place position and they can make their way through to Sunday. Yeah, a couple of firsts and seconds from both of them, maybe two of them, they could, they could do it in two games, you know, so it's it's still out possible for them to uh, to reach the finals. So we just have to see what they how they perform. But have you you know gazing your critical eye over the gameplay so far? Have you noticed anything from either of them that would contribute them to being in last place right now, or have they just not not got the roles so far? Um, I, I think they're either so they're kind of playing for first. Uh, it seems that both of them are are making sure they level or power spike. But in playing for first, right, you're seeing the other end of the the stick where you 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 go for that early level six, but you don't make it, right? You don't you're not strong enough to beat the people that are leveling normally. So they're they're trying to win, but in, in doing so, they're getting the other end of the stick where they don't get the right situations or they get unlucky in the battles and they they end up taking early losses. So it, it's kind of a it's kind of they're playing for the other tournament where. They're going for first or eight, right? Where, where you're seeing the punishment of going for first or eight. If you get two eights in the first four games, you're you're out of there. You're 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 going to be last place. So that's what's going. How on. much of that do you think is like potentially streamer mentality as well? Because obviously you're a battleground streamer. Like, do you think there is something in your head that feels like you should be pushing for first place because that's more entertaining to your viewers if you uh, are making the big pushes? Definitely, uh, for sure. A lot of viewers are like, if you're not first, you're last. So they, you know, they <laughs> they don't give you any break. So definitely could be some of that. They're both uh, known streamers, so they might be trying to do the best they can for their viewers, but it's ending up backfiring a lot of the times. Yeah, good time to shout out as well. If you want to see anyone's uh, particular POV, uh, most of the players here are streaming their own POV. Um, so you can go check that out if you, for some reason, do not want the expert analysis of myself and Collins talking you through the day and you want to follow one player in particular, uh, you can go check out their streams. But this is where we stand right now at the halfway point through day number one. Uh, Dummit and Silvername were the early leaders, um, but they just got usurped by XQN and Boodalicious. And we are now ready to go into lobby number five for the day and wow that is some picks yeah. all right collins these these nerfed are some rag. nice choices Pro nerfed rag versus the other two top tier heroes I, what are you going with here i would probably just still take rag rag really has okay. that uh, <laughs> way to just power spike i don't think the nerf was enough to take it from the top spots i still think it's going to be a really good pick as long as you can avoid dying and you know that other people won't be having yog won't be having those dormer to punish you so uh seems like a good pickup for me i do think yog would be a decent second we uh, once again do see dragons active in this lobby. I think Gio made a great point just before the break. It's the, the way the metagame has gone in this tournament so far. I think dragons banned is going to be the most interesting lobby from this point because it does seem like a lot of the players so far have been very tunneled so, on so the early Caligos strat. There is a reason to be taking the Yogg instead of the Ragnaros here. He he is looking at the the, um, the minion types and he, he sees there's no mechs for him. Right? Mm. So that really hurts Ragnaros. Mm. And also, he's playing Yogg. He sees there's dragons. Yogg has a really good ability to get to five early. So he's thinking, oh, I'm just going to go Yogg, try to get an early triple into a Caligos and win the lobbies as I've done before. So that's probably the reason why he skipped up the Ragnaros here. Probably looked at the minions. It looks like uh, XQN is going to greed his Murloc Tidehunter here. Do you want to tell us why, Collins? Maybe he's fighting his uh, friend. I would say that would be probably make the most sense. The other reason is so that he could hero power and... Um, get a triple if he's not finding his friend which he is is he probably is. Yep. Uh, makes the most sense to me but 
he could also just have um trying to hold on to maybe some type of hero power shenanigans but i i, I think yeah. you don't need to do that it's a free roll right if you're playing your your teammate here you can just say to him okay don't play a minion we'll tie and then if he hit another tight hunter in the shop he had the opportunity to just go for like stay on tier one for an extra yeah. turn just to guarantee that triple right? yeah so we really got a like really really good start for yak probably some of the best minions you can hit here uh uh, especially if you're going to force uh, some type of Murloc composition, which makes a lot of sense uh, as mm -hmm. well with the uh, picks that are available. Where do you want this buff to go? I like putting it on the other 3-4 as well, especially since you're looking to hit that triple. You can get one giant minion later on. Do you agree with that? Yeah, there, there's, it, it actually makes so much sense because in the early game, uh, minion breakpoints matter so much. Like having a 2-3 versus having a 3-4 is significantly stronger being able to chunk two minions and have a two for one where if you have a two two you might get you might get a one for one or maybe get killed freely by a three three so changing from a two three to a three three or a three three to a four four is extremely powerful and extremely relevant and that was so smart again from xqn like i'm sure he moused over lich king and saw that there was no minion type being shown so he assumed he had the uh, the righteous protector there right so again that was a free roll for him because actually playing his minion the fight result would have been exactly the same, right? Like the reborn would have just come back and he would have taken the exact same amount of damage. So yeah. X XQN has actually managed to greet this Tidehunter for two turns while having the exact amount of health he would have done otherwise. That's yeah. such smart play. Actually ends up getting a, maybe even a better board than he could have had otherwise being able to keep mm -hmm. both of the minions that he uh, he he wanted. Normally if you oh. get this play, you wouldn't have... Whoa, that's insane. Okay. That's Silver name, yeah. He absolutely nutted the uh, third Rockpool Hunter and discovered into Bronze Warden. Like, that is literally the best possible opening Silver name. I, I really thought the Shutter Walk wasn't going to lose that round. He was really <laughs> yeah. strong. So I was I was like, wait, what's going on? Actually gets destroyed here. Okay, so Silver name's in an extremely good spot uh, right now to do a lot of directions. He could level if he doesn't like these minions or he could roll in hero power so he's really deciding uh, i don't like the minions that he has on the board right now so i would either decide either to level and see or to roll so he's going to go for the line i think this is a good line considering that you are so strong right now that you might not lose even if you leveled and waste six gold or unutilized six gold I would not have even thought about that. When I'm this strong, I'm hitting that level button every single time. So yeah, definitely agree Everyone's with uh, Silvername going to tier 3 here. He actually has now gone for the position where he stayed on 1 for an extra turn and has actually now jumped ahead of the lobby on the leveling curve by just getting so <laughs> strong with that Bronze Warden Discover. That's actually... Well, he's still, he's still gonna win, but... <laughs> yup! <laughs> Those those hits from the uh, the dragons were probably best case scenario to remove a lot of that damage there. But uh, Bronze Warden is showing how strong it is. Sometimes I view that as a tier four minion. Yeah, agreed. I think it's absolutely one of the strongest tier three minions in a vacuum. Just you know, regarding uh, or ignoring board states and synergies, I think it's just straight up one of the strongest minions. Okay. Wow, everyone hitting early triples this lobby. Yeah, a lot of a lot of early triples here. He can decide to go for a four. However, um, there are no pirates, so he can't get he can't hit gold grubber. He really wants to go for a five. He's just thinking, how do I get this to work? He is playing die cap. Yeah, which means I believe this turn he could go straight to four, right? Doesn't his gold work out perfectly here that if he hero powers, he could just go straight to four again and then yeah, he, take he the could triple go into straight a five to four, drop next but turn? he does miss out on on the extra gold on the following turns. He might just That's buy true. one of the dragons and then try okay. to go for a five next turn or in two turns. I can see that. Okay. So we'll, we're gonna see how he's gonna fare against the You're opponents. We do know there. the Shutterwalk had a lot of Murloc synergies as well, so that might be also able to deal with the opponent. It looks like he um, bought the uh, hero Ooh. power, the dragon. Yeah, he did indeed. That six five is gonna do a ton of work here, and the Murloc snipe on the first attack is huge. But Dummit still just gonna come out with a wow. small win here. I did not think the Sky Captain would win that round. Uh, I thought no, the six either. seven would be able to uh, destroy, but uh, unfortunately, those hits were not in his favor. 
Yeah, so now we're back at a tricky decision point again for Dummit. Again, the fact that he's playing Sky Captain gives him so many possibilities here that wouldn't be available to most heroes because yeah. of that ability to just spike in gold. Like, there's so many ways he could play this. He yeah. could even choose to just, like, Giga Greed a six here at some point, right? If he really yeah, wants to. I think to. he's going to, yeah, I think he's going to use the hero power now to get the five. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now he's looking for the brand. Uh, unfortunately, Lookout and Burgergo doesn't really work as well, but he did find the Mama Bear, which he can use to, to have direction. Yeah, decent direction, at least for the mid game. Um, that pan out right there, though, is one of the reasons why I've gone away a little bit from discovering fives, just in my limited experience with the patch so far. Because the, the five pool, I think, was already very feast or famine. Like, obviously, Lil Rag used to be there, Nomi used to be there, Bran used to be there. But there's so many whiffs, and now they've added the uh, the poisonous minion to that pool as well. It feels pretty bad to discover fives in the long position. Oh, he's so not even playing the Maybe I'm just too greedy. That, that's actually fair. Uh, no need to waste that gold, I think. So, he goes for a safe play. He's still kind of considering going Murlocs, actually. Um, unfortunately, he needed to hit a, a brand this turn. If he hit a brand, he'd be in a much better spot. But now that yeah, he, he sure. has the Mama Bear, he really either has to focus on going a beast comp or, or uh, try to struggle and hit a brand organically. Yeah, probably only has a couple of turns to really hit one or the other, or his board state is going to start falling off massively. But he takes a small hit here from the Daryl, and we will see what someone else is doing as Rogogine here takes a small hit from the Lich King as well. He's holding a lot of money in his hand currently. His board state still I, I, incredibly I assumed weak. he had a triple lock because that his hand looks like, oh, this is what I would do if if, if I was holding onto a triple and just wanted right. to wait a turn. Because his board looks very weak, but he can get a six drop here, deciding how he wants to do it. So he wants to keep the pair. Um, there, there was an I, I would actually make the argument of selling that elemental because if you do find the Caligos, then you can play the, the battle cry to get the buff immediately. But he went for keeping the pair, so he maybe find extra value. Uh, Amalgadon is a decent hit, but not amazing. Yeah, a little bit, or quite a lot below the value of a Caligos. But I, I do like your point. Like it's, It kind of cuts both ways, right? Because now having not hit the Caligos, he has another chance, right? Because yeah. he has another pair in his hand, so he's kind of hedging against the worst case scenario as opposed to ensuring the best, which yeah. I kind of like because if you hit the Caligos there, does the extra plus one plus one to everything really like? I, I, is I'm it just a deal worried breaker? that he might take too much damage in two turns, um, that he might just die. Uh, he's not in a safe spot. The Amalgadon did hit Divine Shield, so that kind of gives you a little bit of safety, but he wasn't in a safe spot. You can see that uh, the opponent did Hello? commit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, not only did he commit, but so did Bob, apparently. Like, Bob just handed him everything he needs here. Hydra, double parrot, he's set up so nicely uh, for some late-game B scaling now, if he can find Goldrin and swap out of this high main later on. Yeah, uh, the the play Rafam went is kind of a feast or famine comp, where he needed to hit the Kelly Ghost, and then he needed to scale here. This is what I was scared of. This is why I would try to get the extra plus one, plus one buff, because you could just die gotcha. here. Uh, uh, it, 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 it was looking rough. His board wasn't strong, so I was definitely worried about him. That's uh, fair. So joining uh, Lich King POV here, he is on Tavern 5, so he could um, immediately hit something like Baron just to give him a little bit of mid-game strength with he's, that he's golden spawn. He's also on as 37 well. health. Yes, he is. Yeah, so he's got a lot of um, room to work with in terms of his health total. The eternal debate we saw there, I know players disagree on this when you have that situation as to whether you hero power the, the parrot or the spawn. Like, which side of that do you come down on? Um, I have done both, honestly, and it, it mm. kind of depends on if I have taunts or not. Right here, yeah. he has one taunt, so it's likely that the, um, the spawn won't get sniped, right? But if you don't have any taunts on the board, you'd rather just make sure that the spawn uh, stays alive, so... I, I, I don't have a strong opinion either which way. I do think that's probably a right choice, but I haven't thought about it enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, with Nomi in play, that's probably looking like his primary method of scaling for right now. Like, Are you a, are you a fan of Nomi as a win condition? I know a lot of people do think it's uh, yeah. too slow in the current I was I was a little surprised that they didn't touch Nomi, but I guess the, the rag nerf did do enough to uh, make elementals a little bit uh, less problematic. But I do think Nomi is... 
one of the bigger scaling uh, options for uh, elementals right now. So uh, yeah. if they can get it early, like he does, and he's still relatively healthy, we will see after this battle if he is still. That good. was the worst possible attack there. It was his attack, and he sniped the far left rat pack, whereas any other attack he would have made will have disrupted this beast synergy at least a little bit. Yeah, he has just fed absolute max value to his opponent here. And you said he had 37 health. It looks like he is going to need it. You can see that uh, hero powering the spawn would have been better here. Just <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You're not wrong. Yeah. He only takes 10, though, which isn't as much as it looked like it would have. So it's not too bad. We are seeing a Jandis player. We This is maybe one of the few Jandises we've seen so far with uh, Puggers being removed. But... Uh, He's not in an amazing spot, honestly, right now. He does have a bunch of uh, pairs, so he's looking to triple into something uh, useful. He does find a Jug now as well, which is uh, one of the best Jandis minions outside of Pogo, at least I, for the mid-game. I actually but he doesn't would really just have... buy the... Uh, okay. I, I think mm. I would actually just buy the Jug here. He's going yeah, for the plus four, plus four on the... Um, the cleave. I don't th know if four attack is worth using Jandis hero power on, where you could have uh, bought the jug and used it to get two jug uh, hits on the next turn. Uh, yeah, completely agree. Yeah. I think I would have started cycling jug there as well. Yeah, this this board, uh, as Sean knows, is not gonna is not gonna survive. It's definitely gonna fall off extremely fast. He, he needs to hit the mama bear. Uh, roll into one or triple into a goldren or something, because these this board will not last. It'll uh, he's lucky he's fighting the ghost, really. <laughs> Ooh. XQN going into this fight with a frozen Bran in his tavern, but he is substantially weaker than his opponent right now with only 11 health. And that, those are some high tier minions. He does have the Battlemaster. That might That's be true. his saving grace here. That is true. Maybe. Those attacks, those attacks oh. all going right is a big deal, no? Because now the parrot gets one value trade on the battle master as well, and now that double damage is going to come through, oh, no. and the Calagos is going to live, which oh, means no. XQN is going to bite the dust. I would have loved to have seen the percentage of lethal there because that did seem quite unlucky with all of the attacks uh, going to the right taunt as opposed to the parrot taunt. Yeah. Because if he'd have softened up that parrot a little bit, that means only one attack would have gone into the battle yeah. master and it, he would have had the health he needed. It looks like he wasn't supposed to die there. Um, right, but I agree. just got a little bit unlucky with those hits to, uh, to die. So here we see Silvername in his natural habitat, jamming Calagos. This is what we've seen him do so far throughout this lobby, and it's been he, uh, very successful for him. He's more of a menagerie comp this time. Un uh, unfortunately, he doesn't get to jam the Calagos in the way that he wants. But he's he's looking at the uh, the Murlocs here, I think, and seeing... Oh, no, he's he is looking at the dragons. He is looking at the dragons. What a surprise. I didn't think he would be... Uh, committing to the dragons. Oh, but he is looking at the Murloc too, so it, it's a little bit of both, and he might end with a hero power. Oh, no, he's not going to. Okay. No, 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 no. These, these aren't Murlocs, <laughs> Collins. These these are just cards that say Battle Cry on them, okay? That's all Silver Name sees. He's a Caligos gamer. <laughs> I would be looking at the Murlocs here uh, and seeing if I could make a clean Murloc composition, but looks like Silver Name has a game plan. Stick with what has been working, and working yeah. has been dragons. So Indeed. And already he finds himself top six with uh, two players dead in the lobby. 22 has double scaling going with both the Bran and the Caligos. Yes. Uh, a little bit weird to be looking at a far right giant taunted parrot. That's a little unusual board state to be dealing with here. Especially when he does have a Bagurgle in play as well. Yeah, he's, it's just there to, um, to prevent cleaves. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, it, it's not doing much else besides that, in that port, in that positioning. Ooh, this Daryl is really strong. I think Daryl Daryl's been kind of tough to play in these lobbies in in, in this patch so far because it's kind of hard to scale and, and and people outscale you really fast. But he's got a pretty decent. Oh, he actually won. <laughs> I'm surprised. I bet the percentages were not in his favor. He even looked yeah. shocked that he won too. So, uh, yeah. I'm Fairly sure Silvername just scammed two yeah, fights yeah. in a row. Without without being able to see the percentages, it feels that way to me. Yeah, he's got a lot of a lot of things going in his favor today. So we'll see if that continues. Yeah, it looks like we are gonna see the end of the Alakir here with the Fishu. 
cleanly eliminating huge boards still left over. Looks like he's got something cooking with a bunch of elemental value in his hand as well. Don't know whether he had a genie on his board to begin with. It looks like he did, right? Because he got he mm -hmm. has two elements in his hand and he has a Baron on the board, so it looks yep. like it had to be from there a it genie. Is. Nice work out there. Looks like he's going Nomi scaling with the uh, genie genie SD uh, setup. He's looking for poison for the uh, the amalgadon, which I really like to see. So we'll see if he can Great. pick it up. Tavern Tempest is a huge roll off that genie, by the way. While well, you have uh, Nomi scaling on the go, and he does hit he the does top hit spin it, as yeah. well. Yeah. So it looks like he's in a pretty good. Oh, he finds another one. Okay. Yo. This shop. What is he selling here, though? That's the real question. That is a good question. How long until we have to get out of spawn? It's fairly weak at this he point. Could, he, in yeah, I think he, yeah, I minions. think he could sell that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Just sell the the minion. It is big, but it's not necessary. Okay. Oh, he's not hero powering the Jin. Oh, not greeting. Going for the survival play. I like this. He's not greeting. I I might greet because I'm still at 21. <laughs> But he's, he's going for the I want to win for sure. All right, fair enough. And to show's credit, his uh, strategy of buffing up that Hydra multiple times with the uh, Jandis bounce has created a huge cleave here. Which does get decent value, but only on the left-hand side, only hit the Divine Shield on the Poisonous minion. Yeah, that Poison does might still do have a lot of damage. the opportunity to value trade. Okay. If that had gone far right and hit the Baron or the Pack Leader first, that could have been huge. Issue. I gotta say, this Jandis is stronger than I thought uh, the Jandis would be uh, over Same. over time. He, he actually found a way to make it work. Yeah, agreed. Surprising to me, that is a deceptively large Hydra that he's created by uh, making that play that we were both kind of against, where he just uh, bounced it back and forwards a few times, but oh, put in a ton enough. of work from him. It's not enough, though. Just short. Oh. One health? No! What a, oh, what a shame. Wow. And the safe play, Collins. The hero power on the spawn, and then he wins by one health to eliminate the Jandis. Clutch decision making for Fishy there at the end. Yes, and once again, show it getting bottom forward for this. It's getting real tough for them now. Uh, it is. Yeah, Frigerus and Sho just both out in 6th and 5th position, and I think at this point, time might just be running out, because yeah. I think they're going to be even further stranded. Especially at the with Dummit and Silvername getting top 4 here in this uh, in this round as well. They look like to be really doing a lot of work here, so we'll see yeah. how this turns out. Well, crucially, one player from each of the other teams as well, right, is going to have a good result, because there's uh, there's the Fishu and there's Budalicious, who are from purple and yellow, respectively. So every other team having another good round here, apart from the white team. It's like they might be in trouble. Definitely. It's going to be a big gap. Um, it looks like there are a lot of beast players in this lobby, which is uh, unusual, as they have not been seen in the lobbies before, but they're making a resurgence, the beast there. Yeah. Of course, Dummit, we see off the back of that early Mama Bear discover, we followed him through the early game. He had that tough decision on where to take his triple, ended up taking it into a Mama Bear, but held off committing for uh, to Beasts for a couple of turns, but is now hard committed and uh, has some baby Hydras in comparison to the one that we saw from uh, Sho. But overall, I think his board state much, much stronger than the one that we were seeing from Sho. This is, uh, it's so surprising to see the Daryl like, actually having a board that can contest. If he can kill the... Um... The mama but before the 2020 spawns, he might have a chance. Oh, not, That's not anymore. Huge. That's huge. <laughs> yeah. Not anymore. Uh, fortunately, he's not going to die here. So he still has time to make other big minions. But it's it's going to hurt. Yeah, even if he dies to like mama bear and full board of rats here, he's going to survive. So no way he ends up dying. And this war leader should pick apart a good amount of the damage. Might even just about. Okay. If he killed the Mama Bear, he might have had another small loss in him after this, but this is going to be too much damage. Yeah, he's going to hey, be dead to the next one fight. Head now. Yep. It does look like Silver Name got taken out uh, that last round, so. Uh, it looks like the other two players have a shot of uh, kicking out Dummit as well if they can uh, perform well. We'll see how it goes. Speaking of which, do you think the nerf of the the poisonous from four to five has increased the power level of Gar at all? Because I'm it, it surprised. Definitely has. 
I'm surprised how many giant guards we've seen actually putting work in today. Like, I'm not used to seeing that at all. The 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 nerf is quite big because it it limits how often you see it, right? Uh, before, uh, when it was at four, you were seeing it almost every couple of rolls. So you would just take it like randomly. Oh, I'll buy it now, and then I'll save it until the late game when I need it. Right now, right. when you're buying it, you you're committing. You're like, oh, I actually want this poison. I can't sell it. I'm. I, this might be the only one I see ever. So it, it becomes much more of a commitment. So it's a lot harder to pick up. I love all that decision making from Fishu, by the way. He has cashed out of his Nomi, which you do have to do at some point. You can't just have a 4-4 on your board forever. So Unless he sold his Nomi. <laughs> do you actually keep it forever? Wait. <laughs> I uh, know, I, I do cast it out. I was making okay, a joke. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but yeah, he's also sold his spawn, which is something that I was wondering um, if he would have done a few turns earlier when we were last looking at him. So again, that's just another 4-4 four, four on his board that he can't have forever, even though it does add a ton of stats to his board with the Reborn as well. Um, so I really like the way he's approached this late game, and you can see just how enormous he is at this point. Yeah, he's really, really big. Uh, really going to be tough. Uh... <laughs> Wow. Insane. His genie's dropped Gar Little Rat. Yeah. Crazy. This is this is one of those genie games where the genie starts carrying you when you're when you're Lich King. You just hero power the genie and it, it builds your comp for you. You you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> so we are going to be down to uh, the fish shoot and nice dumb it in the top two. Skycap and crack making it all the way to uh, top two, which is With a, a very, beast very comp big as deal. Well. With a beast comp, yeah, but I'm not seeing too many windows for beasts to be able to beat this board, Collins. I don't know about you. Uh, maybe if he finds uh, two Amalgadons and triples his cleave, uh, there there might be... Uh, he also needs oh. to triple his oh. bear now that I'm looking at his actual board. Uh, he does have... Um, he does have one loss in him, and with the loss, he could maybe transition into a Macaw comp. So, it's not hopeless, I think. Yeah, actually, looking so looking at his board previously, I was like, yeah, there's no chance. But now I look at his hand and just yeah, how close yeah. he is overall to just getting that full transition. The hand is the, real, uh, is the real nutter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He's going to halfway transition now, which I think is smart. He knows he's playing against elementals, so the Myxnas are the most valuable yeah. thing he can probably get access to right now. Okay. That was that was pretty good. The he he kept the uh, he bought the token just in case he triples something and then he could get the value on. He's just running out of time to really make those plays. But I think yeah. he made the best transition he could with the time allotted. And uh, don't know if it's going to be enough, but. The potential's there. Uh, maybe next turn he can get the perfect, perfect rolls and, and find that transition. He really needs That's um, a that golden. That was huge. The value trade on the Myxna was insane. That saved him so much health this turn. The problem is the reef spawn. Oh. Yeah. Oh no! An extra, extra eleven damage. It's twenty six. No, it's twenty seven exactly. exactly. Oh no! So close. For Dummit, maybe with that one more turn, he could have found himself triple Baron, triple Parrot, triple Wolf, whatever it was that he needed to get himself over the line. But that is going to be a clean first place for the Fishu coming out in this one. Uh, so what a drastic departure from what we've seen. Uh, Dragons really running away with that lobby, Collins. Instead, it was uh, Elementals and Beasts that we really saw uh, dominating. Yeah, kind of surprising. I think uh, a lot of it had to do with what they hit on 5 and 6. You saw a lot of people hitting Mama Bears instead of uh, Lit Nomis and, and uh, Little Rags and things like that. Caligos is right. You can see once they hit the directional piece, they hit the Mama Bear, they they completely forgot any other comp, just stuck to the beast, stuck to the uh, the, the Nar Nomi compositions, right? And you, you can kind of see that, right? Once some good players, they hit a direction, they kind of give up on all the other things. You can see what that means now, though. Bootalicious and XQN have extended their lead just a little bit. Well, uh, moved out I, to 39, but Fritterus I, and Sho are looking cast off at the bottom. I don't think they've added uh, Dummett's uh, position and points yet. And I think oh, once they right. add that yeah, in, yeah. Uh, he'll actually be ahead of uh, uh, Bootalicious and XQN. So th those two are, are also doing well. You can see Roger Din and uh, the Fisher are also a little bit behind. It, they just need one more. Uh, placement to catch up and you can see Sho and Fritteris uh, falling behind you a little are bit. 
absolutely right, Collins. That's why you're here. We need that keen eye to be spotting these mistakes and making sure the viewers are informed. But yeah, I think the the big deal there was um, how cast off the uh, the white team are at the bottom. Nine points behind second place now. That's a big ask to make up with uh, with just three lobbies remaining. Yeah, they they. This is the time to to turn you know Hulk mode super saiyan and just uh, <laughs> just go go go. You know, one and two, one and two, and you can get in there. So. It's not over. You just need to, you know, find some magic, pay Bob so, a little bit extra. What do, what do they need? Because obviously, before the patch, like when you were on a bad streak, if you'd lost a couple of hundred MMR, or you're trying to get the climb going. You're like, oh, come on, Bob, come on, Bob, give me the rag, give me the rag, give me the Maev, give me the free wins. What what are you hoping for now? Like, what's the go to hero that you want to see to give you security at this point? Um, that's a good question, actually. Uh, I actually don't know if there's a secure hero for. First place, I really think maybe um, Boulevard, like heroes that can utilize the team play aspect, actually are doing really well here. So, Boulevard, uh, maybe Rafam, maybe even a cat, if you can guarantee that you're not going to get last place, you can, uh, you can sneak some wins by stealing other people's compositions. So, uh, I do think they have to, they both have to perform well, right? So, they need good team play, they need good team heroes that they can both, uh, and grab those top positions. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, but I'm still looking forward to uh, what we get in a lobby with uh, no dragons available. And I'm still waiting for that perfect Kaggar lobby to line up, Collins. Like, I want the all tokens <laughs> available lobby to appear. Like, are you, are you a Kaggar gamer? Do you, do I, you drop the Kaggar strap? It's, it's in my tool house, but I know how risky it is. So they need to give me everything in, like, a shop. Okay. Where here is two CAD guards and two tokens. I have some fun. I see that I'll take it, but generally it's so difficult. And even when you get it, you you also have to run the clock because you don't you you have so many decisions to make that it yes. gets very difficult. Yes, and I think uh, you know particularly with some of the animations that go through and some of the uh, anima animation skipping techniques not being allowed in competitive play, that makes it even harder as well. But we are now into lobby number six of the day, and this is not a great selection for Dummit. Uh, I think the days of Edwin Van Cleef are long past, but is he probably still the best pick here in your opinion? Uh, the the issue is there's no beast for the Cleef. We true. call him Edwin Van Cleef, right? There's no yeah, beast, yeah, yeah. so he he's. Still picking him, probably hoping to make a, a mech comp or something. Maybe get lucky with the elementals still. You can get elementals on really any hero, so we'll see. Good start. Yeah, strong opening shot. Both of the uh, premium 2-3s, <laughs> but then, of course, the elemental as well. I think maybe he's fighting his, uh, his teammate. It's probably the reason he's doing that. He doesn't know that we're watching him. I don't... <laughs> uh. We giving and giving up the thumbs up, that does remind me there is a distinct lack of emotes from our players here. Not yeah, enough we, emoting here. That is a good point. We did see the happy cow come out in that uh, top two concede, you know, sell your whole board kind of thing. He, he played it correctly. He sold his whole board and he threw out the happy cow. That is the objectively correct way to do it. But outside of that, you're right. We have not been seeing too much emoting between these players. Yeah, they're not utilizing the mental game of getting in their opponent's <laughs> head, you know? There's a whole aspect of gameplay that we're not seeing. You can really see they're, 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 they still need to work on some things. And I believe this is the first time we've been dealing with a Reno so far. Only just occurred to me. And a patchwork. Me. And a patchwork, yeah. But Reno in particular, I think, is a is a hero that a lot of players do favor. So perhaps a, a little more surprising that we haven't seen him yet so far. What do you think? Yeah, definitely one of the heroes that, if you are hoping for the Cadgar play, this is one of them that can mm. pull it off in spades. So maybe we might be seeing a little something here in this uh, lobby. We are in Beast Murlocs as well. They're both active, so maybe this is the one, Collins. We will have to keep an eye on it. But XQN here on the patchwork, of course, recently buffed back up to uh, 55 health. And I don't know about you, Collins, but I'm starting to feel like this nerf on patchwork was never really necessary in the first place. Like, was this, do you think, a little bit of an overreaction, maybe? I do think that when they initially nerfed patchwork down 
from 60 it, it was actually really strong the consistency and and that light fang meta where you could just level mm. to five take 10 and then find light fang brands organically was was actually very very strong so i do think that the first nerf was a little bit justified but i think after they started introducing a lot of these other heroes that have really been dominating the meta uh you know once rafam started picking up the steam the the health advantage didn't matter as much yeah, I would agree with that. I've also just realized it does at least help you dominate the mental game you were just talking about, because it appears via our leader leaderboards, you're just automatically in first as patchwork with 53 <laughs> health. That's the way to do it. That's the confidence yeah. boost that you need. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's for sure. All right, looks like um, he's going for a good buff on the elemental. I think that elemental is one of the better units to use the KT hero power on just because mm. uh, that minion can scale if you have four attack and you start scaling elementals, it, it continues on. Let's see, Millhouse's shop on six Ooh. gold here. Oh. oh, hello. Okay, yeah, I like this level up. <laughs> yeah. We've been seeing a lot of people leveling up once they hit the triples on six gold just because they don't want threes because a lot of times it doesn't give them direction, right? So they'll just take the loss and then go for a double threes. You might even see this player level up again. Uh, probably not because they don't have the gold for it, but you know, in theory, if they did. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, the other thing that makes this level up so clutch is that he's against the Fishu, his partner this turn. So That's Fishu can actually save him some health this turn as well by underplaying his board. That's true. This, this is a perfect turn to fight your opponent uh right before you're about to get nuts and then you don't have to fight them for the next couple of turns while you you smack the the other players around a little bit show them your dominance so spawn of Nazoth trade here means that actually now the way these trades have gone down that uh fishu is actually going to take a small loss in this situation so dream scenario uh for rogojin having taken yeah, i think i think fishu damage. could afford it to play one extra minion if he knew exactly what the board was uh, probably has a minion or two in his hand and yes. probably could have played an extra one just to uh, make sure he doesn't take as much damage as he did. But either way, still pretty good uh, damage mitigation from both of them. Right. It's difficult, right? Because if Rogo's yeah. first attack had gone into the spawn, like if his 2-2 uh. had trained right into the spawn, then the uh, the dragon would take up a lot more value trade. So maybe he would then lose if he played another minion. It's, it's really hard to work those situations out. Did not advance. hit the... Uh... The Gold Grubber, which is really what Rogerjin was looking for. Hit double mm. Gold Grubber. He's so far ahead of his competition. Unfortunately, he did not hit that. Hit by one pirate this turn, obviously, to get the triple. So he's just going to take the strong arm for some immediate stats. Oh, he's selling it to level. Oh, interesting. Great. Okay, I didn't see this play at all. Um... But it makes sense considering that he didn't hit the gold grubber. There's no need to commit so far. I probably would have uh, gotten for two, um, two fours. But knowing that he doesn't hit the gold grubber, you're a lot less likely to be ahead by getting the gold grubber there. So he's just he's giving up on that game plan and just looking for fives for direction. Maybe he can find um, uh, Nomi or something. Right. He's going to take a big hit for it, at yeah. least by early game standards. But I know he was—he would have been expecting that. He knew he, how weak he is this turn with the, the play that he's making, but now yeah. has the opportunity for the payoff. And there's also this uh, this free roll that he's been hoarding since we before we joined him, which we haven't really been talking about. Obviously, That's it's so true. much stronger on uh, Millhouse than it is on the other heroes, even. Okay, so he found the Nomi. That gives him some direction. He could take the... Oh, wait, it doesn't work. I've, I've tried that. <laughs> <laughs> he could have taken the cat guard, but it, it it doesn't give you an extra minion in your hand, unfortunately. No, yeah, yeah, no. I really wish that did work, but no, unfortunately not. Anything that's more of a reason to buy cat guard, I'm on board. All right, he got a. This is a really good upgrade for his turn. He's on turn. This is not eight gold, yep. and he's really strong for eight gold, especially with the gin giving him extra value. So he's he's in a lot better position. I do right. like the fact that he didn't go for the second four drop and and uh, waited to get a five drop because now he has a lot better direction to actually find a comp that can win him the lobby. So I like, I like this play too. from him. If he'd have uh, if he'd have hit the gold grubber on the first one, do you think he would have taken the second yes. one as well just to yes, look for the, the greed? Yeah, okay. I, I I think you definitely do that. If you hit that's that's what was my plan. If you hit the gold grubber, you go for the second one because you're gonna get the scaling either way, so you're gonna be strong. Unfortunately, didn't get lucky enough. In that. 
Looks like this Jandis uh, has a triple in the in the shop, but does not want it. This time probably is going to wait and see if he can get it next turn and maybe level up as well. Yeah, these Divine Shields are absolutely going to farm this fight, though. That is a big hit to Patchwork, but he's a big boy. He can take it. Uh, it's just 12 that damage. Unfortunately, our Patrick is now going to not be at the top of the standings oh, anymore. Come on. <laughs> That's so unfair. What do you mean? <laughs> Alright, he looks like he's picked up the triple. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Uh well he is playing um he is playing Jandis, so if he wants to commit, he could either take the Burgurgle or the Murazond and hero power it and if he takes the Burgurgle, try to force a um, uh, Murloc comp. If he takes the Murazon, try to force uh, getting a lot of extra value from that. So. That's true. He has a decent setup already to be able yeah. to... He's pretty flexible with his build right now, so if he's able to Murazon he, some key He could roll from first before he hero powers. Okay, I guess he really wanted that uh, that minion. Because he could roll and get a 4, uh, potentially. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, the the roll didn't end up being better. These are not better than, <laughs> than the four four dragon, but it was potentially uh, a play that could have improved the sports state. Yeah, I agree. I think on average the roll first probably would have paid out there, right? Just expecting to see some some bigger four drop minions in the in the tavern. So I think I would have liked to have seen it. And if he get... had one murloc on the board, I think I would have liked the burger go play uh instead but with no murlocs it does make sense to not not commit like that uh especially if you you don't know you're gonna roll murlocs or look out to anything and this is show now on the reno on the other side who looks like he's trying to set himself up for that big golden brand situation with the uh, reno but he's a long way off right now and he looks pretty weak this fight as well uh, it looks like he might. Yeah, it looks like he's gonna lose. Unfortunately for Show, mm -hmm. Show really needs a uh, he needs a big performance uh, these last couple of rounds so that he can uh, make up for the deficit he's already taken in, in the in the first couple of matches. Yeah, still plenty of health to play with though, but he needs to start hitting big right now. Needs to start hitting those triples into some kind of carry minion that he can uh, drop the hero power on sooner rather than later. I would say. Okay, so he's leveling, probably going to try to organically hit the brand, probably because he doesn't have any pairs in his hand except for that one that he's holding. But yeah. um, just oh, is he is he gonna take the money here? That's 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 super risky. But he is fighting his uh, he is fighting his teammate is probably the reason why he's going for the money. It's true. Uh, hoping that they're not strong, uh, they're not too strong, so they they can punish him. I I think that makes sense. I uh, they really have to communicate because. Uh, this Reno could definitely take a lot of damage. So you and and the and Furtis is in first position, knowing that he's taken a lot of damage as well. I mean, he's dealt a lot of damage. So yeah, I mean, uh, he's in he's in first position. He's Tavern Five, which is going to push extra damage, and he's Kaelthas, who is pretty strong around this point of the game. I would say so. It's definitely danger zone. Oh, Although, ah, okay. Well, never mind. That's okay. Not that impressive. Yeah. Yeah, his his board is not as strong. Uh, if he did play the uh, the. Uh, the minion he has in his hand would be a lot more impressive, but yeah, I, I can see I can see why Sho is uh, feeling pretty Let's safe about his board state on against top. this one. All right, we'll see how well they have engineered this fight, trying to get as close to a tie as possible. Of course, looks like uh, Sho will probably win this round, but I think that's what you want to see. Uh, Sho Sho winning or barely winning. Oh, unlucky hit for him though. Or lucky, I mean, they're both the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good and bad fortune are the same when you're playing both sides. A wise man once said. And in fact, it's Fritterus that is going to take a yep, small yep. win here, but you have to say pretty well engineered overall, because it's only yeah. about as small a hit as you could expect. Yeah, Un unfortunate. You really wanted... Um... Show to win. I think Fritters could have taken the damage. Show I don't think can take the damage unless he finds that Reno immediately. So we'll see what he's looking for. There is um he could definitely take the Murloc here and try to triple into a direction if he can triple the the three threes. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing so far this turn Ooh, is the, the snap by on the Sneeds, like just to try and get some additional immediate strength. Do you yeah. like that decision? Yeah, I, I I don't think it's necessary, honestly. I think uh you, you really want to be looking for brand here uh, and uh, and going for the win, right? Because you, you need first and second, right? You, 
for for these players they're back in the original tournament structure where That's first true. and second is everything yeah. So I don't think you can go for the, the 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 slow upgrades. I think you have to hit the brand. You have to hit a Burgergo Lookout and things like that. So I I don't think the sneeze would be a play that I would make. But I I can see him getting worried. Him getting a little bit scared. Needs to make some type of improvement. He still has a role here. Uh, deciding to go for the uh, the uh, the the thing. Oh, and he finds the brand. Oh, this oh, is oh, uh, this go. is the issue. Oh, the punish! It's 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 so <laughs> sad to see. It's so sad to see. Uh, he needed to hit the brand this turn. I don't know. He might still be alive, and hopefully, yeah, he should be strong Ooh, enough. He looks alive. But, and yeah. and maybe now he can he can salvage this board. This is definitely a, this is what I want to be seeing. See if he can uh, turn the game around from this position. He it's all in his hands now. He might actually need at least a reasonable result from the Sneeds, although the way those last two attacks go, yeah, he's now in absolutely fine shape. Those last few attacks were really, really good for sure. He also takes out um, the Brutalicious as well, so yep. taking out a, 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 a huge opponent is, is really going to be doing it. This might be the, the start of the climb for our previous dragons here. <laughs> Yeah, it absolutely is, and let's for sure stay on show for at least this turn to see how strong he can get with this golden brand. Such a big deal now that he doesn't have to invest gold into uh, making this brand golden. Of course, now the hero power is free. He needs to hit a lookout or something. Mm -hmm. Something that can give him a lot of value instantly. Um, that's plus six, plus six. Oh, no, no, it's even better. It's plus 12, plus 12. Mm -hmm. uh, if, he, if he decides to take the 2-3 uh, the as well. Okay. He has one more roll. Ooh, he can get Ooh, money from the Murazon five five. Prince money. Yep. Very nice. Giving him another roll. Maybe he can find something huge here in the next couple of rolls. What did he just play against? Is there anything high value battle cry to come off this? Doesn't look like it's so uh, valuable. Well, yet. he has mm. the selfless. It's something to play. That's true. Nothing scares me. All right, he might still be. It, it, it looks like he has a he has a good chance. He just needs to hit a lookout. I think that's the real key, um, the key position here to hit that lookout. So let's look at. Ooh. Oh no! Oh, oh show! Oh show! The it's dreams. Wrong. The dreams. Oh, disgusting. Absolutely Unfortunate. Absolutely revolting. Oh, is he gonna? Okay, he he should end here. Yeah, he doesn't have yes. the time to play the other elemental. But it's it's gonna be big enough. Yeah, those 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 guards are are going to ruin some dreams again. Unfortunately, this has been a dream ruining stream for uh, <laughs> poor show here again. He's one or two turns away from potentially winning the lobby, but yep. just couldn't scale fast enough. I think there is zero percent chance that either of those guards ever died this fight, which means uh, <laughs> show was just straight up dead. Zero toxins, meaning yet again. I called it out earlier. I'm so surprised at how many of these big guards that we've seen just not getting poisoned so far in this lobby, and that is a guaranteed 18 damage. 18. Oh my. Oh, this is disaster. Oh, what a disaster. Oh, it hurts. I, I feel the pain. <laughs> I know. I feel like we really went through the emotional roller coaster with Show there because we followed him the whole time. We saw him hit. We had the big turn with the Golden How Bran. However, and then you can see there were some opportunities to improve. You, he, he did kind of waste gold picking up the Sneeds. Yeah. yeah taking, taking some extra turns. He. he Lost a turn uh, to hero power the brand by not rolling quick enough, settling for the um, the two three uh, taunt buffer when it didn't really do too much to change this composition in a big way. So you can see there were some uh, areas of improvement that could have been done. Unfortunately for him, you know, not enough, not quick enough, and uh, an unfortunate exit in second place here. But however, Ooh. his partner Fritrus is having a much better time right now. That is and true. This was the comp I was talking about uh, right back in the intro when we were looking at the card nerfs. And I was saying how this kind of default comp with the uh, Poisonous Minion Selfless Hero Baron was just too easy to achieve previously, um, to the point where a lot of players are just calling it the scam comp. And now here we are. This is the first time we've really seen it. Golden selfless hero with a whole bunch of poisonous Let's minions. It really doesn't matter how small top. the stats are here. I actually like the um, the boat 
over the Nar here. I, I don't think the Nar is going to be able to scale as fast as you want in this current state where the boat can give you a little bit extra scaling. And also, if you get if the boat can hit perfectly, you can you can scam people just hitting them for 30 plus damage if uh, if it's the last thing to die. So I, I think uh, I personally would have picked up the boat here and, and used that to uh, to open up some potential. But we'll see how this turns out for him. The poisons are doing a lot of work here. Yes, they are. The one thing this is weak to is generally like death rattle type stuff. So the big hope here for the Millhouse would have been the genies, like really dropping something that could get him some value. Um, but if you don't have death rattles on your board, if you're just straight up stats, you are basically going to concede to this comp that Fritterus is yeah, running right I, now. I actually think Fritterus could have one shot the Millhouse if he picked up the uh, the boat instead of the the mm, Nar. I actually think he, there was a high chance that the Nar that the boat would have died last filling the board with pirates and and just taking out the opponent there so it's kind a really of good a, point kind of interesting uh the decision making it's kind of a small thing that you don't really think about but it actually could have changed the game dramatically if you took out that uh, that uh millhouse looks to be in the lead right now uh excluding the shenanigans from uh this poison board if everyone else would probably lose against the millhouse so uh that was a good opportunity to just uh, knock someone that's looking very favorable to win the, the lobby. Yeah, that's a really great point. But from Fritteris' perspective there, like, how was he trying to scale from that point? Like, is he just waiting to try and just have a comp appear? Like, how do you really build on the platform? I, I, I think he, he actually has his comp almost completed. Okay. Uh, he just needs more poisons. <laughs> like, just need more poisons, maybe more selfless. That's okay. why I like the boat, because you can just... You can just End the game with that comp right there. Just put the boat in there. I have the golden selfless for three poisons and then the boat to scam. Like, I, you didn't have to do anything else really realistically from that point on. But uh, he, he was looking for more skilling options and that's why he took the, uh, the gar no, gar instead. So it looks like uh, Fishu has been uh, bouncing his Amalgadons this game. He's hit a golden Amalgadon now, which is massive alongside that brand. But now he is cashing out of the brand already. Um, I actually think the golden amalgadon might have been a bait. I think it would have been better for him to just have two amalgadons and have them both have divine shield poison. Now, if you look at his board now, you can see he doesn't really have anything. This is one of the the issues of Jandis. Uh, prefer uh, before with Pergos. Now that he's doing with the amalgadons. Well, you have one really good minion. Oh, this is a fantastic minion. However, it's weak to poison, right? If the minion yep. dies, well, now you have nothing. He he has the same thing where he has one really good Amalgadon. However, if it dies, he, his the rest of his board will not stack up to any other minion uh, that he has. So it, it 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 looks like he had a two Amalgadons, found the third one, just went for it, ended up making his board a little bit weaker in, in the in the process. Yep, completely agree. He needed at least like 30 more health on that Amalgadon to be able to get the both the value trades on the yeah. guard there with the way that that fight was laid out. So he was a, yeah. a long way off getting that done and now Fishu yeah. is absolutely Even with 30 dead. more health, it probably still wouldn't have been enough as well because the Millhouse has... All of his minions are pretty powerful where yeah. he only has that one. And even if he was able to take out the Nars, the other minions would clean up for him. Yep, fair enough. And so XQN here on the patchwork has made it to the late game situation, which you do expect from patchwork. They can generally tank things out. And it's kind of funny that you were talking about how strong patchwork was in the early light fang meta. And now here we have, I believe, our first light fang of the day actually the being uh, picked up from XQN. He's which playing is, one of my favorite comps. Uh, really? The taunt comp where you taunt everything <laughs> okay. and just buff him up that way. Yes. He has a decent menagerie for the Light Fang as well. The fact he has two Divine Shields. Obviously, Light Fang is far better at buffing attack right now than it is for health than it was in its original form. So just having the Divine Shields available is a pretty big. But yeah. from what we've seen from the rest of the lobby, he is a long way behind Millhouse's power level. Yeah, yeah he's really going to find out soon enough that you're really going to need some poisons to be able to compete with the players in, in this lobby. Yeah. Uh, so, unfortunate for him, it's not going to be enough. But let's take a look at the Nosdormu going for a Caligo. I mean, we haven't seen Caligo uh, uh, since a couple couple lobbies ago. So it's nice since, to see him. 
since the last time we looked at Silver Name. Like, he, he's, just, he's just literally <laughs> got Galagos every single game. That's that's true. Silver Name's a, a big uh, Galagos aficionado, just forcing yes. it every time. I really didn't think he would force it this game too, but uh, seems to have a game plan. So honestly, to me, Collins, this lobby looks like it's going to come down to the Millhouse Giant Elementals versus the Scam Comp from Frifterous. Yeah, that, like, that sounds correct to me. What what can Milhouse, what can Rogo do as Millhouse to counteract all of those poisons on the other side? Uh, he can get he can a he can get a ghoul. I think that would be the biggest uh, answer. Uh, maybe even two ghouls, just to guarantee that um, you pop the divine shields and maybe even free kill the one one poison as well, right? Because you know that he has the one one poisons, maybe even two. If you get two ghouls, uh, you're almost guaranteed to uh, clean out the the poison and maybe even free kill one of the poisons. Clean out the divine shield, maybe free kill one of the poisons. All right, makes sense to me. Um, but as we predicted, XQN got absolutely annihilated by Rogue. I mean, this comp is nuts. Yep. <laughs> From the mill house here. And down to a top three, which is Silvername, who we saw on the early stages of a Caligos build, Fritterus on that Scam Poison build, and then Rogo on this enormous Millhouse Elementals board. Better hire a recruit while you can. I'm really wondering how for? um how uh, I I'm worried for the uh Kalthas. I, I think he he has to be a little bit scared just because if any of those elementals live, they will clean up everything on the board. So you have to kill mm. all of those minions and make sure nothing stays alive. So he, he's got a harder road ahead of him than uh, than you, it seems, even though the scam can do some work. So now for, for Rogo, what, at what point is it even worth like getting more stats? Like, don't you just always win on stats at this point anyway? Yes. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't you be more worried about tech cards at this point? Yeah, he, he should be looking for... Um, I mean, sometimes you can't help it with, uh, with Millhouse, right? You're just like, I'll just mm. buy them. It, it, they technically cost one gold if you buy them and sell them. So it's kind of hard to resist the urge of buying all the elementals you see. But technically, right now, he just needs to find a triple for the selfless and a uh, Baron. And if he can find those uh, two pieces, I think he's, he's pretty much uh, locked it up. He can also find another Amalcadon and replace yeah. it. So he picked up a refreshing anomaly that turn and a elemental, which obviously are both free. There's no reason mm. not to buy and sell those because you get the two gold uh, back both from them both in okay, unique ways. Okay. I was a little surprised he was considering uh, buffing the rag because the rag is actually a unit you, know, you might be selling uh, yes, I agree. immediately. So uh, it was a little weird for me to see him considering buffing that little rag there. He gets his, I believe, his first look at Silver Name's board in a long while and should yes, be and, very and happy. He's, the only thing is. Millhouse has to do is look. Does he have a poison? No. Okay, I win. Like yes, that's the exactly. only <laughs> that's the only decision or decision making you have to make there. Do you have a poison? No, I win. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Silvername looking suitably impressed with the board state that his opponent has made here. Very nicely done. Yeah, he's like, well, I had no chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's one of those games where Silvername has got third, and the reason that he's got third is that he avoided playing Rogo as Millhouse for the longest. Like, that's really the only reason he's ended up here, right? That's true. I, I do think... Um, but you can really see the difference uh, if Fritters bought that that key pi uh, yeah. the key boat. Like, yep. Rogo could have died already, and that would have changed the whole lobby immediately, so... Uh, we'll see if Fritters can salvage it. Oh, he got the triple though, so that's triple unfortunate. On, yeah, triple on Selfless Hero is absolutely insane for Rogo here. Yeah, whatever. Pick the little rag. Doesn't really matter. I, I'm really interested to. I, I want to wait until time runs out to see uh, uh, what Fritters has done here, but I. I really think he's got a high road ahead of him with uh, triple on the selfless as well. Yeah, completely agree. Rogo's even dropping the mirrors onto here. Not sure what that was necessarily looking for, but I guess he is just doing the efficient thing. It's free in that position, so there's yeah. no real reason not to. Yeah, he's got he's got 13 seconds. He can pull it off. He's he got he's it. got the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no issue. You never you rope out. out here. What are you worried yeah. about? He ran out of time. <laughs> he ran out of time. Yeah. <laughs> It's not the strongest, but it'll fight hard. 
Yeah. Ending what could be the final fight with a free roll and three gold left in his hand as well. Like, his potential to get stronger there was very high still. Ooh, okay, okay. He's, this is a really good board from Fritters as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if he can uh, pull it off. Yep, there's definitely potential here. That, that The fact that the only real oh, remaining... Both of the Nars got killed. That's huge. It's huge. Yep, I think... Fritris has this one locked up from this position, I believe. Uh, maybe no, the, no, um, the, the 32 attacks yeah, now. Yeah, oh yeah, no, yeah. that's so bad. Because it's golden too, so he yep. gets two minions. Yep. Yeah. This is what I was scared of here. Yeah, absolutely. I thought the 32-32 uh, the uh, little oh, rag it's on not Fritris's enough. side oh. was going to get more work done. But it's going to be Rogojin getting over the line here. 22 damage. Uh, knocking Fritrus out of this one in second place, but at least for fans of Sho and Fritrus, that is one of the best results that they have had so far. Another fairly disappointing uh, performance from Sho, but at least Fritrus getting some points on the board for his team, Collins. Yeah, it's nice to see. I, I was really rooting for Fritters there. I really wanted to see that scam comp do some more scamming, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the issue with that uh, decision is that that. If one of those elementals survived, they will uh, run through the rest of those minions, and that's what we saw. Uh, the the gen, the genie was too strong and just uh, took out everything else that remaining on the board. Yeah, it's funny how that comp has now like lived long enough to become the hero, right? Because I think we were all kind of frustrated <laughs> with it for the last like week or two, and now suddenly it's the underdog comp, and we're rooting for it against the giant elementals. But yeah, I'm right there with you. I did really want to see a, a big performance there from Fritris because if he'd have picked up a first place, uh, maybe that would have put uh, a lot more hope in the minds of himself and Show uh, going in to our last two lobbies of the day. Because you can see here they are still a full ten points behind that crucial second place that they need they are looking very cast off at the bottom right now yeah it, it's going to be extremely difficult for them they have to they they need they needed to get first and second of this lobby as well so it's going to be extremely difficult but for the other remaining three teams it's looking a lot more hopeful both everyone can make it in uh dumbed and silver name are really look, looking the lead they have a good buffer but it's not guaranteed right if they if they slack off in these last two lobbies they could definitely fall out of favor because the others are right on their neck yeah a reminder the goal here is top two if you finish in the top two positions you do go through to sunday where we play off between the uh the, the four teams that finish top two both today and tomorrow so that sets us up very nicely going into our last two lobbies of the day but collins i believe that is you done for the day at this point so how have you enjoyed your your first day of uh of uh, it Boston? was really fun uh i definitely enjoyed it it's like it's nice to see good competitive backgrounds and being able to cast and see uh oh are they actually messing up here or not uh, a lot of yeah. good plays though and uh i hope to see you for the next uh next two next two days of gameplay all right well we have two more lobbies to decide who is going to go through from sunday gia <laughs> will be uh coming back to join me after the break do not go anywhere guys you don't want to miss the conclusion of today's action
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the last two lobbies of the Hearthstone Battlegrounds EMEA Cup. We've already seen tons of action, and so far, the team that we pegged as the ones to watch out for and the most confident team have been pulling ahead. Thoughtle, any big surprises so far? Well, you know, you said that, but the ones that both myself and Collins picked out are unfortunately mm -hmm. the team currently in last place. So I, I have to call that out as my big surprise. I was expecting a lot more from uh, Fritteris and Show coming into this. Um, I, without having run all the numbers in the three-minute break that we had, I think they still have an outside chance of qualifying, but it will need to be something in the region of a first, second place in both of these uh, remaining lobbies now. That's right. I did take the last two lobbies as a bit of a break, grab some food and check out what was happening. And lo and behold, it was Silver Name with Caligos again. <laughs> yep. It just seems like he just always has a thing, whether it's in Constructed and just jamming Highlander Mage every week for an entire season. And now here in Battlegrounds, just always making sure to have the dragon. So we'll find out if that's still possible when we get word on the bans. But we do, of course, have to focus on Show and Fritteris because, like you said, they are the underdogs right now. They have to catch up Ooh. and show whether Rafam already looks like a good start. But Malagos is an interesting one. It is. Certainly would suggest that no top tier heroes were being offered here because Malagos is one of those mid tier picks that you're never ecstatic to pick up. Uh, some players do favor it as a strong option amongst the mid tier heroes. Um, others don't like it at all, but certainly with everything on the line, I think Fritris would have been looking for something a little bit stronger here. I did catch out of the corner of my eye. It is Silver Name with the Maev again. Probably the strongest oh, hero in the no. lobby in my opinion. Uh, but we do have an Omu as well, which makes for some pretty interesting early game curves. For Fritterus, he did start off with the Malagos hero power and something he hadn't bought to try and see if he could get any special synergy there. But for Silver Name, it appears that he has spent the first gold on a roll and now has found a pretty good minion to hero power. Yeah, which would suggest to me, like generally my rule for my Ev is if there is no top tier minion in the three gold shop, I will look to hero power something. By which I mean like if you could just buy like a 2-3 just because it's a 2-3, I think that's fine sometimes. But generally I'll be looking to hero power on turn one. So I'd imagine Silvername was faced with a pretty mediocre opening shop and then just looked to roll to find something a bit more premium to hero power. For you. Yep, top tier meaning the two threes or the tokens. For Silver Name, I'm curious if he has that rule about 2-3s as well, because we did see him hero power on a 1-3 before, mm -hmm. and not by necessarily, but that was for a pair. Here again, there's a decision about Murloc, and the order of it, to me, feels like you start off with the Tide Hunter and hero power the Rock Pool. Um, that's the way to get the maximal buffs on things, but maybe not the best immediate stuff. Yeah, and flipping positioning here because he is going to be up against the Rafam. Uh, generally, it isn't going to matter at this point because the Rafam will almost always have more minions than you anyway, so they're going to have first attack and dictate which of the minions are trades. But it's just good practice to end up doing so anyway. Did get confirmation that dragons are indeed banned away this lobby. So this is the lobby we've been waiting for, Saddle. All day we've been like, oh, dragons are winning all the time. How is it going to shake out when they're not available? Mechs also nice removed from the equation, so that's probably one of the middling tribes that are not um, able to be played right now. I am seeing a lobby with no dragons and with beasts and murlocs both available. Maximum tokens available, Gia. That's all I'm seeing. I got baited into it once before when I think we had the uh, the bands wrong on the screen, but this is the dream Khadgar lobby if anyone is offered those early tier 3 Khadgars. I can't wait, but we'll see. Personally, I'm more of a do it with golden brands instead of Khadgar because mm. it's a little bit less complicated, but I can only do that when I'm Reno because I never get I was golden say, brand. I'm sorry. How often do you just get a golden brand? What world do you live in, Gio? Oh my goodness. I just don't have the APM to do it in other, any other method. Okay. But we are going to see Sho now picking up another Murloc Tide Hunter, which means he has tokens for days. And that is one of the benefits you get from Rafam giving you a lot of consistency oh, and the potential to triple, like Cho is able to do right now. But maybe he's going to hold on to that for a little bit longer and try and power spike. Yeah, I actually kind of like the greed here, honestly. Like, what he can do is triple this token and then not play the token this turn and just mm -hmm. hold on to it for the, for the sake of a 2-2 and a 3-drop on his board. But um, I respect the opportunity still. Like, Cho has been on a... 
a losing streak up until this point, so just playing out his curve here, especially if you told me I was going to hit a Felfin Navigator off the uh, the triple, I would absolutely have taken the uh, the three-drop discover there. It's true. I tend to think that when you have this type of Murloc start, you can either greet it out and uh, triple going into a five-drop, like you were mentioning, or just take the three-drop, because there's some pretty good outcomes with either the Felfin Navigator or the Cold Lights here with a Murloc start. And I think the additional stats are a big deal here to make sure he doesn't take too much damage from Yogg, which definitely is a hero you can expect to put a lot of stats on their early minions. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the way this fight is going to pan out, Sho will be very pleased with his decision because he is now going to tie this fight, which he probably would have lost if he greeted in. He actually got a decent steal as well with the Overseer. He does have uh, an Imprisoner on his board to be able to receive that buff. So very successful round overall for Sho. Wow, and for Rogojin, another triple also available. But how are we going to approach this? Because normally a Shinvala, if you level here, you have to sell one more to buy. And the thing he wants to sell is the thing that he has to triple. Yes. There's also the ludicrously greedy line that you could approach this from, where you actually buy both Selementals but don't sell them. So you look for the double triple. Because at that point, if you find Ooh. another <laughs> Selemental, uh, you can triple the Selemental and then sell the golden Selemental, which gives you two water droplets, which then triples your water droplet. So Rogo could actually try and greed this uh, water droplet triple that he already has in order to uh, roll down for a third um, Selemental itself. That is a very interesting line. All I was seeing there is that I wish I were Shambhala right now yes. <laughs> instead oh, of Omu. <laughs> oh, where's my Shambhala game, Gia? I came here for two things, Khadgar games and Shambhala games, and I've got neither. We do have two more days, and this could still be a Khadgar game. Hold on, mm -hmm. hope. Mm -hmm. but we do have Malagos facing off against Omu here. The positioning was a bit interesting. I tend to just make a blanket rule that the fiendish servants would go first, but I am a lower level player. What do you think about the uh, fiendish somewhere in the middle? I actually extremely rarely put fiendish servant first. I, I do like it a lot more somewhere in the middle because there's some minions that you'll almost always get zero benefit from buffing with a fiendish servant. Um, so by having the positioning that you have, he can already probably take one value trade with the 7-5, and then from that point try and add attack to some of his smaller minions further down the line after that trade has already happened. So I kind of like the positioning that Fritris went for that round. And he does get to triple the minion in question into a premium 5 drop, Brand Bronzebeard. Um, I used to be a Lightfang gamer as well when Collins mentioned that Lightfang back in the days of patchwork being really strong. Uh, was the meta that was also the one that I lived for just AFK as soon as you get your <laughs> light fangs with a bunch of different minions on board but nowadays it definitely feels like Bran is just faster and more flexible yeah I do look back kind of fondly on that early meta game as well where we all thought we'd like figured battlegrounds out it's like yeah you just triple into a five drop and get light fang that's how you play that's just all you have to do mm. it's like the game has come so far since those days okay. it's insane. Given that there's so few minions on board, I'm not surprised to see the Fiendish uh, go first now and also has that potential of buffing either the uh, Selfless Hero or the Brand by that point, both of which are good targets because otherwise they didn't have enough attack to really trade down anything. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. And does get the eventual snipe on the War Leader, but if Frideris had been able to get there early, that could have been the big difference between winning and losing this fight. But however, both Frideris and Sho are in very good positions this game. Frideris has plenty of health and a brand to his name, uh, whereas Sho is just very, very strong for this period of the game with a lot of potential scaling with that double crowd favorite. But no real comp to build into yet, apart from the potential of that Murlox, which now having picked up a Toxfin, this is actually a pretty good position again, for sure. It's true. Um, I think he has the time to, as Collins put it, like organically get a brand, just spend all the gold and get to five and search for it that way. But he also has the flexibility to maybe find it through the pairs because he has those two crowd favorites and the two Murlocs. And There's... speaking of another pair gamer, XQN as well. There's an even better option that you haven't even covered yet, Gia, because his partner has a brand and he is Rafal. Oh. So as soon as they queue into each other, that means he also has a brand. They could potentially engineer a situation where Sho's first attack would kill nothing, and Fritteris' first attack suicides the brand into one of his minions, which would guarantee giving a brand over to the Rafam Hero Power. That is a really good spot. And maybe 
Um, Sho didn't know it quite so early when he went for that triple, but he'll be very happy that he committed to Murloc mm -hmm. so early. For XQN though, definitely looking quite fine this turn as well. Again, it looks like all about whether the demon can get a snipe on the war leader. But now that's no longer an option for this Divine Shield hit. It's not a big deal for the Yogg player to be taking a small loss here. Yeah, agreed. It uh, looks like um, the Yogg took, uh, Delicious on the Yogg took a big push just to find himself the, the brand of his own. So I think he was probably expecting to take a loss nice that fight and he will be there. very comfortable with his pressure. situation. Honestly, it feels inefficient to take a war leader, I was going to say, when you were um, already on a certain tavern and just buying a tier 2 minion, but you immediately picked up a triple there. You're going to be looking for a brand of his own. But Sho now has a chance, because he's hit the triple, to find brand as well, even before he's into his team. And he's actually going to blow straight past it and go for the 6 here, which I Ooh. do like. He hits the Amalgadon. The, uh, the benefit of doing it this way is you discover a 6, which, you know, in a vacuum is potentially more powerful, gives you more immediate power, and then you also are just on Tavern 5, so you now have the ability to just roll into that brand naturally on the following turns. But I also wonder how much of this decision is influenced by what I was talking about before, where he knows as long as he's alive and his partner is alive, eventually he can get his brand, as long as they just queue into each other at some point. Ludilicious did pick up the brand for himself, and he now has Burgurgle with the Murloc. So it's already like a Murloc lobby. I also wanted to note that for show, he did get the poison on the Malgadon, but not Divine Shield, which is a big deal because mechs are banned from yes. his lobby, so he can't just slap an Anoyo module on it. Such a big turn here for Bootylicious. He got really huge this turn and really wants to attack first here and does. That's a crucial clean attack over on the uh, Ginny. It does drop a Gar, though. Probably the MVP of the tournament so far, just based on today. Yet again, in the uh, previous two lobbies we just had, we saw giant Gars just absolutely farming. Yeah, but maybe in a Murloc infested lobby, it, might, mm -hmm. it won't quite get so much work done with all the poisonous running around. Yep. I also really love the positioning from Bootylicious, putting the most expensive Murlocs and Bran far right, just trying to make sure he gets the most damage in where he can. Ooh, that's Silver Name dead on my Ev. And now yeah, we come over to the victory spot, but don't take it too hard. There are eight players. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the victory, the uh, consolation speech from Bob at the end there, I'm sure, was uh, doing nothing to uh, quell Silvernames sadness. Saddle, what else were we expecting with Dragon's Band? Silvernames just doesn't have his Caligon. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. He's completely able to go for different comps, just didn't quite work out this time, which means partner Good Dummit will have additional pressure on him now to maintain their lead on the rest of the field. Um, he does have an Amalgadon of his own, which can get Yo. quite a few adapts because he's rocking this Menagerie build. Second Genie is huge. Yeah, Second Genie is huge. Uh, so Dummit gets out of the uh, Poisonous. Of course, that doesn't have a minion type attached to it, so is not going to help out with these Amalgadon buffs, and he'll be looking to replace that Poisonous uh, with the Poisonous roll on the Amalgadon here, ideally. Uh, even if he doesn't hit Poisonous, as Gia was just saying a minute ago, it's more important, arguably, to hit Divine Shield in this lobby because you can pick up the Poisonous manually uh, with Murlocs available, but can't pick up the Divine Shield with Mech's ban. Just an interesting way to deal with this board space because, honestly, you want to get all of the value off of the light time, but you can see there, it was essentially floating two gold, which he spent on yeah. two more rolls yeah. just to make sure he could get all of the buffs in immediately. <laughs> <laughs> what is this board? Golden Unstable Ghoul Baron Rivendare? That's that's <laughs> your team? Okay, alright, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure what that's trying to accomplish. I'd be very into it if there were mechs in the lobby and maybe try to snipe off Divine Shields. But that seems like the anti-scam comp. Yeah, no, that's very true, actually. That is very true. That is one way to blow up a board of 1-1 Poisonous, for sure, no matter how many Divine Shields they have. Tons of damage coming in because two six drop um, elemental survive, and that means little rag now for the Nosdormu player. Ooh, 
Fishu does have a ton of dance potential here in his hand with the uh, Selemental and the Mug already. And he has a Hydra frozen in the shop. Okay, suddenly things are starting to make more sense. Combination of Battlemaster and Hydra in the shop is very nice here. He can do the Splash Dance on the Battlemaster. And then I would imagine just go all in on the Hydra from that point. Yep, I like this line. I am learning so many yeah, new jargon minion. flash dance. <laughs> I, I just want to call that the secondary minion whenever I do the Daryl dancing, but I do prefer the term flash dance. That sounds very, very cool. Coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> splash dance. It definitely feels like the glory days of Daryl are mostly over, but Fishu is making it work in the same way that you can kind of take advantage of Edwin. Yo. Just trying to all in on a few is a big deal. What's happening here? There must be something scammy we can do with Parrot, Golden, Ghoul, and Baron, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> could, but it would involve selling off the Infested Wolf to guarantee that you want the Ghoul scams, but yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. you really want the Ghoul scams. Yeah. All right, you're right, you're right. Tournament mode, Gia. Tournament mode. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying to have too much fun. I apologize. There's way too much on the line right here. Okay, the Hydra is not going to be able to get a hit on the middle of the comp, despite the Ghoul and Baron's best efforts, which means that the Poison minion will remain intact. Yeah, there's still a chance to snipe it like that before it interacts with the Battlemaster, though, which is now huge because the Battlemaster can contest almost the rest of this board single-handedly now. This is going to be a very clean win for Fishu, and it's going to be a huge hit for Show. He's dead! It's That's lethal. 17! Oh, no! Oh no, a disaster! Show didn't get the get your um teammate uh grand dream, even though that would have been really, really cool to see. And that means there's only one more Murloc player remaining in the lobby and already has even more Murlocs in the pool since Sho has been eliminated. And it also means now Fritterus and Sho out again in bottom four, seventh and sixth place respectively. And I think now, Gia, that might just be their chances of making it to top two and making it through to Sunday have uh, been flushed away at this point. Really tough because this is only the seventh lobby and they still have to play out through another one. But mm -hmm. we will see if they can maybe just tie it or just get that little bit closer and close the gap out. For XQN here, a bit painful to not find the triples. I do think he was holding on to some of these pairs for a bit longer, but I completely agree that it's more important to just utilize the Nomi while you can. Yeah, it does feel like the way this lobby was going, that he was going to end up bringing a Gar to a Murloc fight, which was not going to be a good idea. But actually, the Murloc players have just been dying one by one. So maybe there is the opportunity to still get some big value out of this giant minion. The issue, though, if you're facing down a Daryl, it's kind of um, expected that they would have either a big cleave or a big divine shield minion or mm -hmm. both. So positioning, uh, having not poison first, expecting a divine shield uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially in this lobby with mechs banned, right? Like the chances of a divine shield taunt specifically are so much smaller when mechs aren't in the lobby because you would have to have like Argus up a divine shield minion specifically, as opposed to just having like bought a giant annoyer module and smacked it on one of your minions. So I like leading with the, the big attacks still. Oh, that last trade, one and three there for the Daryl to deal lethal, but it did end up tying because he cleaned up the little tokens before trading into the Hydra. Yo, Tavern Tempest for the Omu off of the Golden Genie at this point. And the way these trades are going to go down, this is now a huge attack on this Gar, and he finds it! Gets the VT to, uh, to lock down the tie. Yeah, Omu definitely has some potential to keep scaling. It feels like a lot of players have just picked up some Murlocs here and there, but it's Bootylicious that is really committed to more Murlocs on the board. He's looking mm -hmm. for more Toxpins to slap on the Toxpin he already has, strangely enough. I've never Toxpinned a Toxpin. You've never Toxpinned a Toxpin? Oh, Gia, you haven't lived. You like you, <laughs> you, you Toxpin the Toxpin and then you Golden the Toxpin to pick them up and then Toxpin something else. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Oh, that does sound like a pandemic in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. Fin. Cycling the gas coiler. Yeah, not particularly useful here. Malgadon. Mm-hmm. Second Amalgadon, second Felfin as well. 
Did he not want to sell the Felfin back into the shop before he rolled? He ended up hitting another one anyway, so it absolutely did not end up mattering, but I assume it was optimal to do that first in that position. Yeah, I would guess as well. The only reason for holding onto it is if you want that as a potential toxic target. Mm. Here we go. Stats for days. Did he fit in the hero power? Yep. Just to make sure you have the most gold available for the next turn. I'm not sure if the positioning is where he wanted to be exactly. No, me either. I'm not sure if he really had time to execute everything he wanted to do that turn either, because he still had plenty of gold left to uh, to spend and cycle, and he has this Felfin in hand. There is an argument to say he's deliberately holding onto this Felfin for triple potential. He doesn't just want to necessarily just straight up play it and sell it, thinking he was strong enough to take this fight down. But certainly, I think the pressure of the rope was felt there towards the end of that turn. It was one of those troll turns I was talking about earlier, right, where you get to the end of the rope and then suddenly the Discover Murloc appears and you suddenly have to do like nine or ten things at the very very end of your turn yeah that really means it's a big advantage for battlegrounds players who are able to make snap decisions even if it feels like you have a lot of time later on if you can go by rote almost on these simple decisions it saves you time for when you get to a more unusual situation but oh my goodness three players knocked out yo straight somebody down lost to a ghost <laughs> straight down to the one-on-one -on -one between uh, Butalicious and Rogojin on the Omu now. Which means, I believe it was the Daryl, possibly, that lost to the Ghost in that position. The Fishu on Daryl with that bizarre Baron Rivendare comp just did not end up getting the job done. Well, uh, that is unfortunate to see because at least it could have removed all of the Divine Shields from these Murlocs before dying. Yeah. But we do end up with a one-on-one, -on -one, as what you were saying. I'm not actually sure what 6-drop he wants at this point, because he certainly doesn't want to triple the Amalgadon. My ex, no? Take a poison? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, Bidalicious's line did pay off from the previous turn. Again, I don't necessarily think it was, like, 100% considered, because he was roping. But the decision, certainly, to hold on to the Felfin Navigator pair has paid off pretty big for him here. And he is still fishing for another Toxfin to slap on the second Amalgadon. Doesn't find it, but picks up a Ghoul. Um, I like it in the second position. Like uh, A newer player might think that, oh, both Divine Let's Shields first before the Ghoul, but it's highly unlikely that you have the time for all of that to go off. So yes. you want the Ghoul um, second, because after your first Divine Shield goes off, then you can try and get the things on all of your opponent's shields. That's wow. insane! Death Rattle ordering! Goes off first, that ghoul does yeah. actually get some work done. It does mean this selfless hero is going to proc though and get multiple Divine Shield buffs again. And but, Bootalicious is my Exner. It value trade, meaning that it is still there as a poisonous minion. And actually, Bootalicious is going to win this one quite comfortably with multiple huge minions still remaining. And the tokens are such a big deal as well to deal the damage at the very end. Mm -hmm. Back in the days when Gentle Megasaur was still in the pool, you wanted the Holy Trinity of Divine Shield, Poison, and Death Rattle. It's not quite lethal damage, but it's also just a big deal that it is the Macaw and not Baron, because this does have a small failure rate of whether you trigger the Death Rattle of the Selfless on itself, and then suddenly you might not get the actual Death Rattle on the Selfless. So, Rogo has to adjust here. He should realize that his Gar is almost completely pointless at this point, because he is dealing with poisoned Murlocs on the other side. Um, so if he can find a Baron or a, just another Poisonous Minion to, to sub in, which he does already have with the Deadly Spore, um, he can use that to fall back on and basically roll away all of his gold looking for more tech cards, which is exactly what he ends up doing. I think he's played this turn correctly. Uh, it's just unfortunate not to find anything. Yeah, really good turn of looking for all his outs. But honestly, even if he did hit the Baron, I don't think it was looking all that good for him because he didn't have an answer to the tokens that spawn off of the Amalgadon on true. the other side either. Yeah. His own Amalgadon does not have the Death Rattle. Yeah, that is a really good point. It's a great shot though, and for Rogojin, it's a big deal that he ends up in the second spot because he's around that middle point where they still have contention to catch up to Silver Name and Good Dummit's team. Um, it's only Sho and Fritterus that have fallen too far behind now to catch up. 
So I like this Gambit from Rogo though. He's gonna try and use his own Wind Fury minion to snipe away the Unstable Ball before he sets up any of his Divine Shields. Um, and then try and get maximum value out of his board that way. Um, but obviously the downside of that is what you just saw, where he exposes his back line for multiple attacks before he actually starts getting the Divine Shields up. But actually, this has worked out about as perfectly as it could have done. But as Gia was mentioning in the previous shop phase, the uh, the tokens of the Amalgadon are just going to get too much work done. Actually, I though, the tokens... I thought the tokens would make all the difference here, but that positioning was good enough to keep holding on. The sad thing for Rogozhin is how does this even get better? It's barren or bust at this point, right? It does look that way, yeah. Hmm. There's also, like you were saying, Wind Fury to try and snipe the ghoul. You could think about Zap for that purpose, but it's pretty much the same as the Amalgadon. It is, point. yeah, basically the same. Hit. The other option is just to look for more minions that summon tokens. Like, I actually think Void Lord is surprisingly strong in these late-game situations if you have multiple taunts on your board, um, just because the 1-3 summoning are kind of similar to what we're seeing from the Amalgadon tokens on the other side. There are a few things to consider, for sure. Unstable ghoul now? Like, the, <laughs> the counter ghoul? Oh... Uh how do you engineer this so that it kills off their tokens before your divine shields go up? I don't think there's any way to guarantee it, but the no. question here is, can you imagine a situation where it actually plays out in the order you want and estimate how likely that is? I would just give up and look for Baron, and <laughs> Rokujin comes to the same conclusion. Okay. Oh, interesting, he sold the power. I was wondering like, if he could lose the guard. I think he'd probably need Argus to lose the guard, though, so he could at least have some sort of taunt protection. And then like, mm -hmm. maybe play the selfless really late in his comp, so the parrot would divine shield everything once, and then you try and high roll with the selfless hero divine shielding everything again if you got a good attack order. Um, but he actually ends up just straight up swapping the, uh, the parrot for the Baron. Well, it's a good point you bring up because I was thinking at first that uh, Baron with Parrot and Selfless Hero has that failure rate where you trigger the Divine Shield on the Selfless itself. But maybe he needed the actual high roll of the first Selfless going on all the Poison minions and then the second Poison going on and refreshing their Divine Shield. Wow! Okay, that's really great sequencing for Rogo because the, uh, the tokens are now out in a position where they absolutely don't matter at all. And this is going to be a big win for Rogo. That's going to be, what, 13 damage going through at this point? So now both players are just one hit away from victory. This is uh, the closest top two that we've seen in any of our lobbies so far, Gia. Insane, but the thing is, I also just don't know how it gets better unless he can triple the Baron mm. at this point. We take a look at Bootylicious's perspective now. It wasn't a big deal that the Mayaxna didn't survive instead of War Leader because he would have still ended within a break point of dying to one hit. Yep. Bootylicious now does have another ghoul in his hand, which makes sense as to why he felt comfortable in getting out of it on the previous turn because he can now get back into it if he needs to. And I think based on the way that last fight went, he might still feel like the Unstable Ghoul is something that is beneficial to him. Although the way that the board is set up right now with the Selfless Hero and with the Amalgadon attacking first, the Ghoul actually doesn't do that much for Bootylicious right now. True, and he also probably didn't want to give up the Deadly Spore if he was going for that. But now he hits the Toxfin, which he was looking for for any of these two remaining Murlocs. That I guess it has more value going on the Divine Shield minion. So difficult to come up with the ideal positioning and just think of what the ideal minion is for situations like this and mm -hmm. I would pay good money to see the stats on either side for the win percentages and how they change <laughs> um, between board to board. <laughs> Yeah, I do think there were a lot of opportunities on both sides just to be able to, you know, pick up sticky minions, Divine Shield, like 1-1 Divine Shield, Taunt, and other token-based minions that can potentially just mess with some Divine Shields, um, especially from Budalicious's side, because um, Rogo has this board where the Divine Shields are going to appear at weird points, right, with the, you see them going off right now, but I think knowing that you have the Unstable Ghoul, the way that the board was lined up, this should work out pretty well, but there's so much oh. value being found before the Divine Shields get dealt with. And now all the tokens the fight the outcome. dust as well. Yeah, the other taunt okay. messing with everything, oh. but he still does end up with one Amalgam with the Death Rattles, finally able to close out the game. That was too close for comfort, and the mind games with having ghouls on either sides get really, really deep. All I want to know is 
whether that golden ghoul we saw in the mid game was an omen for this end game. I mean, apparently so. Yeah, that that without the Daryl dying, who ended up dying to the ghost with uh, Golden Ghoul and Baron Rivender, um, some of those ghouls might not even have been there in the late game for those players to pick up, right? Because Daryl just would have been hoarding them all with his uh, his Golden Ghoul for no reason. So certainly, I will thank the Daryl for dying there to give us that very <laughs> interesting late game scenario where we can see uh, ghouls teched in from both sides. But I think that was a it was a good lobby to kind of tick off the list for the day right because we hadn't seen that so far where we got to a top two and it was a real like back and forth with both players looking for the dream tech card in their their final roles on tavern six and i think that was a really uh, nice iteration of battlegrounds to be able to take a look at true and that does mean we end up with a straight tie now between the yellow and green team Budelicious's win is absolutely huge because now the yellow team has picked up a total of three first places Team Green's uh, consistency means that they're still tied and not far behind is Team Purple, just two points below. And really, it's only the white team that we can count out at this point. Yep. And again, crucial spots are top two because top two goes through to Sunday to uh, play out the playoffs day on Sunday. So uh, Rogo and the Fishu do have a little bit of work to do. They're going to need to outperform either green or yellow uh, by a margin of three points to get the uh, the clean victory here going into our final lobby. It does seem like we are uh, waving goodbye, unfortunately, uh, to the white team. Um, but there's still plenty to play for going into this final lobby now with only two spots on Sunday on the line. And I'm really glad that the last lobby played out the way it did in the finals because it goes to show you the difference that one point can make. If the positions were swapped around, we would have a clear leader here. And it could very well come down to a similar situation next lobby. And when it gets to those one and one points, your teammates, suddenly the information you've been getting all that game is not useful anymore. It comes down to your knowledge of battlegrounds, your experience, and what you think your opponent will be doing. The mind games can get very intense but we will see later on if Thoddle and I can get our long-held dream of a Cadgar game because it still hasn't happened. <laughs> it still hasn't, though. And I like generally, I think that was the the dream lobby for it. But I think you know these players are all in the mindset of like no one's going to force it, right? That's kind of like streamer mentality. If you're just going to force the Cadgar comp, it is powerful. It is genuinely a strong thing to do. Um, but you do have to be kind of handed it by Bob, right? Like Bob has to deal you the cards. He has to offer you that early Cadgar on like seven or eight gold as soon as you hit uh, Tavern three, and then you can try and build on it from there. Whereas if you aren't dealt that, then there's really nothing else you can do. And we've seen so many players just hitting early triples into big power spike cards. You know, early genies, early early Caligos, early mama bear on one occasion actually ended up carrying the game as well so um i think because we've seen so much of that players have just felt very comfortable just playing a, a pretty regular game plan so far it's true and you know honestly i haven't had that much time to play the patch like everybody else but when i was seeing um all of my ladder results get determined by how the genies were dropping i thought how can people actually get an edge here but just the fact that the lobbies have been so close and a lot of the players have been evening out their luck as as the games move on really goes to show that more experience can help and the top players are definitely proving that they deserve to be here uh we are gonna get some word on the next lobby very very soon um i'm still holding out hope for shanvala making an appearance because i do feel like the buff was very significant and i have to imagine it's been offered at least once by this point yeah, I think so too. I think, you know, I talked about this earlier where certain people will have certain pet heroes. And in that spot where we've seen like Malagos get played, Sky Captain Crag get played, um, certain people, when you, when you get into a certain tier of hero, it's kind of personal preference as to who's had success with certain things or, um, you know, who thinks they have kind of a unique strategy with a certain hero that other people aren't doing and they're actually a little bit stronger than other people expect. Like everyone has these pet heroes. And for me, that has been uh, Shambhala. In, in the recent patch, um, but obviously these players are having differing opinions so far as we see a Finley option coming out here Ooh. from Rogo in our crucial final lobby, but really nothing too nutty. This is just kind of those mid-tier tools that I was talking about before. Yeah, it's been a while since we've seen Finley, and I do think it was between the Malagos and the Crag hero power. We did see a Sky Captain Crag perform relatively well a couple lobbies ago, Sorry. and I do think that just having a guaranteed power spike versus um, trying to spike a little bit with Malagos in the early game and not really getting much use Don't out of the hero power in the late I game. Really I do like you. the Krag option better. Yeah, I do too. I'm a pretty big fan of Sky Captain Krag as well. Have a pretty high win rate with the hero. 
Um, but we do see Reno dipping back in again from Dummit. I think he was uh, weirdly absent for the first half of the day, but has started uh, popping up a little bit more in the second half. That's true. I think Reno has a lot of great targets to use on the hero power ever since the introduction of elementals. Um, or um, Rogojin here. Pretty easy hero power. There's not many different curves you can do with Krag. It's less of a curve and just picking the one turn when you go off. Yes. And previously, I was seeing a lot of people just do that going into their level 2 tier 5 because then you could immediately try and find a 5-star minion. So how do people hit these shops with Millhouse? I swear, <laughs> like, my results with Millhouse, I think Millhouse is the only hero where I'm below um, global there. average on, on win rate, like looking at my own personal stats. Like, I cannot ever get Millhouse to work for me. And I'm purely putting it down to the fact that I never see shops like this when I play this hero. <laughs> it really is perfect, right? Two tokens and the refreshing so that his um, Tavern Refresh is discounted by two effectively. That is the absolute dream. Mm -hmm. The is able to level at will. Yo, that is a pretty spicy looking elemental start here as well. Party rock, let's yeah. go! <laughs> So Fritteris um, has to decide whether or not he wants to commit to it, right? Because, you know, you could argue just buying the bomb here is very reasonable as just the straight-up strongest in a vacuum minion. But if he does want to start party rocking, then he's going to have to freeze here and start building. Yeah, the freeze does hurt as Millhouse, but she I think it would be too, a little too good to give up on the fact that the continuous buying and selling that you can get as Millhouse works mm -hmm. so well with the party rock combination. Ooh, Jandis Ow. with one of the low-key popping Jandis strats. This was something that you did also have to look out for, even when Pogos were back in the game. The uh, ability to bounce the Overseer on a Demon multiple times in the early game. Really, really strong stats early. Really After this turn Hello? from Millhouse, I'd like to see how the Jandis pops off, but oh my gosh, he's just handed another party elemental on hello. a silver platter. Gia, Hi, hello. What, what has Hi. happened here? Like, I was going to say the only downside of this freeze is that you really need a playable in that last spot that's going to appear mm -hmm. at the end of the turn because otherwise you don't really have a super strong triple buy. And then Fritras just hits the absolute nuts with the second party elemental. Fair enough. And he, yeah, and he does just take that last two gold to buy a minion and essentially hold it as a gold for later on, yep. which you definitely want to do as Millhouse. You never want to waste the refreshes. want to take a look at what Jandis is doing and seeing if they are actually going for the... Uh, Swapping back and forth on the Nathrism, and they absolutely have. The Fishu has a giant imprisoner for this stage of the game. Yeah, absolutely huge. This is, you know, when the previous Jandis meta, this is one of the best stalling tactics that you could find while you're looking for the Pogo. Um, obviously, now you have to get a little bit more creative with your Jandis strats uh, with Pogo removed from the pool. So uh, Fishu could just use this to scale all the way up, really, just level very aggressively from this point and just keep pumping stats. The fact that he also has the teacup means that he can, you know, use that as his swap minion of choice. Mm -hmm. Just needed one more tribe to get even more stats than he would off of the Nathrism Overseer. And there is his choice of pirate or mech to do that with. GR, I've played this game before. You mm. always, you always swap into the gold. It happens yep. every time. <laughs> Yeah, and there's no minion that you actually want the battle cry from in this shop, so there's no harm in swapping first because that can be an order mistake with Jandis sometimes. Yep. If, say, there's another teacup in the shop and oh, you come want on. the battle cry. I do think that's the second best outcome to swap it's into because um, mechs have more scaling potential than pirates if you're not playing any other pirates. Agreed. So yeah, Fishu and he does looking... just get the good demon buff as well. You don't want it on that's the Nathrism here. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, it looks like Fishu has the openings, at least, of a pretty strong Jandis game. But the downside right now is that after Pogos, I would say the second strongest Jandis strategy is Murlocs. Um, as something to do with your late game, and Murlocs are actually banned in this lobby, Let's so Fishu is going to find it somewhat top. difficult to find something to scale into here that's uh, game-winning from Jandis, um, but just the amount of early stats that he has means that he can level quite aggressively and just look for the power cards to, to build a comp from him the, uh, the normal way, I suppose. It might be a bit more difficult to transition, but who knows, even if we see uh, something like Grand Menagerie Drug, that can be a late game composition too mm -hmm. as Jandis. 
for now, he's going to take a loss to the Finley, which I believe hasn't really danced on anything. I think the buffs from this Sorolus came from playing Death Rattles, which is pretty impressive. I want to see what the Finley has... Oh, sorry, the uh, Daryl has been up to. Yeah, I would predict that his tier 2 shop, like he sold to, to double buy on 6, and that landed on the Sorolus, and then he's just played right. these, these two uh, Death Rattles from there to buff it up, if I had to guess. Um, but... He's setting up pretty well here. Honestly, a pretty powerful early game board with uh, this other Scallywag not only being buffed by South Sea Captain, but also continuing to buff the Sorolisk. He's uh, really, really strong for this stage of the game right now, honestly. That's right. It definitely feels like XQN's been getting good incidental dances where you're going to sell something anyway and you hope that the buffs land on something good mm -hmm. as opposed to the uh, deliberate dances where you Another isolate the minion satisfied. that you really want to get all of the buffs on. And that means that he has... Quite a lot of gold in store as well, which is always great as Daryl, because when you finally do hit the Divine Shield minion, that's when you go for the deliberate dancing. That's right. Uh, Dragon's banned, so no Divine Shield Dragon, but obviously mechs are the big one for Daryl for sure. And then is, there is, of course, Elementals as well, introducing that new Divine Shield into the pool for Daryl to dance on on Tavern 3. So XQN has a lot of big hits in these upcoming Taverns that he could set up a huge dance on. Facing off against Sho here, this looks like um, a lot of death rattles with the Sorolisk, but not really a brand quite yet to try and pay out. These are some pretty solid attacks so far from uh, Sho's Omu, though. Taking a lot of value trades. This wants to go right if you're an XQN fan, but he misses, and that's going to be a pretty big hit for him. Oh, the fact that the beast stays alive. Mm -hmm. That was the difference between a tie or a win, and the beast itself being the most expensive minion means that the Daryl will be taking a significant chunk of damage here. How's it going out there? Double rats? Huh. It used to be a good danceable minion, huh. but I don't know about now. Keep up the I do, like... When you're playing Daryl, I do like the idea of just some time around 9 or 10 gold just dancing on the best minion in the shop, just so you're strong for like one or two mm -hmm. turns, right? And then you can get greedy by rolling down other things. Right. It's definitely a valid strategy, given that XQN is in a position where if he just maintains his lead, their team can come out on top and you can go for the less greedy uh, Daryl strategy of just, as you said, dancing on the best, if mediocre, minion offered to you. But mm -hmm. looks like he is going for just stocking up here freezing the rat and i think a lot of the decision to freeze the rat comes from the fact that he has another rat in hand so he can hold on to the second one as triple potential Ooh. dumb it did the next closest thing to a cadgar pop off with tokens Keep which is momentum, mama bear friend. Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Of course, they do go very nicely together. It's one of the kind of transitional phases of the Cadgar strat, where you just get giant tabby cats by uh, discovering a mama bear off your first uh, triple with the Cadgar. That was the immediate golden minion for Reno. A lot of the time with Reno, um, the first minion that gives you a good direction, even if it's not necessarily a late game minion, is yes. the one that you want to golden up because he generally takes too much damage in the early game. Like you can see, he still has the lowest health out of everyone in the lobby, but definitely has some potential to keep getting stronger here. He's looking for Hydras. And the dynamic really has changed quite a lot with these six players who make up the top three teams right now because mm -hmm. they won't really know what the situation was. Like, how much do they need a win here? Like, how much is fourth place good enough when everything's so close at the top of the standings? And so, you know, we've been talking a lot about how the dynamic is different between the kind of point system that favors getting first a lot and this point system, which is a very flat curve throughout. But do you think it changes that much when you come down to like the very last lobby and everything is so, so close? I would think so. And honestly, I would have chickened out like three shops ago and bought the Infested Wolf just to replace one of the Tabby <laughs> Cats. But we see Good Dummit buying the Monstrous Macaw even though he doesn't have Goldrin yet because he's going for late game, which to be fair, his board currently is quite strong. So you can maybe expect to still be able to get one win comfortably. But it gonna be really tough to get to that point because he hasn't found the time to level not buying a death rattle beast when you have a golden mama bear is such a big call like you can certainly argue mm -hmm. that it's the play to win there because 
He doesn't want to spend gold on death rattle beasts, right? He wants to buy a McCaw, he wants to hit the triple on his tabby cat, and he wants to triple into a gold room. But now, okay, it looks okay. like he has actually great. finally <laughs> bailed out, recognizing that his board state was You're too doing weak. Great out there. And it does feel like that he might have wasted a, some gold there, but you can tell where his mindset was at, trying to find a triple on the tabby cat tokens. Yes. And that would be his signal to then level up and try to find the gold. Goldrin, indeed. I think his options changed when he hit the parrot there as well, right? Because once he picked up the parrot, suddenly he's like, well, actually, now I kind of do want a death rattle, right? Something that I can actually fill the gap with until I find my way to Goldrin. Um, so he kind of diverted back and forwards a couple of times that turn, but he is still extremely strong uh, for the current stage of the game, as you can see, pushing a lot of damage over to the Finley here. That last trade was a big deal, though, um, getting rid of the 7-7, seven, seven, which was the most expensive nice minion outside of Mama Bear. Mm -hmm. Above the pressure. And he's facing off against Bootylicious here. I don't think we've seen his board in quite some time, so it's going to be tough for Goddammit to estimate whether he is strong enough, but I feel like his comp is safe enough to go for a level. Yeah, I would think so too. He had some options even with that one shot that we were looking at here, but we do now see uh, Bootylicious' board, and it is uh, looking fairly underwhelming. It's the kind of board that is... Uh, crying out for a Baron Rivender. He doesn't have one, but he does at least have that Lich King hero power, which is generating a ton of stats for him right now with the uh, spawn of Nazoth. It's quite funny how these two boards interact because they're trying to do the same thing with the Death Rattles and the Beast, but one player doesn't have the mid-game um, strength of Mama Bear to really coast them through. Instead, they've spent that time leveling, which does get them a little bit closer to Goldrin, but it might mean that he takes quite a bit of damage. We do see him go for the Reborn on the Sneeds instead of the Egg here, or even the Spawns of Nazos. So I'm not sure on average if that gets you more stats, but it's definitely a play that means you believe. I think it does, right? Because it's 0-1 plus 8-8 eight, eight, instead of a 5-1 plus a random Legendary. I think the 5-1 plus a random Legendary is better than an 8-8 eight, eight on average, I would argue. Obviously, the, the egg coming back with zero attack is fairly irrelevant. Um, but I think the important thing here... Wow, okay, he hit the Hydra uh, while we were away, which is a very, very big deal. Um, but I think the important thing here is that uh, Bootylicious taunted up his spawns this turn, which gave him the freedom to hero power something else, right? Because he knew he could create board space first before his reborn went out so he could get max value. When a Gar spawns of so off something, but it's not the genie, that's mm -hmm. got to feel sad going to be a huge win here for um, the Dummit. I wonder if it's actually going to be not quite lethal damage, I think, but it's got to be a huge hit, right? It's going to be a catastrophic oh, no. amount of damage, but speaking of catastrophic damage, show yet again, buying the dust in eighth place there, and I believe, actually, if I saw that right, did Fritterus just die at the same time as well? Are they just going out in seventh and eighth here? Wait for the lobby to update once more. He did! Yeah. He actually did! They ended the day in the worst possible way. They were kind of cast off from contention of getting into top two. Uh, would have loved to have put in one big performance to uh, at least show that they can hang with the big boys here. But it's just another very underwhelming result uh, for the team that both myself and Collins were expecting to do very well here. Had to see them go like that, but what it does mean is that all of the players who are within two points of each other still have um, a small gap to be able to close, and the fact that nobody finished 8th and 7th means it's very much still anybody's game. We do see here from Bootylicious that he is about to face off against teammate XQN, mm. so there might be some positioning that goes on here to make uh, the stronger oh. player weaker. And it is so crucial to get this right because seven health and four health respectively, like nothing else matters this turn. Just force mm -hmm. the tie. Like nothing against Show and Fritterus at all, but the way this lobby has panned out is perfect for the dramatic tension right now because suddenly yep. every single placement between these remaining six players could influence who goes through from Sunday. And it makes micro decisions like trying to exactly tie this fight, which is a you know largely solvable puzzle, just so crucial for the two players involved. Oh man, it's largely sol uh, solvable if you're a super computer, yes, I yeah, want to yeah, say, yeah. because be there are yes. so many tokens that are spawning here. Yes. 
And in the grand scheme of things, it feels like this giant security rover will be putting in too much work. I agree. There's a Cadgar! There is a Cadgar. Okay. There won't be any board space getting cleared, though, to really allow this Cadgar to go ham. At least oh. not for quite some time. Eliza, but she's at the very end, so not able to get the ward wide off. Does look like XQN is going to be the one to carry the flag for his team. Well, if the Boonalicious on the Lich King could kill everything except the Rat Pack, which is no longer possible. Oh, it was so close! Because the XQN is only on tier 4 right now, right? But no, it still wouldn't work. No, it's, it's, too, it's too miserable. It was always going to go down. And so that means that Dancing Daryl needs to have a top finish to offset the low finish from Bootylicious to have the best shot of making it to Sunday. It's going to be a tall order for Daryl that doesn't have that much late game scaling potential, but he does have a pretty strong beast comp. And at the moment, you can see Silver Name here on the mechs. Yeah, it feels like his cleave is not that big. It's not, but it does have Divine Shield and Wind Fury, which does make it a lot more impressive than it first looks mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah. Big reasoning for uh, Whirlwind Ooh. Tempest getting removed from the pool was because of Alakir in the first place, but this triple is a major. Now, Siegebreaker definitely looks like the weakest minion, but we've talked about the importance of just having a taunt to make sure yes. that things don't necessarily go wrong. However, Alakir does grant taunt to your uh, leftmost minion. Interesting. Yeah, I do definitely still respect keeping hold of the taunt here because, you know, if Alakir goes first, you, you don't have a taunt anymore, right? Like, your, your, wind, your wind Fury guy is just going to attack twice and it's almost certainly going to be dead at that point, so... I, uh, I do appreciate Silvername just recognizing the importance of just having something that can enforce the uh, sequencing of attacks that he does want here. And even if you don't go first, if they go first and their attack hits your uh, leftmost minion, suddenly your win fury doesn't have Divine Shield, yep. and you can get one less cleave. Yep. Oh man, first, first. attack is massive yep. here. That was a me first kind of game if I've ever seen one, and that is two huge cleaves. Not the best, but there's so much board space wasted here because of both of the death rattles being propped at the same time. Overname is cheering. The fact that he picked up the second Foe Reaver, oh, not the greatest hit, but still going to be enough. enough to take the win yep. here. Yeah, it's perfect size to get rid of the Mama buff tokens here. Not quite lethal, though. Yeah, 14 damage only being pushed. Uh, Silvername would have loved to have uh, hit the lethal there just to be able to secure his top four placement. And it's coming all the way down to the wire, and actually Boodalicious has gone out in sixth position here on the Lich King. So it's starting to come down to the wire now for these five remaining players. Really all up to the Daryl whether he can offset Boodalicious's low score. Uh, it seems like there's been a ton of Beast players that we're watching today. Unusual. Mm -hmm. No one really getting granted the elemental synergy. And that means that they're all going to be competing for the same pieces. It's going to be harder to find the triples, harder to find the goldrins. He's begging for the brand, rolling down for it, and still can't find it. It's an awful feeling. Hello? <laughs> what? It's four jugs and two annoying jug, jug, jugs and two rolls? Okay, fine. Yeah, just completely minus 10 to that turn. I think Rogo knows. Mm -hmm. That might just be the end of his game at this point. But the lobby in general is so low health here that this next fight phase could just decide how things are going. And this is huge for the Fishu because he is the player that has the dead guy fight, which means he's almost certain to survive here. And I love this decision where he recognized he didn't get super strong super quickly. So he's gone for kind of a top four comp just to try and rectify mm -hmm. things. And it's actually going to pay out pretty big here because he should be fairly secure to make a top four or even a Keep top three momentum, with friend. just how low on health everyone in the lobby is right now. Yeah, we did see a while ago that the Soul Juggler comp did sneak its way into the top four. Right. And that is just good enough if you can hit the consistency. O Reaver not getting to attack first, but it's not a very big deal because the first attack on the other side was just a Divine Shield popper. Mm -hmm. That's... He feels like XQN stats are a bit too much. 
Does indeed. We'll see. It looks like he's certainly going to win this fight, although these Divine Shields might have something to say about that, but the positioning of the Divine Shields and that huge value trade on the first 16-16 as well, I think might just actually lock things up in his favor. Definitely feels like a fight where the small percentage that Alakir might have comes from the uh, needs scamming a little bit, but yes. the Baron has removed from the equation now. But I do believe now that's already enough damage being taken off the board to secure the survival there. But no such thing can be said for Rogojin here. But I believe, yeah, that is just a nine damage hit, which means the Alakir actually gets to survive. And that is good news uh, for Silvername on the Alakir, but bad news for the Fishu there who had the uh, ghost fight and would really have been hoping to see multiple people die there after he was able to defeat the ghost. Rogojin's bottom finish, uh, bottom four finish, means that Team Purple will have a really rough time of it at the end here. But it's all coming up for Team Silvername and Goddammit, both of them in the top four, yep. almost securing themselves first place. We'll see how everything shakes out, though. Yeah, we could be and most likely will be down to top two after these next fights because, again, just how low on health everyone is right now. Hello. Right, when you ha uh, the stasis there. elemental gives you an unintended splash dance, but mm -hmm. um, he picked up the perfect minion to keep getting extra stats. Yeah, this elemental was absolutely nuts. And honestly, I, I do like this philosophy from XQN as well. This is much like how I was saying before. I like to have a dance early just so I'm strong for a couple of turns, and then I can look for more greedy targets with more rolls. Like, he could be dead next turn. The game could be ending next turn. So I do like that decision to just the first playable minion he saw, he just danced on it as big as he could. Obviously, that looks a little bit silly because he then immediately rolled into two of the best Divine Shield minions in the game <laughs> straight afterwards. But I think on average, he uh, he made a good decision. I agree. The stats are relatively close on this at first glance. The fact that the Mama Bear will give up to all of the East Fund, I think, puts... Uh, good dumb it in the lead. Yeah, once again, bit of a board space concern. Again, with the uh, positioning means that these tokens are going to stay on the far right. Never mind. That is a horrible attack for XQN uh, mm -hmm. because he cleared the space and then immediately just decided to pop open the Rat Pack full of 1010s. Ten and uh, this is Rat Pack versus we have Rat Pack at home right now, Gia. Like, this is <laughs> not looking good. And that does mean that uh, XQN is going to be knocked out. We'll see if he ends up in fourth or third, though, because we are unaware of how the other fight is going down. I want to see Jandis's perspective, maybe. Jandis survives on one. How? That's a nightmare for XQN. XQN's partner in Bootalicious already went out in sixth, and now with that other fight tying, that means XQN got the worst possible positioning there as well with the fourth place finish. That's so unlucky. Uh, for the yellow team overall. Yep, and it definitely feels like God Dumb It and Silver Name have the access to first place and we'll move on to Sunday, but we'll figure yep. out who is going to be second here. It is still so crucial. Silver Name taking his uh, free roll on the ghost fight here, although, as we mentioned, this was a very, very close lobby, and obviously the ghost is XQN that has just died. But yes, yeah, Silver Name certainly knows the situation. It's not hard for them to work out. Both players on Team Green still alive in the lobby right now. And we will get to see them on Sunday. Uh, I wonder about the free roll turn. Generally, I would think that since you are going to face a ghost, Maybe you can spend that gold on something a bit more greedy, like looking for a triple on the selfless hero. But uh, as you mentioned, the lobbies were extremely close. So yeah. even the ghost is not necessarily a free win. Yeah, exactly what I was leading up to, right? Like, I, I do think Silver Name's absolutely correct just to continue to play for uh, for max strength right now because that was a very, very close fight um, that he had against the, the Fishu previously, not even pushing enough damage to achieve lethal. So he knows he's not super strong right now. So fully respect him just saying, I just need to secure this ghost fight. Honestly, the way that the bands panned out, where there's no Murloc, no Dragons, and just the fact that all these players were in such close contention, so they were more influenced to play for safe strategies, I think is a big reason why we're seeing so many East comps, we're seeing Mech, and even Demons come out today, which is not something that you'll usually get to see just playing on rank.
I mean, there's no way. I don't know why I'm getting excited about any of these soul juggler <laughs> shots. There is just absolutely zero percent that this ever happens. But still, whenever you get like a nice snipe on the Hydra, you still can't help but pop off a little bit. I think the Jandis really already proved her worth by surviving at one. The Fishu coming in hot there at the end. Very clutch just to be able to make sure he finishes third instead of fourth. But that does mean now that it is Silver Name and Goddammit with another first and second finish. What is that, like the third lobby today that they've done that? Yeah, I believe it's uh, at least two. Um, but it's going to yeah, be a it. huge potential finish for the two of them. That secures their slot through on Sunday. And we will have to wait and see um, how it pans out between uh, Team Yellow and Team Purple, with obviously Team White being completely out of contention here. And it does feel bad to say goodbye to Show and Fritterus like that, but... I have to say, the players do know each other best because asking around uh, from some of the Russian-speaking players who they thought was the toughest competition, they did say as early as a week ago, Goddammit, Silver Name are the ones to watch out for. And those two players themselves, they talk the talk. They said they weren't scared of anyone, but look at them. Look how they walk the walk as well. All of those Whoa! first and second places. Oh, oh my no! goodness. <laughs> It is an exact tie between purple and yellow team, which means we move on to our tiebreaker of who has the most top ones per team. Which means that it's yellow going through, as I understand mm -hmm. it, right? With those three wins to their name, that I believe is our first tiebreaker. So I believe it's going to be green and yellow uh, that end up qualifying here. But yeah, while we are getting full confirmation on that, I do want to give a shout out to Dummit and Silver Name in particular, because I think... The way this is broken down with, you know, streamers and community members being invited to the tournament alongside qualifiers through ladders, you could argue that the Team Green here has the best of both worlds, right? Silver Name being arguably the biggest battleground streamer for a very, very long time, and then Dummit being the number one placer in the uh, the ladder leaderboards right before they reset. Like, you could say this is the premium example of both sides of the coin here, and they've absolutely come out and proved that by stomping this lobby. Yeah, big congrats to them. All 